Some, there we go. Okay. Uh, good morning and welcome to uh, today's symposium, Fighting Fascism, Jewish Responses from the Interwar Period to the Present Day. I'm Gemma Birnbaum, the Executive Director of the American Jewish Historical Society. I want to start today's program by thanking uh, my good friend and our generous supporter, Leonard Milberg, for making this symposium possible. Um, today's program is in honor of David Milberg, who left the world far too soon, and you can read more about him in your program. May his memory be a blessing. And thank you as well to the Achilles and Bodeman Foundation for generously supporting today's event. Housed inside the collections of AJHS are stories of American Jews who have come together in times of crisis to help those in need. As we look to the weeks and months ahead, I hope that some of the stories contained in our archives and in the history that you'll learn about today can serve as inspiration and provide hope and understanding in a difficult time. So I wanna thank you all for being with us here today. We're gonna to welcome our panelists for our first uh, session. And um, come on. <laughs> um, and so thank you again, and please welcome my colleague, the president of the Center for Jewish History, Gabriel Rosenfeld. Thank you, Jama. Welcome, everyone. Uh, good morning. Um, historians always reinterpret the past in light of the present, and for obvious reasons, the news cycle has put us in a situation where the uh, recent terror attacks by Hamas against Israel uh, force us to um, make reference not only to those attacks in the context of my own uh, welcome remarks here, but throughout the course of our uh, day's discussion. In fact, I had already written my welcome remarks two weeks ago. Um, I've obviously since had to revise them. Uh, and I want to just say a couple of things about how we might want to think uh, about the program today from its original inception uh, to um, how we should potentially think about it uh, in the wake of last week's events. Uh, today's program was originally conceived, of course, to examine how Jews responded to the rise of fascism in Europe and the United States in the interwar period. But it's worth reminding everyone, in light of the last week's worth of events, that European and American Jews had to worry not only about their own welfare in the 1930s and 1940s, but the situation of their co-religionists in British-ruled Palestine, in other parts of the Arab world, all of whom were facing increasing violence as well. Then, as now, Jews had to monitor multiple threats simultaneously. Now, how those threats were understood at the time and how they should be understood in the present is one of the themes we'll be addressing in today's symposium. The title of today's symposium implies that one of the main threats faced by Jews at the time was something that we call fascism. This claim, however, is complicated by the fact that fascism is one of the most controversial terms in contemporary Western political discourse. This is not just because of the horrific crimes perpetrated by fascists in the first half of the 20th century, but because ever since, myriad groups from all wings of the political spectrum have used the term as a rhetorical cudgel. Today, though, we are here to historicize fascism and explain how Jews combated it from its inception up until the present day. As we will see, Jews in Europe and the US adopted a wide range of strategies, from economic boycotts and lobbying efforts to espionage and cultural protest. In surveying these efforts and assessing their ongoing relevance for the present day world, we hope to fulfill the Center for Jewish History's mission of preserving and mobilizing the Jewish past. Today's event is the second installment in CJH's Public History Forum, which brings scholars and the general public into conversation about topics of global Jewish concern. And I hope you had a chance to pick up one of the postcards at the uh, entryway, where you'll see some of our coming attractions in 2024. Today's event, I should note, is part of a larger CJH focus on the history of fascism. We are proud that the, uh, that the Blavatnik Archive has just opened a wonderful ex exhibition in the Valentin Blavatnik Gallery on the Soviet Jewish Anti-Fascist Committee. And in addition, our current Jewish comic book exhibition, Juice, addresses the anti-fascist activities of comic book superheroes in the 1930s and 40s. So please do take the time when you're in the building today to check out these important exhibitions, and you'll see how we are 
dovetailing a variety of topics into a larger uh, analytical focus. Finally, I would like to thank the members of the Planning Committee, CJH Academic Advisory Council Chair Jeff Weidlinger and AJHS Academic Council Chair Mark, Mark Dollinger for their hard work in putting today's symposium together. Thanks, of course, also go out to the superb staff here at CJH and AJHS who made the event possible. And of course, thanks go to Leonard Milberg and the Achilles and Bodman Foundation for their support uh, for this important day. I'm grateful for everyone, of course, who will uh, be coming today, those of you who are already here and those still in transit. Uh, and I hope uh, those watching online, at latest count, it's 1,100 people, uh, will also be uh, contributing to what uh, will be a robust conversation. I'm excited now to welcome our three panelists for session number one. And if they can come up here and join me on the stage, we will commence with our first panel, What is Fascism? So joining me up here on the stage are three internationally acclaimed scholars. Your bios, uh, their bios rather, are all in your program, so you can see the more detailed descriptions there. But I'd like first to welcome Ruth ben Ghia, professor of history at NYU, uh, professor of history and Italian studies, who is a frequent commentator on CNN. Helmut Walzer Smith, to her left, professor of history at Vanderbilt University, and I'm thrilled to announce our current NEH fellow here at the center. And uh, Federico Finkelstein, to his left, professor of history at the New School, and, an, uh, and the author of at least, by latest count, seven books on today's topic. So collectively, we're going to be answering this question, what is fascism, by um, looking at three specific sub-questions. First of all, um, what is fascism conceptually? Second of all, what is it historically? And finally, how can we understand fascism comparatively between what was going on in Europe and the US in the 30s and what is going on in the US today? So Ruth, if I can just start with you uh, and pose a two-part question. I think it's probably worth asking why it is so hard or why it has been so hard for generations for scholars to define what fascism actually is. And then if you could just comment on how your most recent book, Strong Men, tries to answer this question. Thank you. Uh, thank you so much for having me here and for doing this event. It's really important uh, right now. So um, it is hard to define it, and many people, uh, Umberto Eco, Robert Paxton, have uh, produced definitions that are also kind of checklists of qualities. Um, Hypernationalism, uh, victimhood, and violence, of course. Corruption is something we could add, but it, it's it was uh, vague by design. Mussolini famously, he was the creator of fascism, and he never defined it officially until 1932. The other thing is that there was no Marx and Engels who provided uh, a kind of theoretical treaties and definitions uh, many decades before. So it started, and, and then you know, Mussolini created uh, fascism in 1919, and by 1922 he was already prime minister. It was lightning fast, that's very different than Hitler. So one working definition that comes from Mussolini uh, in 1921, he called fascism a revolution of reaction. And it was very confusing to people because he took, he was a former socialist, he took two things that were not supposed to go together, socialism, and nationalism. And people didn't understand, so he, so this is a clue, one clue about fascism, it shakes everything up. It makes new alliances, new concepts, uh, communicating in new ways using the latest media technologies. So that's the revolution. But the reaction is very key, uh, and we'll talk about this later. You know, it was a reaction then to the left gaining power, to gender emancipation, the beginnings of anti-colonial uh, stirrings. But this has uh, endured as part of fascism, where you shake everything up to repress the rights of certain groups that you call enemies. And they're often the same groups throughout history. Jews, <laughs> Muslims now, uh, nomadic peoples, the left for right-wing uh, authoritarianism. So to pass to the second, um, I wrote Strong Men, which came out in 2020. Um, and there's a revised edition in 2021 that includes January 6th, because I wanted to explore what happened to fascism after 1945. Where did all those impulses, those methods, the authoritarian playbook, as I call it, what happened to it? 
So it traces the right wing uh, Cold War military juntas and it goes up to today. So the idea is you can see uh, what stays the same, like leader cults, personality cults, super important, violence, corruption, machismo, and what's, what changes instead. And we'll talk about this later. Helmut, as a historian of modern Germany, your focus have, has, of course, been in that context. And in Germany, fascism was never the preferred term of choice. Rather, it was something called national socialism. Given what Ruth has just said, how does the German case compare? Well, I think it's, I think it's perfectly fine to talk about national socialism as a variant of fascism, a very special variant. So special, in fact, that in the end, I don't talk about it as a fascist country. Let's, or let me put this differently. It's unclear to me that fascism gives one the best analytical lens onto this historical experience. Now, when I say this, um, I think one has to uh, step backwards. Um, and ask oneself, really, what is one trying to figure out? You know, we can talk about these regimes as whole entities, but it is, in fact, the case that often we are interested in certain aspects of it. And this is also historically true. So, for example, when you go back historically and you ask the question, what are, wh what are the best analyses of National Socialism saying between 33 and, say, 41? And the answer then is that a lot of them are quite happy to, exp to compare national socialism and uh, Italian fascism or Spanish fascism. And there's not a lot of dissent, especially on the left side of the spectrum, but not just there. Some of the best works um, are actually created coming out of this. doesn't like what I'm saying. No, that, that, <laughs> that was me. I'm very sorry. Put my mic down. Um, so in, in that early period, that was a powerful lens. But why was it a powerful lens? Um, it was a powerful lens because people were interested in the movement, and it was a powerful lens in part because people were interested in the dynamic. After 41, this begins to change. And why does it change? Well, it changes for very obvious reasons. And that obvious reason is that two things become much more at the center. And those two things are a very aggressive regime, um, interested not just in, in regional um, power, but in a wider um, conquest, and um, the Holocaust, the genocide of the Jews, is more central. So I think that. When we talk about fascism, we have to be cognizant, in the German case, of the history of that term. I, myself, as a scholar, um, I've always had a problem with fascism, in part because it's already embedded into the history of the fight against it. That's what this podium is about, at, after all. And it doesn't give me a kind of analytical uh, uh, inventory that is outside the actual thing itself. So that's one. Um, if I could actually just ask Federico to weigh in at this point, because we've got two competing concepts now, both referring to the far right, fascism, national socialism, and you'll have to forgive me here, I want to complicate things by bringing in something, Federico, that you know quite a bit about, and that's populism. The distinctions between fascism and populism, some people may say it's, it's not uh, essential to uh, go too granular or inside the weeds to, to say what the, two dif the differences are between the two things, and yet I think it's important to maintain some conceptual differentiation. So how would you tackle this question? Yes, Popul populism is something that, I mean, existed before fascism, but as a regime, in other words, when it, when it comes to power and in a way becomes important because we should remember that when we talk about this, for example, fascism, uh, Zeb Sternhel, great Israeli historian of fascism, for me the best, actually, uh, historian of fascism, he said, basically, uh, you know, when you study fascism, it's important to study 
eh, its ideas, but also other logics of fascism. And here Paxton is also important, another historian uh, Ruth mentioned, which I think is very important. In other words, if you want to start reading about fascism, my recommendation before I answer your question is read Sternhell, read Paxton. I mean, these are great, great books. We should re return to, you know, to people that have written before us. And, and both emphasize this idea that fascism was an ideology, it was a movement, and it was a regime. And when it became a regime, first time in Italy, fascism became not only something uh, important in terms of Italy, but a model worldwide. And by the way, Hitler at that time, he was looking at that and he was saying, this is what I want. So we can call it different names, but when we talk about fascism, we talk about, uh, you know, key things. In my own work, uh, and I will answer the question about populism, but I wanted to precede it about with first answering what is fascism in my view. I mean, fascism is many things, but I have been trying to see what makes it special, which are the key ingredients. Uh, without these ingredients, there is no fascism. And this is the topic of my next book coming out in, in April. It's called The Wannabe Fascist. And here I talk about three different types in terms of ideologies, movements, and regimes. I talk about the fascist, before 45, Mussolini, Hitler, Lugones in Argentina, I mean, a lot of fascists in India and many other places, China and so on. I deal with them, then I talk about the populists after 45, and then I talk finally about what's coming, you know, out from our present, which is in this early, in 21st century, we are seeing populists that behave like fascists. So that's why I call people like Trump, people like Bolsonaro and others, I call them wannabe fascists. Now, fascism and populism are distinct in terms of these four elements, what I call in my own book the four pillars of fascism. And these elements are, according to my reading and my work on this, uh, violence and militarization of politics. I mean, the idea here uh, that, that, you, that politics is a war in which you kill people that you don't like, in which you repress people that you, that you don't like to the limit. Of course, you might have dictatorships in history, you know, which are not fascist. But my point is, there is no fascism without extreme notions of violence and the militarization of politics. Number two, lies. All politicians lie or use metaphors, if you will. Let me be more <laughs> diplomatic now. But fascists lie in a totalitarian way, in a propaganda way. Not only they lie, they believe they are lies. And worse, they want to change the war according, in order for the war to be like they are lies. Example, Holocaust here, horrible example. One of the major lies of anti-Semites and Nazis worldwide. Jews are dirty and spread disease. I mean, I know that personally is not true. Many times in the summer I'm Jewish, I take four showers. Lie, <laughs> big lie, even personally. I know it's a lie. So, but the point is, what the Nazis did with this lie? They put Jews in ghettos and, 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 exterminate, and concentration camps. These poor people, these victims of Nazism became dirty, and yes, eventually they spread disease. And a Nazi would say, ha, huh, I was right. No, you are not. You are changing the world in order for the world to look like your life. So that's element number two. Big difference with other ideologies, movements, and regimes. Element number three, xenophobia and racism. There, there, cannot, there is racism without fascism, but there is no fascism without racism. The, the enemy change in, I don't know, in uh, Peru, they hated uh, immigrants from Asia. In Argentina, Germany, they hated the Jews. These were enemy number one, and so on and so forth. But always ra racialization of the enemy. Element number four, dictatorship. There is dictatorship without fascism. There is no dictator. There is no fascism without dictatorship. And this is the break with populism, because in populism, what you have is authoritarian politics, cults like you know, a lot of lies and so on, but not in the fascist way. And incidentally, after 45, the first populist regimes in history, Perón in Argentina, Vargas in Brazil, and then you have examples in other Latin American places, they had been either authoritarian dictators or even fascists, Perón was a fascist, which left fascism behind, at least they left these four elements, and they created something new, which is to say, a democratically elected authoritarian leader. So populism in a way is fascism, with democracy, which is to say, is not fascism. Now, the present, and this is the last one thing I wanna say. Now we are seeing populists like, yes, Trump here, Bolsonaro in Brazil, and others, that are returning to these four elements. And before the coup d'etat, which was a coup d'etat, that we saw in the assault on the Capitol, I would say, well, it seems like they are lacking element number four here. I mean, of course, racism is, racism is central, Violence is central, of course, not in the extreme ways of fascism, but it's an element, but they were lacking dictatorship. How would you call somebody that attempts a coup d'etat, which is to say somebody that wants to remain in power without being elected? 
a dictator. So for me, we are very close. And my answer, and I finish with this, my answer is, and you know, in Spanish, I'm from Argentina, I would say ni, which is to say yes and no. There are a lot of elements in fasc of fascism, and there are elements which make these people want to be fascists. They are not there, they are yet, but they might be. Thank you, Federico. Um, this brings an end to the first round of our uh, discussion, which is to just talk about fascism conceptually, and I think it's important to uh, recognize that we're building our conceptual apparatus slowly uh, in our morning's discussion, but I want to turn our attention to the historical question, which will bring us to our second round of questions, um, and that is to ask why did fascism emerge historically when it did and where it did? And um, Ruth, if I could ask you as a historian of modern Italy briefly, how would you, from an Italian perspective, is explain fascism as a historical phenomenon, keeping an eye on what was uniquely Italian about it and what was reflective of broader European trends. Yeah, thank you. Um, so, you know, the word fascism comes uh, from the Latin term, you know, for bundle, and uh, there were these kind of, uh, there were these uh, fasci movement of uh, groups of Sicilian peasants in the 19th century who were rising up, they were revolutionaries, and they were uh, the fasci siciliani, and so Mussolini drew on this radical tradition when he uh, invented fascism uh, after getting kicked out of the Socialist Party for um, supporting World War I. And he called, th they were combat leagues, fasci di combattimento, so co fascist combat leagues. And then he created the fascist party so he could get into the electoral system. So it, it comes out of uh, this kind of radical tradition, and it builds on other things, French national syndicalism, there's whole other genealogies and traditions that come into it. But there would be no fascism without World War I. Um, the, up, the, the utter upheaval, where multiple empires fell, um, you know, <laughs> nations created, uh, anti-colonial um, you know, movements started, including in Italian occupied Libya, where you had the first independent Arab Republic briefly, the Triple Italian Republic in 1917. That's important, we never hear about that. And the earliest fascists were veterans who w brought the war home. And so they didn't want to demobilize. Uh, and Italy had the largest socialist party in Western Europe. It had a very strong left. So that's where we get to the revolution of reaction. And the first, uh, and fascism, this is relevant for today, Fascism began as a decentralized militia movement in the countryside, um, where uh, in industrialists, and especially uh, big agriculture patrons and landowners, hired the, them as kind of bouncers uh, to stop strikes, to stop farm occupations, land occupations. And out of this, they started uh, taking control. This is what Bannon, Steve Bannon calls the precinct strategy. You take control at the local level, town councils, you trash you know, socialist trade union offices, and you get power in a capillary fashion, starting in the countryside. And Mussolini's own squads um, came out of his bodyguards. Um, so so that's, that's that, the World War I. And the other thing that is so important that also will be you know, for every fascist uh, regime is that the war was birthing a new kind of person. And Mussolini, in 1917, wrote a really interesting article called Trenchocracy. Now, he said, the war is going to sweep away all the old hierarchies, the old aristocracy. A new man will be created from the trenches. And that goes back to the points about struggle. There is, fascism is about seeing struggle and violence as the way you move history forward. That's very important. Um, so the trenchocracy was the birth out of the trenches of the new world. A new, a new kind of universe, a new way of thinking and acting. So fascism is also a method. Um, so, and then just one quickly, it's also a reaction more, this is the Europeans, you know, or more global, against mass society and the idea of equality, gender equality, racial equality. And, and so fascism is a way of thinking about how elites can keep power, the tyranny of the minority, to quote a book that's just come out. And Mussolini um, uh, had, a, here's a quote from him in 1922, liberty is not an end, it is a means. As a means, it ought to be controlled and dominated. And here falls the talk of force. So Mussolini saw fascism as a way of wresting control uh, 
and he allied with elites, conservative elites, to do this from the left-wing masses, from the feminists, from all the incipient things of a certain kind of modernity that fascism wanted to vanquish and instead impose its own version of modernity. And that was the subject of my first book called Fascist Modernities. So I'll stop there. Thank you. Uh, Helmut, based on what Ruth just said, if we take this line of argumentation and apply it to the German context, of course, World War I will also be pivotal. And yet, uh, you and I both know as longstanding uh, scholars in the field of German history, that there are some arguments that trace Hitler and Nazism much further back into German history, whether to Luther or to Arminius. So without getting into the whole Zonderweg question, how important is World War I in the rise of national socialism, and how potentially insufficient is it only to focus on that immediate context? Um, so obviously, it's, it's, it's extremely central. Um, I think it's right to say no World War I, no Hitler. Um, so uh, I do think that the, the lost war is central. I think that the myths deriving, as Ruth said, deriving from the, the war in this case are central. But we're also dealing in the 20s with a, a highly frustrated, volatile nationalism, some of which, of course, goes back earlier. But the, again, the lost war, the, the terms of the peace make this all a much more a volatile situation. We're also talking about a place, the Weimar Republic, which endures immense economic instability, not once uh, in terms of hyperinflation, but twice because of the Great Depression. We're dealing with um, a democracy from 1930 to 1933, or to the end of 1932, really, that is dying. And we don't, we're not paying enough attention to this. Um, I mean, I know that some scholars are, but the, the situation that we're in is partly a situation you could say, looking at calling it fascism, but I think the first thing to address is that we're in a situation of a very ill, if not dying, democracy. And that makes it actually quite similar to the Weimar Republic in the years 1930 uh, to 1932. You're looking at a situation which conservative elites, elites back from the imperial period, but elites still in power, um, especially conservative elites from the agrarian sector, so that sector that's um, more left behind. Uh, the fascism arguments were that it's actually the industrial sector. Turns out empirically not quite as true. But nevertheless, they are conservative elites, and they are willing to use the fascists, Hitler, however you want to call them, um, in order to advance their own agenda. This obviously doesn't quite work. And then there's this, uh, another aspect of this, and this is, I was so interested in your, your, your categories and the dictatorship part. And that's, of course, true. But one thing is, and it's not just, of course, true, but it's, it's an important point. But one thing that's also important about the national socialist dimension is the consolidation of power. How fast it went, but even more, the national consolidation, the way in which Germans got behind Hitler very, very quickly. I'm convinced if there had been an election, even a free election in 36, 37, he would have had an absolute majority. Um, I think that had somebody assassinated Hitler, uh, 37, he would have been a national hero. There was an immense amount of popular support behind Adolf Hitler after the consolidation of power. There was an immense undercutting of, the, um, of civil society. The Germans called Gleichschaltung, the national consolidation. Every trade union, every school board, every town, um, every union, I already said that, sorry, every <laughs> teacher's association, all of these associations were Nazified. And that created a kind of dynamic that wasn't just about a dictatorship, but was also about society itself. And that's one thing that made National Socialism, I think, have a different kind of dynamic than a lot of fascist re regimes. And that transformation, of course, does illustrate the shift from a movement phase to a regime phase. And Federico, you were alluding to those different phases as well. Um, to round out this uh, second round, um, Federico, would you say that given the crisis of liberalism and the crisis of European mass society after World War I, that that provides us with 
um, a comparative set of points that we can apply to Latin America, because as we know, and because you're an expert in that field as well, um, to talk about fascism in a part of the world where World War I was not experienced as it was in Europe does raise some interesting contrasts. Yes, I mean, and, and it's a fascinating question, and I, I will answer it you know, simply, which is to say by going back to our fascist sources in the past or people that identify with this, and it's all here. It didn't matter. In Argentina, in Peru, in, in India, they also believed that they were living their own world, either internal or external. Mm -hmm. And they would even say what happens in Mexico with the Mexican Revolution or what happened in Europe, we are living here. Now, you don't need that war, Spain, Portugal, you don't need that war to be, you know, to be part of a, of a fascist movement, and yet it's part of the experience. Um, so, I mean, what is interesting is that, you know, I, I think what, what Ruth said is important to highlight that this becomes first a regime in, in Italy. That is a really important thing. And what is important about this is that this is the first time that ideas that were shared under different names, because if, if fascinating, if you read Uruguayan, Argentine, Peruvian, Hindu intellectuals, Burmese intellectuals, like, I mean, because now I'm learning from colleagues that are working on these topics, we are learning on, on all these parts of the world. I mean, they were talking about these ideas. They were talking about the need to eliminate the enemy. That person that you don't like, you eliminate it. They were racializing it. They were, you know, uh, promising violence as the source of everything, and as Ruth was also highlighting this issue of violence. Now, I would like to say two things, because this is a big, big question, and it's very difficult to answer it. And, and, and the first, related to what Ruth said about violence, and, and the second to what Helmut said about dictatorship. Now, violence, I mean, it's, it's a, we have to understand here the distinction between fascist notions of violence and fascist practices of violence and the rest. Because everybody is violent. I mean, all the isms are violent. But here, like uh, here, you will not find, like uh, in you know, in liberal conservative, or even um, or even uh, communist uh, writings, a theory of violence justifying violence for its own sake. Violence is a means to achieve the end of violence. And here they are. Sorry to be a little bit scholarly about this. They are all Beberian. In other words, they believe that power, of course, is related to violence, but you are powerful when you have the monopoly of violence, finally, and you don't use it. Now, fascists had a very different understanding of this. You are powerful when you have the monopoly of violence, and you constantly unleash it. So that's very different. Why? Because if you are not violent, you are weak. You are part of democracy, you are part of liberalism or Marxism. The enemy here is always on the right. Let's remember this, always on the right, always against the left, always against liberalism, even, you know, always against democracy and of course, uh, uh, you know, communism. But democracy and communism, they see the same, they, they see these two which are pretty different as part of the same equation. And of course, of course, in most cases, they add the Jews into these ingredients. So democracy, communism, Jews, I mean, all these fantasies. It's important to remember this. Now, let me address this issue of dictatorship. Uh, it's a fascinating question, and yet, why, if they were so popular, they created a dictatorship? They didn't need to, but ideologically, they had to. And it doesn't matter how you achieve power, but democracy is a problem. And I always tell my students, if I could take the time machine and talk with the Führer, I'm Jewish, so probably he will kill me. But if he doesn't, <laughs> but if he doesn't, I will ask him, you claim to be the permanent leader of your people. How you can assess this without elections? And I'm sure he will answer, Federico, you are an idiot. This is the typical question that a person that believes in democracy will ask. Because we don't think that you need to prove something that is related to faith. And in fact, by the, in the 1930s, there are a couple of Hitler speeches talking about this. I am the permanent representative of my people. We, I mean, and if we did, like, I mean, I'm one. Like, I'm this, by the way, very Christian, Trinity here, the total identification, Trinity between people, leader, and nation. They are one and the same. We don't need to prove this. And if you are asking this question, you are the enemy. So, can, can I, please, can I Ruth. Add? Yes. The the other reason um, you have to you have to have well, dictatorship is embedded in the first dictatorship of a uh, fully realized one. The reason that Mussolini declared dictatorship in 1925 was that he had ordered a hit job on the head of the Socialist Party, Matteotti, 
who was also denouncing his corruption and uh, scandals with, he was taking, the fascist party was taking bribes from an oil, American oil company. And so this is very contemporary. So he declared dictatorship to escape a prosecution. <laughs> and yeah, I wrote about this in Strongman in my book. It's very important that the first fully realized dictatorship came because of corruption. And so fascism is law uh, when the, the lawless become uh, the head of government. And the Holocaust was the most, uh, the, the, one of the biggest criminal operations in history. So corruption is absolutely central. Do you know that uh, there's only a few books that have been published on corruption in fascist Italy? It's a, it's, it needs to be, and also in Nazi Germany, there's some things by Richard Evans and others, but not enough. And we see from regimes like Putin, uh, we have uh, Netanyahu who, who has charges against him. This is the playbook that normal uh, leaders, if you have indictments or investigations, you don't want to run for office. Why would you do that, right? People, you know, people probe, journalists probe. If you're a strongman, you have to run for office because you've got to get into power and shut down the judiciary and domesticate it. And in, in that period of time, it led to dictatorship. So this is, this is also why they must uh, have absolute power, because they fear uh, whatever that looks like in, in that age. Um, today, it's a bit different. But that's the, that's the root also, in, as well as what Federico said. If we can um, turn to our last phase, uh, our last session, um, our last round of questions, rather. And if those of you in the audience would like to start jotting down your questions for the Q&A section, uh, there'll be people collecting them. Uh, I just wanted to get us from the uh, interwar period to the present, because as you know, Fighting Fascism has as its subtitle from the interwar period to the, up to the present day. Um, and so I want to invite our panelists to weigh in on two questions. One is, how much or to what extent does fascism help us understand the present mo moment in the United States? And then since we're also here to talk about responses to fascism and how uh, Jews and others uh, have and can continue to combat it, um, we're here, of course, with three people who have written a lot in the mass media, whether <clears throat> uh, in um, the uh, world of journals and newspapers or on social media platforms. If you can just say a little bit, perhaps, about how you've tried to combat fascism uh, from this perspective, that would also help us move into the present. So Ruth, if I could start with you. Yeah, um, I, um, I, came, I came from, uh, I grew up in Pacific Palisades in California that had a lot of exiles from Nazism, um, famous ones, Thomas Mann, uh, Schoenberg, others. Uh, and this started me thinking, uh, I had no family connection to the Holocaust. My dad's from the Middle East, he's from Israel, my mother's from Scotland. And I started thinking about what is it about a, a regime that forces so many people to have to go into exile? And so then I ended up specializing in fascism. But when I saw uh, Trump in 2015 and doing loyalty oaths, saying that there was no truth, that he was the arbiter of truth, um, you know, appointing, allying with Bannon, who admires Mussolini and other fascists. All of this was deeply familiar to me and it filled me with dread. So I started writing, I had already been writing for CNN on historical themes. So I covered the whole uh, uh, 2016 election and then now I'm on TV a lot and it's really about 50% of my time is educating the public. So one thing, it's not a very nice thing for Sunday morning, but it's very important. Uh, unfortunately, the GOP has become an autocratic party it has internalized the methods and philosophy of the coup attempt of January 6. So violence, corruption, and you see the people they put forth for their elite. You have to be people who are willing to cover up crime, like Jim Jordan. Uh, you see the leader cult. There was recently an article um, that uh, those who are following Trump believe him more than their family and friends. It's classic leader cult stuff. And the main thing I want to say is that Trump uh, has been re-educating the American public since 2015, and this was a basis for my uh, report to the January 6th committee, it's the, uh, a career highlight as a first-generation American to contribute to the January 6th committee. He's been using his rallies and his campaign events to um, change the perception of violence in Americans' minds, and this is, goes back to fascism. It's not, no, and there you had World War I, Right? But if you go along the 20th century into the 21st, 
you have to get people willing to accept violence as not repugnant, but as something that is morally righteous, necessary sometimes, and even just, and even patriotic. So the January 6 thugs become, those who are in uh, jail, become political prisoners. They're noble, right? So Trump has been highly successful, and right now he's using his campaign as a radicalization vehicle. That's why he kicked it off at Waco, Texas, the site of extremism. That's why he went to the gun store. It's why Marjorie Taylor Greene and Donald Trump Jr. are telling people right now on Twitter to buy as many guns as possible. It's why, finally, Matt Gates uh, goes to the Iowa State Fair, and people are there with their corn dogs and their toddlers. And he says, he's supporting Trump, it's a campaign appearance, and he says, um, only through force will we bring change to a corrupt uh, Washington, D.C. So I hear that. Not elections, not reform, not democracy, violence. And so the coup, is, the coup attempt has been internalized. The, the idea that you change, we said this before, all of us, you change history, you move history forward, you have political transitions through violence. And that is what is being preached today. Thank you, Helmut. If you could weigh in as well. Thank you. I uh, agree with a great deal of what you said. Um, I guess I again start from my position as a German historian, and I look at this from the standpoint of German history and not just from the standpoint of what is, I didn't want to use that word, but just, not from the standpoint necessarily of what is fascism. When I do that, though, I, something very important comes to me right away. And this is that um, in the German case, we look at a process. That process involves a movement, uh, a movement which I have no problem calling fascist, um, or a variant of fascism, and in line with what's a lot of what has been said here. We have the death of a democracy, and this is in some respects tied to, but also independent of the movement. The, the resolve that a country had to keep its democracy in place, the resolve that a country had to defend itself from a movement that really was its grave digger and was announcing itself as its grave digger. A third, especially between 1930 um, and 19. Uh, 33, January 1933, there's a kind of a power vacuum. And the power vacuum is important because it sensitizes us to those weaknesses in our political culture, in our constitution, um, in the way politics is done that we have to start paying more attention to. Like, for example, the question of where is the army? Where is the military in this? One of the frightening things that I watched on um, January 6th was that there was no military support depending, uh, defending our capital. Um, the military was watching it on television. Why was this? Well. There was also something that I thought was not quite right even before all of this happened. And that is that a lame duck president, Donald Trump, was making important shifts in who is running the military. Why is this the case? Why is it the case that a president who has, been, who has lost an election is able to make crucial national security decisions without someone questioning him? Um, we have to start thinking about those questions of who runs the show at these moments where there's a power vacuum. And finally, the whole question of national consolidation. So this is what I argued in my, I actually did not do as nearly as much um, public intervention as my colleagues, but I did do one, and that one, with the Washington Post, was to say four years into the Trump regime, Trump government, this looks nothing like National Socialism. 
Why? The main reason is that the country is divided. There is a great deal of opposition. This is not yet national consolidation. This is not yet Gleichschaltung. There's a, there's a vibrant civil society. And so that tells me something about what is absolutely, absolutely, no matter how these elections come out, important. The maintaining of that civil society against encroachment. And that is where we might be rather soon. Federico. Yes, I mean, uh, I think whatever we call it, the fact that, I mean, and, and again, like the term that I'm using, I mean, this is the title of my next book, is Wannabe Fascism. Uh, but whatever we call it, I mean, I think we might all agree that there is a fascist danger here. And, and the fact that we are asking the question is really bad enough. So my point is like, we don't need to agree. I mean, I don't think we need to agree. Actually, the more we disagree, the more perspectives we can provide. But, uh, but what is interesting is that, I mean, it's incredible, incredible actually to me that we are asking these questions. When I started working on these things, I, I was born in Argentina just, you know, less, I mean, a year before a coup d'etat, and, and I live in dictatorship the first years of my life under dictatorship, and, uh, and eventually that was gone, and, and we live in the late 20th century, like a, you know, a moment in which we were studying these questions more in terms of the past. This was not supposed to, to be returning. And what we see is a returning of many things that were in vogue in the 1920s and 1930s, and this is a discussion, in my opinion. The way we answer it, like, of course, we will disagree. Uh, we don't need to agree, but, but, but the agreement perhaps is like this one, that there is something wrong here, something very anti-democratic that is coming back, however we, we call it. Uh, in terms of, um, I mean, just, you know, we are asking the questions in terms of what we are was, working on. Next week I need to finish, in fact, I will be presenting uh, at Harvard like a talk on Salvemini, uh, the first historian of fascism. And this is a professor like us who has he said something very interesting, which I would like to mention, or somebody said something very interesting about him. I, I don't remember exactly now, but he was against the fascists before fascism was born. And I think this is our situation. Of course, after the assassination of Matteotti, he had to leave, and he became eventually a professor at Harvard, and then he returned to Italy at the end of his life. By the way, when, when, he, lay, when he left, before writing the first books on the history of fascism, he was already in his 60s. And this is a person that was already super accomplished, and, and, you know, and, and the books on fascism are very late. And, and he was, uh, he knew, I mean, I mean, and as soon as the fascists arrived to power, they knew Salvemini was an enemy. Of course, he was a socialist and, and so on, but, uh, but this is something that we should remember, I think, in terms of the first intellectuals dealing with this, because they knew they were against something that was already, you know, uh, it, it, we, we, they didn't know exactly what it was going to be, but it, they knew it was bad. And, and in terms of public interventions, I, I think, you know, uh, Ruth, you are a model, like, I mean, I have read your stuff like again, again and again, I continue to learn from it. And I try to do something as much as I can following this pattern, like, we need, I think, to uh, intervene as much as we can in terms of the public. And also, you know, I'm, I'm a recent American citizen, for me also, when I was asked to contribute a statement to the January 6th committee, it was like highlight for me, you know, in so many ways. And the last thing I want to say, and I, I'm sorry I was right, in fact, that uh, when, when Trump lost the election, I wrote an op-ed in, in the Washington Post saying, if he continues to deny this, then we run the risk of having a coup d'etat here. And I wrote it, like it was the title. And, and I thought, oh my God, like I don't want to be right on this when this happened. But the point is here, as citizens, we are always hoping, and as scholars, we know that this is no good. And so this is a problem. Like, I mean, when people were thinking that he was going to become presidential, like my research part, not my citizen part, said this is impossible. I mean, this is impossible, or almost impossible. And in fact, the New York Times asked him later, are you going to cease now with the demonization? And Trump naturally said, why? I won. And this is people that, you know, power here is important. We are talking about politicians. We should not forget this, by the way. But, uh, but I think also what Ruth said is central here. These are people that are escaping justice by creating more chaos. And this is, you know, the situation in so many, in so many cases that, that, that we need to be, I mean, there are so many red flags here. Anyway. I'd like to get to some of our questions. And I have three that we'll do in reverse order. Um, 
directed to three of our uh, panels here, panelists rather, um, and then I have one, if we have time, one final question that all three of you can weigh in on. Um, so for Federico, uh, one audience member asks that, uh, ask you to explain the following. You characterize the fascist leaders correctly as being against democracy and communism. Why would Stalin and Lenin not be considered fascists? Well, I mean, if you start with the, I mean, uh, the last chapter of my book, the more, you know, for me, the, the most, the, of my next book, it's easy for me now to talk about things that nobody knows. Only a few people know about this, so I can say whatever I want. But it's true that I write about this, and I try to answer this question in the book, which is, you know, of course, the, 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 uh, you know, communism eventually was like a long dictatorship in the, so many countries, still is. Uh, and yet when you read particularly Lenin, like, uh, you know, big the theories of dictatorship, in fact. Like he talks about, he wrote on dictatorship a lot in his theoretical writings. Um, and and uh, of course he took, as you know, like this small kind of sentence, intervention by Marx, when he said, this is about the dictatorship of the proletariat. This was not important for Marx. I mean, it's just a sentence. And the communists reified this, you know, made it huge, because they were thinking that, that, uh, that dictatorship was the answer to the political problems of the time, and yet they always talk about dictatorship as a transition. Of course, you might say, yeah, they were lying, but in theory, because here there's a difference between theory and practice. In theory, they always said that dictatorship was a transition towards a democracy, a fantasy democracy that eventually would happen, whereas in fascism, you don't see this. You don't see this kind of talk about, uh, you know, the permanent leadership being a transition to something else. It's about that. So that is a big difference, I think, between Marxist uh, or communist notions of dictatorship and practices of dictatorship and the fascist ones. Thank you. Can I just very Please. quickly add to that? I think another important aspect of this is historical, and that is to say that uh, the first communist, uh, the first time the Communist Party comes to power, um, it comes in the wake of World War I and of a very bloody civil war. So. The left, which already has a military tradition, is dramatically militarized at the beginning of the, in the first part of the 20th century through eight years of war. And that very much shaped that part of the world and communism in that part of the world. Helmut, if I could apply the second question raised by an audience member. Um, they ask, if we want to understand uh, Hitler's power, does it come more from the masses that support him or the enablers at the elite level who ultimately brought him into power? Oh, that's a dichotomous question, which I'm not going to fall into that <laughs> easily, but it's an important question. Um, look, of course, the answer is really both. <laughs> I'm thinking back to your, 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 your imaginary conversation, and he might have called you an idiot, but he actually would have doubted it a little bit because he was tremendously um, mindful of his own popularity. Um, and he didn't hold elections, but he had a whole apparatus of report writers telling him how certain policies were going over with the population. And he sometimes pulled back. So he was, Hitler was very concerned about his popularity. That was always the case. In fact, there's an argument to be made that part of who Hitler was has to do with his, in, in Bavaria, in Munich, in the early 20s, where he gets his whole um, rhetorical, rhetorical abilities, his whole charisma, um, has to do with him talking to like-minded, frustrated nationalist Bavarian soldiers who he's trying to re-educate and they're loving what he has to say. The more they love it, the more he says it. So there's a kind of echo chamber going on there, evocative of a little bit the kind of echo chambers that are created now. But it's that loophole. So to Hitler, his popularity is important, but I think you're absolutely right. He, dictatorship is the key to becoming popular. That's why these two things, getting him into power and his popularity are just tied together. And Ruth, if you could bring us to the finish line here, I'm going to combine two questions into one directed to you. Um, would you say that at the personal level, politically speaking, Trump himself is a fascist? And apart from him, if he were not on the political scene, who would be the second most uh, dangerous fascist threat in the country? You don't have to answer. 
by name, per se, if you don't feel like it. You can talk about broader forces or trends, but that's a two-part question. So this, this is one of the uh, questions I get most often. Is there a method to Trump? Is he, is, he, uh, you know, is he doing all this by design, or is he just making it up as he goes along? And it's kind of both. There's a reason that Trump uh, is also re-educating Americans to like authoritarian leaders. Not a day goes by where he's like, oh, love letters with the head of North Korea, or Putin, he's the best, he's brilliant, or she, or think of who he praises and, and those he doesn't praise. So he's doing this kind of changing, uh, he's, cre he's creating an emotional and psychological and political culture climate to accept authoritarianism. And everything he does, he is a superb propagandist. It's unfortunately one of these situations people are going to realize later how, how uh, and these are the people he has convinced he's, you know, God, um, uh, how skilled he was at everything he does. Um, and all of his communications, all of his attention to the manufacturing of charisma. Um, so that, that's, that's part of it. So there is a design there uh, to, to become, to have absolute power. And the, his models are other autocrats. And that's what he wants. And he's very open. And the key thing is when he said in January 2016, I could stand on Fifth Avenue and shoot someone and I wouldn't lose any followers. He was telling, this goes back to the violence theme, but he was saying that he is gonna associate himself with violence, that he's personally capable of violence, and here's the key, he'll be loved because of that. The lawless goes back to the lawless. So, so he is, he's a uniquely dangerous also because he is a criminal in so many ways. I mean, tax fraud, bribery, um, sexual assault, right? And, and by the way, a lot of uh, authoritarians either have a criminal record when they're running for office or they're under investigation. Berlusconi, Putin, Trump, and there's so many of them. They are criminals. And so they come to power and they adjust. Uh, you know how Federico said that they adjust reality so their lies become the truth? They also adjust institutions so that they promote lawlessness and crime. So the second most uh, dangerous people, it, I would, it's an entity, it's the GOP. For the reasons I said before, the GOP has internalized uh, corruption and violence, and think about all the stuff about masculinity, um, homophobia, so all of these things have been internalized and they now um, have exited democracy. So, the, so just to close, the unique danger we have, we don't have a multi-party system where other, you can have these big, you see in the world, these big multi-party coalitions against the autocrats. Now they haven't won recently, but they've almost won in some cases. We don't have that option. So the, the Republicans who, who don't have, they have nowhere to go. Um, and indeed they're being threatened. So I'll just leave you with this chilling, um, the reason I say it's the whole GOP, that debate where all of them, this was a loyalty performance straight out of authoritarian history where they all raised their hands except for Chris Christie and Aza Hutchinson, who has 0% popularity as a result. And they said, I will support Trump even if he becomes a convicted felon. That's it. We are done with the first session of our five sessions. We're gonna turn um, our uh, attention to a 15 minute break at this point. Um, Ruth, Helmut, and Federico will be signing books out at the book fair. Um, we will be turning our attention directly to Jewish responses to fascism, now that we've defined fascism. Um, in our second session, please join me in uh, thanking our three panelists. Then I learned terror is more important than ideas. I'm going to escort them up the. Yeah.
to the to the book table. Okay. Why are people? So who's escorting people up with the book sign? Megan.
And there's water in there. Mm -hmm. I think we're. I think we're about ready to get started. I think we're about ready to get started. Give just another minute. Yeah, just give another minute for people to come seat themselves. And welcome to our second panel of the day, uh, where we'll be looking at uh, responses to fascism, Jewish responses to fascism in Europe. Let me introduce myself. My name is Jeff Weidlinger. I'm the chair of the Academic Advisory Council here at the Center for Jewish History. And I'm also a professor of history and Judaic studies at the University of Michigan where I work on the history of Jews in Ukraine. Um, let me note as well that, you know, that I am a historian of Jews in Ukraine and the two foreign countries in which I spend uh, most of my time abroad, Ukraine and Israel, are both at war today. And I want to acknowledge that. I know it's been acknowledged already, but I do want to acknowledge that and acknowledge the pain that many of us are feeling right now. Uh, may those who lost loved ones in Israel last week be comforted among the mourners of Zion and Jerusalem. May the captives be speedily returned in full health and spirit, restored to full health and spirit. 
and may the innocents be protected uh, in what is to come in the coming days, weeks, and uh, God forbid, months. Uh, I know these are difficult times, and we are here to talk about other difficult times in the past. So let me introduce our panelists today. Um, to the far to my left there is Ken Moss, uh, who is the Harriet and Ulrich Meyer Professor of Jewish History at the University of Chicago. He's a specialist on Jewish history in Eastern Europe and is the author, most recently, of An Unchosen People, Jewish Political Reckoning in Interwar Poland, and the editor, also most recently, of Volume 7 of the Posen Library of Jewish Culture and Civilization, on National Renaissance and International Horizons, 1880 to 1918, um, a book that I actually just received a copy of, and it really is a magnificent collection of material. Thank you, editor with uh, Professor Israel Bartal. Yeah, co editor with Israel Bartal, yeah. Uh, thank you. And he is working on a book now, perhaps, called Israel's Future A History, uh, which I'm sure is changing as we speak. Uh, to Ken's right is Professor Michael Brenner, who is Distinguished Professor of History and Seymour and Lillian Abenson Chair in Israel Studies at American University. Uh, Professor Brenner has been awarded the Order of Merit of the Federal Republic of Germany and was the first recipient of the Salo W. and Jeanette M. Barron Award for Scholarly Excellence in Research on the Jewish Experience. He is the author of nine books on Israel, Zionism, and Germany, and most recently, the author of In Hitler's Munich, The Jews and the Revolution and the Rise of Nazism. And then to Michael's right is Shira Klein, who is associate professor at Chapman University, and she is a expert on Jews in Italy and is the author of Italy's Jews from Emancipation to Fascism. Uh, and she's currently working on Jews' participation in Italy's African empire from the 1890s to World War II. Uh, she is also a digital historian and is the author of a very important article on uh, Wikipedia and the falsification of history and of Holocaust history in Wikipedia. So I'm going to ask them each a few questions. We'll do a few rounds of questions uh, and they'll each respond in about three to five minutes and then we'll open things up to public, uh, to public comment. And for the public comment, uh, if you'd like to write down your questions, you can write those down at any time, and at around noon we'll start collecting the questions. A little bit before noon we'll collect the questions, which I will read from here as we did in the last uh, panel. So my first question to the panelists is, how did the Jews in the location that you study, Italy, Germany, and Eastern Europe, experience the era that saw the rise of fascist movements, uh, essentially experience the era between the two world wars? So beginning with Shira. Thank you, and it's great to be here. And uh, yeah, I just want to join Jeff in uh, acknowledging what is happening in Israel. And to add, may, may all the innocents be spared on both sides, Israelis and Palestinians. Um, so how did Italian Jews experience the era that saw fascism's rise to power? In Italy, um, Jews' experience of fascism was very much shaped by their class. So Italian fascism rose to power on the backdrop of this depolarization in Italian society between, on the one hand, the working class left, and on the other hand, the middle class right. Um, so the working class was revolutionary. It was inspired by uh, the Bolshevist revolution. And at the apex of working class agitation, which was 1919 to 1920, this was called the Red Biennium or the Red Two Years, workers went on massive strikes. Uh, so they shut down factories for weeks on end. They, uh, they led land grabs. Um, they uh, disabled the economy um, for, uh, for, for, for weeks on end as well. And all of these things really frustrated and really um, scared the middle class. Um, the middle class had a lot to lose, as you can imagine. Unlike workers who had very little to lose, um, the middle class was uh, paralyzed by this fear, very frustrated with the centrist government for uh, not containing this movement, and they were hoping for some form of authority to come and put an end to this, to what they perceived as this really scary chaos. 
and enter Mussolini, right? And so Mussolini was very um, welcomed by the middle class. He marketed himself as the strongman who would deliver the country from chaos. Italian Jews were, in their overwhelming majority, middle class. So they, like others uh, of their standing, uh, opposed the strikes of the working class and um, were incredibly relieved when, um, th when, when they ended, right? Um, so Italians were, uh, Italian Jews um, were, were relieved when, when Mussolini came to power in 1922 and that the memory of, of how terrible these strikes had been, how terrible this agitation had been, helped shape their approach to Mussolini in the 1920s. Um, and then in the 1930s, um, the Italian uh, fascist regime offered various benefits to the middle class and Jews, not as Jews, but again as uh, white collar professionals, particularly the men among them, um, very much benefited from, from, uh, uh, from these benefits. Um, so for example, during the uh, Great Depression uh, in the early 30s in Italy, um, as wages dropped precipitously, uh, Mussolini's regime was sure to um, provide all sorts of um, safeguards to protect uh, middle-class uh, salaries. So if one was a white-collar employee, which most Jews were, or if one was uh, a manager, or if one was a government bureaucrat, um, then one would be shielded by the government from, uh, from, from economic downturns. Um, and Jews, uh, along with other middle-class um, citizens in Italy, got housing help, they got special benefits, um, they got uh, um, travel discounts, um, they got longer sick leave, um, and so there are all these perks to being uh, part of the middle class in Italy under Mussolini, and I would say that, um, in a nutshell, is how Jews experienced the rise of fascism, and of course we'll talk later about what changed. Great, thank you. Um, Michael? Yes, of course, in Germany, the situation was quite different. Um, unlike Italian fascism, National Socialism um, had anti-Semitism as a central element from its very beginning, and Jews realized that. And um, when we, I, I stay for uh, maybe in this first round, in the 1920s, before, or, or early 20s and early 30s, before Hitler actually came to power, as you know, Hitler tried to come to power already in 1923, actually next month, will be 100 years after the failed beer hall putsch in Munich. And um, it was in the early 1920s that Jews in Germany, especially in the place where Hitler lived and which he used as a testing ground, as I tried to show in my last book, and that was Munich. Uh, that's where the Jewish community already experienced in the early 1920s, I would say pogrom-like uh, scenes um, where they experienced Hitler playing with this weapon anti-Semitism and trying to figure out how would the German population react if he used anti-Semitism as part of his movement, of his ideology. Now Munich, where this happened first, is of course a very special place also in terms of Jewish history. Um, the revolution of 1918, which overthrew the Bavarian king, resulted in a republic and the first prime minister of Bavaria was a Berlin Jew and socialist, Kurt Eisner, who was assassinated a few months later. And then there were two councillor, some people say Soviet re republics in Bavaria, in Munich, in 1919, and almost all of the leaders were Jewish. Hitler was in Munich at that time, and he, um, at least later, wrote in Mein Kampf, mein Kampf that that was very decisive for him. I'm not so sure, but he experienced it and was easy to use. And we've heard that already in the first round, how, of course, whenever the fight is against leftist, communist, socialist, and democracy. Jews are usually part of the mix. So in Munich, that was very central, and that's where this new movement started, and that's how Jews experienced it in the early 1920s, actually with a government that was very conservative, Hitler was not in the government, and that tried twice 
to expel East European Jews from Bavaria in 1920 and 1923. Uh, Munich was a city of already in January of 1923, a m movie actually produced in Munich, Nathan the Wise, the parable of tolerance of 18th century German writer Lessing, could not be performed in movie theaters because the Nazis were so strong that they threatened all the movie theater owners, if you perform it, we'll smash your windows, which they did. So it was basically not performed. In Berlin, it was performed a lot, with a lot of success. So I would say it also depends where in Germany in the 1920s Jews lived, how they experienced it. In Berlin, in Hamburg, maybe a little less than in a place like Munich or, or Nuremberg. Um, and then, of course, 100 years ago, um, the insurrection, the beer hall, which happened in Munich, and Hitler was, you know, not successful yet. But uh, we all should be careful with in failed insurrections. Ten years later, he, su he succeeded. So that's just a little glimpse, maybe also on a local level, um, at the very stage where Hitler uh, developed his movement. And Kenya, as we move further to the east. Well, I think one thing to keep in mind as we think about the, the experience of the 20s and 30s for Jews in Eastern Europe is that we're dealing with many different countries, tremendously variegated uh, Jewish populations, uh, you know, uh, leaving aside Soviet Jews, the Jews of Soviet Ukraine and Belarus, we're talking about five plus million people, um, three million of whom were in Poland, and I'll, I'll concentrate my remarks on Poland for that reason, but, but even within the Polish Jewish community, and obviously there were, uh, was a tremendous range of experiences, just as there were a tremendous range of uh, religious and cultural identities, uh, class sensibilities, politics. So having said that, I think if we had to begin somewhere to generalize, I think it's fair to say that in the interwar period, for Polish Jews and Mutatis Matandis for Jews in Romania, certainly Jews in Hungary in a different way, um, the, the horizon was one that looked darker and darker even though in many ways, uh, for much of this time, everyday life could be lived without particular uh, uh, um, trouble because of one's Jewishness. And I think if we had to sum up that horizon, um, we would say that um, uh, a substantial part of the societies, the deeply divided societies around Jews, deeply divided among other things over how they felt about Jews, but a substantial part of those societies and a growing part of those societies uh, embraced or were open to the idea, there's a, a range here, that Jews, the Jews, this large community in their, in their, within their uh, societies, um, were a problem of some sort, maybe a grave problem, maybe a terrible threat to the common wheel of the nation, that was the view of an expanding right, and then uh, you know, maybe at any rate some kind of problem. This was linked to many things. These were societies that, um, had tremendous uh, developmental, they, they were new states ruling over societies that uh, faced all kinds of developmental problems. Um, these were poor societies with a lot of people living hand to mouth. This got even worse during the Great Depression in a place like Poland. There were uh, four million unemployed or underemployed people out of a population of about 30 million. And in this setting, the Jews of Eastern Europe, quite differently from the, the Jewish community of Italy and Germany, which were broadly bourgeois Jewish communities, um, well integrated into generally well-off middle classes, um, the Jews of Eastern Europe were uh, a, a much larger population, both absolutely and relatively. So the Jews of Poland, about three million Polish Jews, a little more by the end of the period. That's 10% of the population. They were also somewhere around 35 to 45% of the urban population. And they were, on paper, 50% of the so-called middle class, or the, at least the commercial middle class. Now when you dig down, the vast majority of those people were not wealthy industrialists, they were desperately impoverished petty merchants. Um, but if you were sort of looking at this as a Jew and thinking, will, this, will the larger society allow this to stand, in which we are the urban population, uh, especially as you go further east, in which we are the middle class population, whatever that might mean, uh, there were reasons, lots of reasons to worry that it wouldn't. Um, and I think maybe that's where I'll stop and we can drill down into the kind of particularities of that in the next question. Yeah, because you've kind of gotten on to what the next question is about, which is really what the movements, what right-wing, authoritarian, fascist, national socialist movements had to say specifically about the Jews and the extent to which anti-Semitism was embedded within their ideology or was not embedded within their ideology, and if so, what types of anti-Semitism 
uh, that was, whether it was instrumentalized or whether it was actually uh, systemic uh, in, their, in their ideologies. So we'll go in the same order, starting with uh, Shira. So in Italy, uh, the history of anti-Semitism has one big watershed moment, and that is 1938. Prior to 1938, uh, Italian fascism did not have anti-Semitism on its banner. Um, there, there was uh, rampant anti-Semitism in Italy, uh, but it had existed before the fascists came to power, and um, it came from the conservative right, and especially the Catholic Church, um, and that was true for earlier decades as well. Right-wingers in Italy, as elsewhere in Europe, uh, fan stereotypes about a quote-unquote world Jewry, um, seeped in uh, liberalism, in Russian communism. Um, they, they talked about Jews as atheists, as, uh, as, as, as Bolshevists, as cosmopolitan, right? Today, cosmopolitan is a nice word, but in a hyper-nationalist uh, Italy of the, the interwar, it was a really grave charge. And, um, and by the way, the irony is that Jews in Italy were as far as possible from communism. There were, there were a handful of, of communist Italian Jews, but uh, overall, like I said, they tended to, 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 to oppose um, this kind of working class uh, uh, ideology. And high up fascist officials were, were not immune to this. Uh, they partook in the same kinds of accusations. Uh, Mussolini himself penned an article about, um, uh, that, that was full of stereotypes about Jews, speaking about them as the Jewish bankers of London and New York. Um, and then Giovanni Preziosi, who had become, uh, who later became Minister of State, published um, uh, the, uh, the well known <clears throat> Protocols of the Elders of Zion, which, if you haven't heard of that, it's this text purporting to be a Jewish plan to take over the world. Um, and in fact, it was penned by, uh, by anti-Semites. Um, but anyway, Preziosi uh, had this translated into Italian, published it, and all 15,000 copies immediately sold out, which I can tell you is the dream of any scholar, right, in this room. Um, but uh, from Italian Jews' vantage point, these um, expressions of anti-Semitism paled in comparison to what was happening in neighboring Germany. And um, the worse Hitler was to Jews, um, right from 1933 onwards, the, the worse the policy was, the more Italian Jews blessed their good fortune for, for being in Italy. 1938 was this big watershed moment because the fascist government did an about turn and started a racial campaign that brought Italian Jews to a situation that was actually very similar to that of German Jews. Um, almost overnight, Italian Jews could not marry non-Jews. They could not uh, work in various professions. They could not hire non-Jewish uh, nannies. Uh, they could not. Um, uh, they, they 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 could not go to the seaside. They could not advertise. You name the restriction, it probably existed. And um, and I I will add that Italy was not forced by Germany to take this racial turn. Um, and often people think this was part of the Pact of Steel. It actually wasn't. It predated the Pact of Steel, which wasn't until May of 39. And in any case, the Pact of Steel made no mention of Jews. And Italy certainly drew inspiration from Germany uh, for its, for its anti-Semitic laws. But it also had a homegrown variant of racism that um, mirrored the, um, the already existing uh, 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 racial laws in colonial Africa. So Italy had these race laws in Ethiopia, in Libya, and you see that the anti-Jewish race laws um, are mirroring both the language and the content of that. And then, of course, in 1943, Italians also played a role um, in facilitating the deportation of Jews. Thanks. For Michael, let me actually rephrase the question a little bit more specifically for you, because you'd mentioned Jewish involvement in the revolutionary movements and, uh, and their national socialism framing itself as an opposition to the revolutionary movement. So just if you can maybe point to specifically the extent to which, uh, you know, Nazi anti-Semitism is, you know, utilized political motifs versus racial motifs versus religious motifs, and think about it in terms of that as well. Uh, I would say it's very hard to distinguish because they come very much together. And of course, in Germany, everybody is aware of that. Uh, anti-Semitism was a very 
crucial systemic part of the ideology of national socialism. So if the watershed in Italy was 1938, in Germany it was 1919-20, and that's already when Hitler had taken over and renamed the party now, the Nazi party, National Socialist uh, Workers' Party, and also uh, basically coined a party program that depicted the Jew, as they would say, as the enemy of this new, uh, newly defined community, the Volksgemeinschaft, the community of the German people, which now was defined as Aryan and Jews were strangers in Germany. And uh, so that came with the very establishment of the Nazi movement. And of course, to go back to your question, Jeff, it was part of a post-war um, discourse and of a situation where Germany was felt humiliated after the last war and after being blamed for the outbreak of the war and a huge economic crisis. And um, Jews were, of course, not suddenly discovered as the scapegoats. We all know that is a very long history, also in Germany. Uh, the very term anti-Semitism was coined in Germany in the late 19th century by a ju pretty obscure journalist called Wilhelm Marl. And um, there was, of course, already a racially defined anti-Semitism back then. Um, what was different after World War I is now that Jews, together with others, socialists especially, the left, were blamed that Germany lost the war, the so-called stab in the back legend, um, that they, Germany, of course, could not have lost the war on the battlefield. Um, it must have been uh, the internal enemies of the Jews. So, so this was very, much, very prominent already uh, in the very early 1920s as every single Nazi poster and propaganda piece made clear. I just want to say one last sentence. It didn't mean that every voter who voted for the Nazi party voted for it because of their anti-Semitism. They might have voted because, they might have voted despite their anti-Semitism, they might not have cared about, but the party leadership did. Yeah, Ken, go ahead. Well, I think, um, you know, once again, it's, so, it's such a peculiar, so different in Eastern Europe that before jumping into the question of the East European right wing parties, much less the fascist dimensions thereof, I think it's probably most useful to step back and try and give a, a general picture. And here, I just want to, I mean, I, we don't, I don't usually put in a plug for other people's book, but this book by the late great uh, story, Ezra Mendelssohn, uh, The Jews of East, East Central Europe Between uh, the World Wars, published uh, 40 years ago, uh, uh, remains, I think, the, uh, quite extraordinary a place to begin to think about uh, this problem. And one of the things Mendelssohn reminds us of is that, again, from 60,000 feet, if you want to give a generalization, you might say that the political situation in interwar Eastern Europe, with variations in each place, is best understood as a sort of a somewhat authoritarian center, um, uh, f ruling, stretching a kind of thin membrane of quiet over of, of very divided societies, and facing its most robust opposition from a mobilized nationalist right. There were lefts in some of these places. Poland, for instance, had a, a meaningful left, uh, PPS socialist left, but you know, a scene from the standpoint of East European, of sort of, uh, what, what East European Jews were seeing, um, they were uh, in many ways in societies uh, ruled by states that were at various junctures taken into the hands of strong men, but those strong men were often as not um, considerably less committed to anti-Semitic politics uh, uh, and to the politics of transformation through, among other things, extruding Jews from society than quite broad-based uh, right-wing nationalist movements. Um, to focus in on Poland, for instance, I mean, uh, you know, it, to focus on fascism, I think, is the wrong way to go. And in a strange way, it sort of is a gaslight, inadvertently a kind of gaslighting of the Polish situation because there were fascist elements by the mid-30s. There was, and already by the 20s, there were certainly student elements the universities, as in Germany, were hotbeds of right-wing uh, extremism. Um, there were fascist elements. There were people fascinated by the Italian case and then later by the uh, Spanish case as a model. Um, but these elements were just part of a much broader uh, right-wing that um, 
had very varied and often quite minimal interest in fascisms per se, but was very committed to an ethno-nationalist uh, ideal uh, and um, a very f full of suspicion turned active hatred toward national minorities, of which there were many, uh, on sort of broad nationalist grounds, uh, and um, sometimes linked in the Polish case, for instance, and certainly in the Romanian case to um, very vocal and probably authentic commitment on the part of those same right-wing leaders to religion. Uh, uh, and, and, you know, fascism was a kind of a, kind of a footnote, certainly in Poland, uh, to what is best understood more as a kind of um, nationalist, ethno-nationalist sensibility. Um, as we kind of dig in in a more granular way, we could talk certainly about the, um, the um, uh, another point that has to be made too is that in these various places, the quite various Jewish communities had very different kinds of resources for um, not just resistance, but even for voice. So the, the Jews of Poland were 10%. They were not a negligible minority. They, uh, they, they had a, a, a access to um, rights, constitutional rights of speech, although those rights were, were increasingly diminished. They had access to the kinds of tools that we think of as the tools one needs to fight out an, a, a struggle of opinion and the breeding of toleration in the public sphere. At the same time, and, and much more so than Romanian Jews, much more so than uh, Hungarian Jews, at the same time, I think you want to note that even there, um, when in 1926 there was a coup from the center that basically mm, created a semi-authoritarian regime, the vast majority of Jews were, were thrilled and relieved because the trajectory of democratic politics, 1918 to 25 in Poland, was toward the increasing power of the nationalist right. So it's very hard to predict the future even in, in <laughs> when you look back on it, but from the standpoint of many Jews, th they were at least as worried about what democracy meant in societies riven by deep social problems and shaped by nationalism as they were by anything relating to authoritarianism. Great, thanks. And you know, I want to now turn to Jewish responses to fascism. And you know, I think in the three regions that we're talking about, there's going to be a, uh, there's going to be some difference. In Italy, where certainly before 1938, there was no reason why Jews couldn't belong to the fascist movement and did in fact. And in uh, in Poland, in particular, where I think you're right that we can't really speak of a real fascist movement in Poland, but ethno nationalist movement. There were certainly Jews involved in their own ethno nationalist movement in Poland as well that I'd like to hear about. And then in Germany, I don't think there were many Jews who were supporters of National Socialism because of the intrinsic anti-Semitism of it, um, but how they responded uh, in other ways. So to Jewish responses to Nazism, Shira? Or actually, Jewish responses to fascism, yeah. Yeah, that, that's, uh, that's right. Before 1938, uh, most Jews did not join the ranks of anti-fascists. So that's, that's a lot of negatives, did not join the ranks of the anti-fascists. Um, there were some vocal Jewish anti-fascists, like the Rosselli brothers, but really most Italian Jews were somewhere along the spectrum between um, accepting fascism and supporting fascism, um, or at most being indifferent to it. And the reason for that, again, goes back to what I mentioned before, the, the 1920s and this very strong memory of uh, the chaos that uh, preceded uh, Mussolini and, and this relief at, at Mussolini's cracking down on, on, on that agitation. Um, <clears throat> and then again, the, the benefits that, that Jews gained as a middle class. Um, but I'll also add that Italian Jews endorsed uh, fascism's imperial designs. Um, and so that very same racial rhetoric that would uh, later be turned on them in 1938, right, when the, the language and the content of anti-black race laws uh, was harnessed for anti-Jewish race laws, that very same, uh, um, that very same rhetoric uh, was one that um, Jews mostly accepted in, uh, in, the, in the 20s and in the 30s, in 1935, which was uh, the time when uh, Italy, fascist Italy uh, uh, took over Ethiopia. Most Italian Jews were really gung-ho about that, very um, enthusiastic. And then um, after 1938, um, Italian Jews mostly responded with shock, disbelief, um, an insistence that um, it was Hitler who had twisted Mussolini's arm, um, that Italy would never, the true Italy would never turn against them, um, and that it would be fixed soon. And as the years passed and it wasn't fixed, 
um, Italian then Jews then saw um, ordinary Italians partaking in uh, this persecution, and then again, as I mentioned, uh, participating in the roundups for uh, that led to, deep, to deportation. Um, and um, people often think that um, the alliance of Italian Jews um, uh, with fascism is really counterintuitive, right? And I think particularly people in this country uh, where Jews have had such a strong uh, tradition of fighting fascism. Um, but I will say that even today, Jews are not immune to fascism. Um, and uh, in my home country, Israel, right, fascist tendencies, as, a, as sort of Ruth uh, uh, mentioned before, um, are rearing their ugly heads. So to the extent that we're speaking about militarism, homophobia, xenophobia, uh, chauvinism, consolidation of power in the hands of the executive, all of these things are happening um, today, again, by Jews. But to go back to Italy, um, Italian Jews today, I think, have uh, a deep discomfort about their ancestors having tolerated or even supported fascism. And um, I'll just end with like a little anecdote that when I did my research in Italy, I did research in a whole bunch of cities, and one of the, um, one of the cities I was working in the archive of a Jewish community, and the archivist said, um, you know, before you, um, before you scan any document over here, you have to get permission for every single document you scan. And that whoever's worked in archives known that that knows that that's a very unusual request, right? Particularly when you're looking at hundreds of documents. And I said, why do I need your permission for every single document? Surely it's enough to just give me permission to look at a certain collection. And he said, can you imagine how people would feel um, if they saw in your book that you mention, based on this archival collection, that their grandparent was supportive of fascism? Can you imagine how they would feel? And I think that's really illustrative of this discomfort that um, Jews in Italy have today, right? Where, um, where of course, we know how, how things um, turned out. Let me just, before going to Michael, let me remind the audience that you can be writing down questions and we will soon be collecting questions. And for those of you who are watching online, you can also pose questions in the chat function and uh, somebody in that room over there will write them down and bring them to me and we can ask those too. So we'll soon be turning to those. Uh, Michael. So when Hitler came to power in January 1933, um, Jews reacted in different ways. And let me remind you, Jews were surprised as many others. Um, I looked uh, recently at the messages for the new year published in December 1932 in the Jewish newspapers and there was this kind of optimism. Things are getting better and the Nazis finally lost some votes in the last elections and uh, it will be a good year. That was kind of not, not rarely expressed. But when it, and, 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 and still in early 19, th in January 1933, the first Jewish museum in Berlin was inaugurated. And even in March, after Hitler was already chancellor, a Prussian delegation came to, to, to the Jewish museum in Berlin to admire the collection of the new museum. So that was the situation. But I would say Jews reacted in, in, in four different ways. Um, there was a small fringe of very nationalist German Jews, very right-wing German Jews. I wouldn't say too large a number, but they were also audible. Um, somebody like Hans Joachim Schöps, a young youth leader at the time, they would try to say we should somehow collaborate. They knew that they could never join the Nazi party, but they said, let's distance ourselves from the East European Jews and we are the true German Jews and do some kind of collaboration. Of course, they did get no response from Hitler and the Nazi government. The much, much larger group, by far the largest, were the Jews who called themselves liberal German Jews, or often we might call them, you know, to some degree assimilated. Um, and they uh, had, in a way, the hardest time. As Max Liebermann, famous impressionist painter, expressed it in a letter to Mayor Dizengov um, and uh, to the mayor of uh, Tel Aviv and, and to Bialik, the national Jewish poet, po uh, he, he said, this fate weighs really hard on all of us, but especially on us assimilated German Jews, he said, who now, who, were, who have been dreaming 
the dream of assimilation, of being just Germans first, and now we have to awake from this dream. So that was already in early 1933. And I think it expresses well this uh, ideology also around the Zentralverein, the Central Association of German citizens of the Jewish faith. And they tried with the common means, with the traditional means to adapt themselves to the new regime. And of course, like many others, they hoped, like many non-Jews too, they hoped that you know, Hitler's government would go away after a while. Uh, and after all, Jews were just 1% in Germany, about half a million, a little more than half a million, 1933, so there was no way of actively fighting there and, and, and in any successful way. The third part uh, were the Zionists. And the Zionists, in a way, in a way said, see, we told you so. Anti-Semitism has always been there, it's strong, and of course their answer was you should go and leave Germany and go especially to Palestine. Um, interestingly, most German Zionists had not done so before 1933 themselves. Then they told the poor East European Jews, oh, you know, we'll give you money and support you that you can go because you're suffering. But now German Zionists felt that they should go. And the fourth group uh, were the Orthodox German Jews who, and if you look at the, how the Orthodox papers react in 1933, it was also a very traditional way, you know. Um, first of all, you can find the accusation. It was all the non-observant Jews who brought this suffering because they didn't fulfill the mitzvah. They didn't really live the Jewish lives. Uh, and in the end, um, you know, we'll trust in God and, 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 and that will help us. So these were, I would say, four different modes of different groups of German Jews, how to respond in 1933. Um, as I said, I think by then it was already too late to fight Nazism in a successful way. Uh, maybe the churches could have done it, maybe the unions could have done it, maybe others, but for this 1% of Jews, they just tried somehow either to survive or leave Germany uh, or arrange with the new rulers. And again, we are collecting questions um, both in the theater and online, so, Ken? Let me um, divide the question up because I think it's worth asking how uh, Polish Jews particularly um, helped or sought to fight Nazism in Germany. And, and maybe we can find, I can finally speak to the question of fascism rather than pushing it to the side. I mean, there, there certainly were, uh, first of all, it remains to, to be just reiterated that uh, um, um, until the late 30s uh, in Poland, uh, the regime was not officially committed to exclusionary anti-Semitism. Uh, and so we're not talking about a situation remotely like uh, either of these two situations, since that the, that the question of one's relation to fascism is really a relation uh, to one's own uh, government um, uh, until, again, the late 30s. Um, and uh, here, you know, there, uh, there, another thing to say is um, Polish Jewry, even more than most Jewries, was profoundly divided along ideological lines. There was a, a robust socialist, Marxist, socialist, anarchist, and also small but much hyped communist left in Polish Jewry and, and figures like in those that those worlds and some elements on the, the left, the socialist left of the Zionist movement, um, the term fascism meant a lot. It, to come very back to points that were made by the panelists of the previous panel, uh, it, was, it was a term that resonated analytically for those on and close to the left across the world. Um, and for those figures, you know, they thought themselves to be lived to be facing uh, an iteration of fascism. And so, you know, uh, some, some thousands, several thousand Polish Jews, almost all linked in some ways to the left, went off to fight in the Spanish Civil War in the International Brigades uh, on the Republican side, so, as, as did many German Jews and American Jews. Um, most often, not because per se they were Jewish, but because they understood uh, this as a, a front in a single struggle between fascism and republicanism, or fascism and socialism, what have you. Um, most Polish Jews, of course, did not think that, and nor did they have any obvious way to fight uh, Nazism, but especially right at the very beginning, uh, uh, after the ascension of the Nazis to power, uh, many Polish Jews, certainly it seems like a large majority across the camps, were strongly committed to the idea that they should try and do something, and the something, especially between 33 and 34, which also resonated here in, in the US, especially in New York, was some kind of idea about a worldwide Jewish boycott. If we boycott German goods, um, 
at the very least will have a symbolic effect and maybe we can have a real effect. I think in retrospect it's hard to see how they could have had a real effect, um, but, but there was an effort, and it was a very popular effort to, um, including pressure on German, Jew, Jewish merchants in uh, Poland, small towns, local pressure from friends and family and, and, and colleagues to stop dealing in German goods. Um, by 35, that was clearly no, not gonna go anywhere for a variety of reasons. And I think taking a big step back, if we ask a different question, what was East European Jewish resistance? What could it have been to this much more amorphous world of feeling like your future is being foreclosed, feeling like it's unlikely that your kids are going to have a place in this society that they'd want to have, um, or at any rate, it's less and less likely. Um, what would resistance look like? You know, there were Jews who fought back against various kinds of fascist toughs and thugs and students in the hallways of Romanian and Polish universities, often helped by, by non-Jewish peers, usually from the left. Um, uh, there was plenty of, of Jewish resistance to local violence, degrees of which we're still discovering. Uh, the historian Kamal Kiyak is discovering just how much organized right-wing violence against Jews there was uh, in places like Kiltse, Częstochowa, others around 1931, 32, and Jews fought back. Uh, sometimes we're talking about fist fights, right? Later on, it was, it was more armed resistance against more dire attacks. Um, but that's not a movement, right? <laughs> uh, and I think in some ways, the, the real question becomes, was, was trying to get out resistance, or was it running away? And it was certainly not my place to cast aspersions, I was trying to get out, but it's worth remembering, many, many Polish Jews would have just wanted to leave, and it was hard to get anywhere. Palestine was an interesting partial acceptance, <coughs> except, exception. Uh, in 32 to 36. The last thing I'll say is, and to come back to Shira's point, that there's certainly nothing hardwired into Jewish political culture in Eastern Europe that means makes for supporting democracy. Uh, and, nor, and, and I'm not sure I can blame them. Democracy can, can you know, is an essential part of, uh, uh, um, unfortunately, far right wing movements in all sorts of places, including Israel today. Um, uh, it's not na the natural eternal enemy uh, of fascism, and I think that's uh, something to remember. Thank you. Do we have time to do questions? To yes. Yeah, we, we go until 12.15, is that correct? Yeah, okay, all right, great. All right, so there's a few, the, I can group the questions into a few general categories. Um, I think one of them is uh, historical questions. And the historical questions relate a lot to um, the situation in Italy, the extent, really, the, the, they all relate to the extent to which or somewhat of Jewish involvement in fascist movements. Um, and then the extent to which in Italy, uh, anti-Jewish laws were uh, imposed as a result of Hitler's influence or whether they were uh, domestic creation. So that's one, and then Jewish involvement in fascism um, in all three of the countries. Uh, were there Jews who were uh, involved in fascism in Germany and Jewish fascist movements in Poland as well? So maybe we'll start with that, a quick round on that, and then the other group of questions has to do with the contemporary moment that we're in. So I'll save that for the next round. Uh, so Shira. So, so just more on uh, how Jews endorsed fascism? Or? Yeah, I, I think there's, two, there's two, two different types of questions. So one is, yes, how Jews in Italy endorsed fascism, uh, the extent to which they did, and then the other, the extent to which uh, anti-Semitic developments in fascist Italy uh, were domestic developments or were responses to Hitler's rise in Germany. Right. Um, I mean, there are all sorts of um, all sorts of expressions uh, of uh, Jews supporting fascism. So, as I mentioned, 1935, the conquest of, of, or the, the 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 takeover of Ethiopia generated um, in Jewish enthusiasm. Um, Italian Jewish women would give their wedding rings along with non-Jewish women. Um, this was called sort of the collection of gold for the patria for the fatherland. Um, <laughs> Jews would um, give money to uh, fascist causes. Um, they would uh, join the, the military to fight in Ethiopia. Um, uh, let me think. Uh, Jewish children were in, uh, in, Jewish fa in, in fascist uh, youth groups. Um, this was sort of dairy uh, but it, it wasn't completely, you know, mandatory. But um, Jew Jewish parents were normally happy to send their Jewish, uh, their, their their children to to fascist uh, youth movements. Um, so these are just a few kind of anecdotal examples. And uh, maybe one thing I'll add that I you know, just to, to provide some new information is um, even Jews in Libya 
Um, there's an interesting phenomenon over there of Jews in Lib Libya endorsing fascism, which is c kind of in a way the, the uh, really, th that to me is, is, is really surprising. Um, still working on this, is, this is the topic of my second book, um, but even as this regime is discriminating against colonial subjects, here are these colonial subjects who are um, uh, helping it and actually going to fight in the Ethiopian war. Um, and then for the second question, of, uh, um, Hitler did not, so this is, a, this is a very common misperception, Hitler did not force Mussolini or Germany did not force Italy to enact the racial laws and Italy's racial turn is still to being discussed by historians. Some people say it is uh, you know, really an effect of uh, the colonial um, uh, policies that, that defined uh, races. Um, and acted on that, and some people say it was more a demographic thing. Some people say it was because Mo Mussolini's popularity had dwindled by then, um, and so he was in search of a new enemy to rile up Italians to support him. So um, that is still a, a, a question. And hey, Michael. Well, in Germany, it was basically impossible for Jews to openly embrace National Socialism because the party controlled who was a member or, or who, who would even be allowed in any of their um, rallies and uh, you were only allowed as an Aryan. Now sometimes the question is who is an Aryan? Uh, and there are of course individuals who have partly, very partially Jewish biographies who um, wanted to prove themselves and not only to the Nazi party but also other uh, very right-wing Organizations. I mentioned before that the prime, first prime minister of Bavaria, Kurt Eisner, was assassinated a few months after he was uh, took office, and that was in February 1919. And his assassin was a 20-year-old called Graf von Arco. Now, Arco was a very prominent uh, Bavarian-Austrian aristocratic family, but on his mother's side, uh, she was a Ney Oppenheim. So the Oppenheimers were, of course, they were already baptized, I think the third generation, of an important banking family. And he wanted to show to his, to the organization he wanted to belong to, the Thule organization, a very right-wing uh, um, fascist uh, core group in Munich, that he could belong to by doing this. Um, didn't help him, of course, but, um, but you have cases like that. But Jews were basically not allowed to join any of these organizations. Again, uh, there were some who tried in 1933 or even 32 already to find a way to, to align themselves and that all failed terribly. The East European case, again, is much more complicated. In some sense, it's, it's just as simple in the sense that all of the organized East European expressly fascist or close enough that within spitting distance, as it were, fascist movements were intensely anti-Semitic and Jews were not allowed. So the Iron Guard in Romania, the Arrow Cross in Hungary, uh, the, you know, the so-called Falangists or the ABC group in Poland, whatever, I mean, they, 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 no Jews allowed. So that was an easy answer to the question. Um, were there Jews on the right and what does that look like and, what, and, and were they shaped by fascism is a harder question um, which sim can't simply be answered by no. Uh, and I, I, if, if people are interested in sort of the Polish Jewish case, I think there's a very careful and very intelligent book by um, my colleague Dan Heller on the Beitar movement, on the youth movement of the Zionist revisionists. So there was, there were elements in the Polish Jewish world who would have called themselves rightists. And let me take one step back and say, unlike the Italian case, it, it, there were Jewish bourgeoisies um, who were, broadly speaking, assimilated to the dominant culture Certainly that defined a good half of Hungarian Jews. It was an important, much smaller, but important part of Polish Jewry. But, but, that, but they identified with, I think really universally, the liberal strands in the larger national culture. So that wasn't a path to uh, fascism for, for anyone. Um, within the Zionist right, you had elements certainly um, among the young people. Uh, Menachem Begin, for instance, Yitzhak Shamir, those figures, um, who, were, who were certainly impressed by fascist style. You can find photos of them with the, the bonfires and the uniforms. Um, and I guess in some sense I would refer us back to our, um, to our first panelists, who, which, which if you missed it, um, you should really see because it's quite important. 
uh, and, and quite, quite brilliant um, uh, ways to begin thinking about these kinds of questions too. Um, one essential point one of the panelists made was that one defining feature of fascism is not just readiness to use violence, because people on both right and left in many ways in this part of the world were, but a commitment to the idea that violence is good, it's essential, it's the essence of politics, it's how you build a future. Um, you should yourself take part in it, it makes you a better person, a uh, better part of the nation. Um, those ideas, I think, are not easily found in a very straightforward way in the revisionist right in Poland, but they're there, and you can certainly find elements of them uh, in the revisionist youth scene uh, in uh, uh, Palestine, the late 30, mid, mid 30s even, people like Yevin. Um, so that we'd have to begin to answer that even more fully, we'd have to think more carefully about what fascism could mean and how it relates without any kind of hard line that splits it to a larger world of rightist uh, politics. Thanks. Um, and then the, in the time remaining, the larger stack of questions that I have here ask about the current moment and particularly about perceptions of the rise of fascism in the United States and uh, what people see as the rise of fascist movements in power in Israel as well. And I think I can summarize the questions with the really the fundamental question of what have we learned? Um, and maybe I'll add what is, that's a difficult question, but what does the future hold? Uh, in two minutes each. <laughs> and Shira, if we can start with or, or do you want to start, Ken? You've got the microphone close to your hand. I can't close to your mouth. Great. I'll, you I'll, I'll begin, and then you guys can correct everything and, and put us back on course. I mean, you know, I, there's no easy answer to the question, what's the relation between democracy and fascism? And one thing that Shira's case painfully reminds us is that not all fascisms are going to embrace anti-Semitism as their organizing principle. And if that's what Jews are thinking about, they may find themselves in, you know, um, they may find themselves saying, I don't really see what's so bad about this regime. It's attacking other people. Um, so, you know, I, I think, uh, fortunately, uh, American Jews, in at least 80% of them, understand that liberal democracy is not a luxury, it's a necessity uh, in our setting. And, and that doesn't have anything to do with the Jewish tradition. I mean, I think that I, I'm very loath to draw direct connections between the interwar experience of East European Jews uh, and American Jewish life. They're not, that's not a useful heuristic in so many ways. But I, so one thing you could falsely learn from the East European Jewish situation is democracy <laughs> doesn't matter. <laughs> Much better to have a strong leader who can keep things under wraps. I, I think that'd be a very foolish thing to imagine as being a useful heuristic for thinking about our contemporary situation. Uh, Michael, you wanna? Well, uh, unfortunately, Jews are not immune to fascism. The Holocaust was not a re-education program, and uh, we can see today that, that uh, there are Jewish followers of movements that at least remind us of fascist tendencies, both in the US and Israel and other countries. Uh, even in Germany, the AfD, this very right-wing party, has its tiny but still a circle called Jews of the AfD. I think most of them are actually of, like most Jews in Germany today, are of uh, former Soviet background, but it's a small group, but you know, it's important for this party, which is also interesting that today's right-wing populist parties, I would say in most of Europe and of course in America, try to say that they are not anti-Semitic. And, um, and often, you know, some others fall into that trap. I would say anti-Semitism is part of them, it's systemic, um, but they, it's very important for them after the Holocaust to say we're not anti-Semitic. Um, and of course, if Israel has a very right-wing government, that helps them. Um, so that's a very complicated situation today, very complicated world. I would still uh, always like to end on a more positive note. As Ken said, I mean, still, I mean, it, it is also, uh, we shouldn't forget that the majority, the great majority um, of American Jews uh, have always voted uh, um, maybe against their economic interests uh, and, and have voted more to the left then maybe their economic interests would have been the same, by the way, as was true for German Jews in the Weimar Republic. Sure. Um, I'll repeat what I said before, which is that I think, and I'll sharpen it, which is that I think that 
The current Israeli government is marching at a fairly steady pace uh, towards, I wouldn't say being fascist, but definitely towards fascist tendencies. Um, and um, again, you know, if you look at um, militarism or glorification of uh, the military, if you look at gender roles and the role of women in the public sphere, um, if you look at um, the role to uh, 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 approaches towards um, uh, LGBTQ individuals, these are all people who um, are excluded um, by you know factions in the Israeli government. And so um, I think saying that Israel is fascist is you know a, a, a kind of a crazy and, and fantastical, but I think that it is safe to say very cautiously that, uh, we're seeing um, a, a, a surge of fascist tendencies in Israel. And again, to end on a positive note, uh, which is really difficult during these days, you know, even as I sort of sit here, I'm thinking of my family, so worried for them um, in Israel. Um, but yeah, I mean, my hope is that one of the things that will come out of um, these, these tendencies is a um, perhaps a redefinition uh, of the relationship between American Jews, who, like uh, Michael said, have, have been so, um, so have such a strong tradition of fighting fascism, and um, and and the Israeli government or you know sections of the Israeli leadership who um, are unfortunately pulling in that direction. Um, so hopefully that's a that's a positive note. Um, we are just about out of time. Let me just comment on my own that, you know, I've been reading a lot of literature lately, uh, Jewish writings from 1939, uh, and it's really chilling to see the sense of foreboding, um, but yet the sense of hope that they're not going in the direction that they think they're going. Um, there was talk last week of perhaps canceling the symposium today because of the events of last week, and I think the conversations that we're having really bear testament to how important it is to talk about it and how actually necessary this event is. So we are out of time, but may there be peace speedily uh, in our time in the near future. Thank you. My name is Sebastian Fowler, and I'm the chair of the Board of Governors of the Abraham Lincoln Brigade Archives, also known as ALBA. ALBA, founded in 1979, is an educational nonprofit dedicated to social activism and the defense of human rights, inspired by the American volunteers of the Abraham Lincoln Brigade who fought fascism in the Spanish Civil War, which lasted from 1936 to 1939. Alba's first focus when it was founded was to establish an archive to record the experience of these volunteers, first at Brandeis University and for the past 23 years at New York University, where the Alba collection is housed at Tamament Library. Currently, the archive holds the papers and effects of hundreds of volunteers, including thousands of photographs, letters, pamphlets, or histories, personal objects, posters, and more. Drawing on these collections and working to expand them, ALBA is dedicated to preserving the legacy of the Abraham Lincoln Brigade as an inspiration for present and future generations. For example, we regularly offer workshops for high school teachers to help them develop lesson plans based on these primary sources from our archive. In fact, our next workshop will be offered online on election day in November. Chief among our other activities, our film screenings and roundtable discussions for teachers, students, and the general public, an annual gala, a quarterly magazine, The Volunteer, an annual essay prize for high school and college and graduate students, and an annual award for human rights activism granted in collaboration with the Puffin Foundation. Here is a brief video to give you a sense of our work.
Inspired by the anti-fascist activism of the Abraham Lincoln Brigade, the Abraham Lincoln Brigade Archives is an educational nonprofit dedicated to promoting social activism and the defense of human rights. Drawing on Alba's collections at New York University's Tamamit Library, Alba preserves the legacy of the Abraham Lincoln Brigade as an inspiration for present and future generations. For the past 10 years, Alba has been conducting professional development workshops for high school educators all over the country. To date, we have reached over 1,200 teachers in more than nine states. Many students of ALBA's Teaching Institute alumni participate in our annual essay contest honoring Lincoln veteran George Watt. Originally inaugurated in 2008 by then-Mayor Gavin Newsom and several of the surviving San Francisco Bay Area veterans, the Embarcadero is home to a national monument to the Abraham Lincoln Brigade. With a book by ALBA board member Peter Glazer and music by Eric Peltoniemi, Heart of Spain is a musical that tells the story of the diverse group of Americans who fought against fascism during the Spanish Civil War from 1936 to 1939. ALBA presents a variety of public programs, including our Sussman Lecture Series featuring leading experts in history and human rights activism and documentary film screenings. Each year in spring, ALBA gathers in New York City to honor the Abraham Lincoln Brigade and present the ALBA Puffin Award for Human Rights Activism. The annual celebration is co-sponsored by the Puffin Foundation, and past recipients include Proactiva Open Arms, the Association for the Recovery of Historical Memory, Brian Stevenson, and Judge Balthasar Garzon. Since our inception in 1978, ALBA has been working with progressive communities around the world. We strive for social and economic justice by increasing the awareness of progressive traditions among high school and college students, scholars, and the public at large. We invite you to join us as we honor the Abraham Lincoln Brigade by continuing their struggle for justice and freedom. We really appreciate the chance to participate through this video in this amazing symposium on Jewish responses to fascism from the interwar period to the present day. Many thanks to Gavril Rosenfeld and Gemma Birnbaum for allowing us to join. As you know, the Spanish Civil War broke out when Spain's progressive, democratically elected Republican government faced a military coup launched with the help of Hitler and Mussolini. While most major democratic powers opted for non-intervention, some 35,000 volunteers from around the world joined the international brigades to help defend the Spanish Republic, an effort organized by the Communist International. If the Spanish war looms large in the history of Jewish anti-fascism, it's because a large portion, at least one fifth of those international volunteers were Jewish. This proportion was even larger, close to one third, for the almost 3,000 volunteers who left Fort Spain from the United States to be soldiers, drivers, or medical personnel. As researchers like Herben Zachsma have pointed out, the Spanish chapter is often presented as the first act of Jewish resistance against fascism, fascist anti-Semitism, and ultimately against the Nazi extermination policy that culminated in the Holocaust. 
Against the background of post-Holocaust debates about wartime Jewish responses and behavior, much of the literature inscribes the participation of Jewish volunteers in the brigades in a larger resistance narrative, whose main purpose is to counter the myth of Jewish passivity in the face of the Nazi onslaught. To nuance this story, Zahsma and others point out that for many of the Jewish volunteers in Spain, their primary drive to stand up to fascism was less their ethnic identity than their ideological commitment. We cannot speak, Saxma writes, of a specific category of Jewish volunteers within the international brigades motivated by distinct Jewish concerns and animated by a clear Jewish consciousness. Still, because Spain did become a battleground to achieve inclusion and emancipation, the experiences of the Jewish volunteers make up an important chapter in the ongoing project of Jewish modernity as it unfolded from the late 18th century onwards. The Jewish memory of the Spanish Civil War still looms large around the world, including here in the US. To illustrate this, I'd like to share some segments from one of our events a couple of years ago, featuring Joseph Budwin, who in the 1990s interviewed 39 Jewish American veterans of the Lincoln Brigade. Some of their testimonies are available online at the University of Washington's Strom Center for Jewish Studies, and they were also translated and gathered in a book that was recently published in Spain. Our event two years ago was presented in collaboration with the Sousa Mendes Foundation, featuring Joe Budwin, along with ALBA board members, Nancy Wallach and Gina Herman. First person whom I spoke to, and one of the men who generated the project uh, to begin with out of ALBA was a man named George Watt who described to me an experience that he had uh, had only recently at Yad Vashem, the Holocaust Memorial in Israel, uh, where he listened to the guide, understandably uh, emphasizing Jewish resistance uh, in Vilna and in Warsaw as the primary, indeed, first Jewish resistance to fascism. And at that moment, uh, George said, in effect, where were we? Unmentioned. Uh, he, uh, uh, nowhere was it mentioned that there were also Jews, he told me, who fought Hitler long before in Spain. Now, whether we fought over uh, out of our Jewishness, that's another question. Well, it's a question that I asked person after person, uh, whether or not it could be said that, that they fought in Spain and not all of them fought. Uh, many of them went as medical workers uh, and they emphasized that when we spoke. I didn't go to fight, I went to save lives, said the nurses. Uh, so my two questions really were, how to uh, account first for the fact that fully one third of the Americans who went to Spain uh, were Jewish, uh, and across the board in the international brigades from all countries, it would be at about 20% Jewish participation. Uh, how to account for that? And also how to account for the relative silence on the subject at the time and thereafter until people like George Watt and Bill Sussman, whom you'll hear from right now, began to talk it up and look for um, explanation and understanding at um, in 1992, which remember my first uh, conversations were dated about three months after the fall of the Soviet Union. So people were in a mood to assess their lives. Uh, I right now at retirement, I'm about the age of the people whom I interviewed uh, 30 years ago. I know a little bit about uh, retrospection, and that's that's what we did. Uh, the question that I might raise with each of them was immediately dismissed. Nobody whom I spoke to said, Hitler was a complete reprobate. He hated Jews, and I went to Spain to fight for my Jewish brothers and sisters. Nobody said that. In fact, they dismissed that as a question. Uh, 
they preferred the language that they used then and maintained. I went to Spain as an anti-fascist. I went to Spain as an internationalist, not as a narrow nationalist where they might regard um, a Jew fighting for Jews as a kind of a narrow definition. They preferred the broad internationalist uh, position. And yet, when I talked to them over and over again, the stories turned back, began with childhood, with parents, with early education. And as uh, Bill Sussman said, I was born to go to Spain. So you might ask, what, what does that mean to be born to go to Spain? It doesn't mean anything genetic. I'm quite sure it doesn't. But here we see him as a child of six, seven years old uh, with his parents and brother in Bridgeport, Connecticut, sitting on the lap of Morris Vinshevsky, the famous Zayd, the grandfather of Yiddish speaking Bundist socialism in Europe, in England, and at this point in America. Now to my old friend, Nancy Wallach. Thank you. I'm glad to be able to share my own oral history about my father, Hi Wallach, who was a veteran of the Abraham Lincoln Brigade. Um, as the information recorded at the time his family immigrated to America indicates, it said, Chaim David Wallach at the age of six, whose last residence was the Polish town of Tukochin, departed from Copenhagen on the ship Helig Olav and arrived in New York on December 6, 1920. And uh, the town he arrived from was on the border between Poland and Russia, and it was overrun by troops during World War I. But fortunately, as my father remembered it, both sides liked indulging in my grandmother's latkes. My father's grandfather, Shmuel, was the grand rabbi in their shtetl, as my father was a koyan, a Cohen, a descendant of Aaron, the hereditary high priest. Our next door neighbor in Brooklyn, my father's uncle, was a cantor. So my father came from an Orthodox Jewish Yiddish-speaking family, and as Alva Bessie wrote in his first-hand account of the Lincoln's men in battle, my father was using his Yiddish to speak to the volunteers from many different nationalities whom he met up with on the train to Paris, where they would then cross the Pyrenees to Spain. And the German that he learned in high school was also easy to acquire due to his Yiddish background. And he would use that language as well to communicate with the Yiddish speaking uh, brigadistas he met in Spain, the non Yiddish speaking brigadistas he met in Spain, uh, such as the Yugoslav partisan Radovoy Nikolic. Um, you can see some of the Jewish traditions he came out of at these photos from my parents' wedding, where klezmer musicians played the music they danced the whole or two, and my parents received a blessing, the Baruch, or from the rabbi, uh, although the wedding incorporated another tradition as they had crossed canes in a military ceremony because my father had fought in Spain. And like many immigrant children whose first language was not English, my father took to spelling as a youngster with a great zeal, and then later in life to public speaking. And he was a great admirer of Hemingway's modern, terse, literary style, long before he knew of the author's sympathy for the Spanish Republic. That was it for now for me. Thank you so much for your attention. You can find the entire event featuring Joe Butwin on Abad's YouTube channel. If you'd like to know more about our organization or considering supporting ALBA's work, you can visit our website, which is alba-valb.org. And our quarterly magazine can be read in its online edition at albavolunteer.org. Good luck with the rest of the symposium. Bye.
star-spangled fascists fighting fascism in the United States. Welcome to our third panel of the day. I'm Mark Dollinger. I teach in the Department of Jewish Studies at San Francisco State University. And we are honored to welcome three of the leading scholars in the field for today's conversation. To my immediate left, Professor Jeff Garak, who holds the Libby M. Klaperman Professorship of Jewish History at Yeshiva University. He is author of 24 books, too many best book awards to enumerate here. And this is a very serious topic at a very serious week. So I want to offer um, a little bit of humanity here and uh, let you know that Prof Professor Garak has, has finished the New York City Marathon 12 times. To his left, Professor Stephen Ross holds the Dean's Professorship of History at the University of Southern California, where he directs the Kasdan Institute for the Study of the Jewish Role in American Life. He is author of four books. The one that we are most interested in today is his most recent book, Hitler in Los Angeles, How Jews Foiled Plots Against Hollywood and America. And our fun fact for you, Professor Ross, he was a commentator on the re-release of the DVD, Planet of the Apes, which I did not know. <laughs> Professor Anna Dunsing, postdoctoral fellow at the Carter G. Woodson Institute at the University of Virginia, um, who is a specialist in African-American history, black radicalism, transnational social movements, and the evolving global politics of white supremacy in 20th century United States. Her first book, um, which won Yale University's best dissertation award in, in its earlier incarnation, Fascism is Already Here, Civil Rights and the Making of a Black Anti-Fascist Tradition, follows black activists, artists, intellectuals, and their multicultural coalitions from the 1930s to the 1970s, uh, which has already won numerous awards. And our, our fun fact, uh, Professor, uh, raised in the U.S. Virgin Islands and has worked at the Guggenheim, the Met, the Henry Street Settlement, and also here at the Lower East Side Tenement Museum. It's great to have you here. Uh, Jeff, we'll start with you. To get us started, give us an overview of American Jewish responses to fascism to sort of set us up for today's conversation. Well, I'm not going to give you an overview of the entire country. I'm going to focus upon my favorite city, New York City, which I've written about most of my career. One might think that given the fact that New York City was the largest Jewish community uh, in the country, and although Washington, D.C. was a national center, uh, New York was a media center, and all the Jewish defense organizations, almost all the Jewish defense organizations uh, in this country were centered in New York, that New York Jews would have an unqualified, robust response to the problems of fascism. But as you'll see in a few moments, and I'll just offer three vignettes about the difficulties, there's a diversity of opinion from various quarters as to what to do, how to do it, and if indeed anything should be done. And the topic sentence is, it all has a lot to do with how you see yourself as a New York Jew or an American Jew in terms of what you're doing will play on what we call the American street. And there's ambivalence and there's also activism, a variety of sorts. And I'm gonna start with an unconventional group that was very active physically in response to fascism and that's some organized crime figures who are part of Mur Murder Incorporated. Bugsy Siegel. Meyer Lansky are part of a group that fought very strongly against uh, German-American Bund people in the streets of Yorkville, in the streets of Ridgewood, Queens, and elsewhere. And they, they were encouraged by a Jewish judge named Nathan Perlman who told them you can fight in the streets but don't kill anybody beat people up, but don't kill it. But the important point here is that the approbation for their activities was directed by none other than Stephen S. Wise, the head of the American Jewish Congress. So why would Stephen S. Wise get involved with these criminal elements? 
By the way, they were part of it because they were proud Jews, but also criminals. And you might know that in the 1970s, Meyer Lansky asked for citizenship in the state of Israel as a returning Jew, and Golda Meir turned him down, and he said at that point, when no one else would fight, we fought, and now I can't be a citizen of the, the state of Israel. Why would Stephen S. Wise support this type of violent activism? So I want to contextualize this in a variety of ways. Um, for Stephen Wise, the German-American Bund, they were loud, they were obnoxious, and they were un-American. You may know that World War, after World War I, German-Americans were in poor favor within America. So to fight against them is not a problem in terms of how the American street would visualize what these Jews uh, are doing. I, I should note here that in fighting against the Bund, I want to mention the name of a plumber named Isidore Goodman from Williamsburg, who jumped on the stage in 1939 and, and pulled off Fritz Kuhn's mic as part of his attack against the Bund in the Great Madison Square Garden, and then he was beaten up by, by uh, Bund activities. My point here is that if you feel that what you're doing has the approbation of Americans, then you're willing to be vital in terms of response, even, even go so far as have an alliance with, with a criminal uh, element. By the way, um, the Bund was a problem for I'll call good German Americans in the 1930s. You probably know that the senior senator from the state of New York was Robert F. Wagner Sr. He was of German heritage and a great supporter of Jewish causes. In fact, he was the architect of a bill that was never passed by the United States Congress called the Wagner Rogers Act to bring in 10,000 refugee children. Now you want to be cynical and say, okay, it, for a senator from the state of New York to support Jews is no big deal. But it is a big deal, and he was very troubled by these German Americans, who, by the way, were refugees who didn't want to live under Weimar, who came here in the 1920s. That's vignette number one of strong activism. Vignette number two, we go to a different place in Manhattan, to 138th Street and Amsterdam Avenue, City College of New York, a hotbed of radical activity. Uh, it was called the Hater on the Hill, very socialist. Many of the students were socialists, although they also had a very robust ROTC cadre, to say the least. Many of these students on the left opposed what they called war and fascism. And they didn't want to get involved in an upcoming war, a capitalist war, and yet when Kristallnacht takes place in 1938, there's a turn, there's an important moment in time where they have to decide whether they are total universalists or whether they have Jewish content in their lives. And if you look at the records of City College, you start to, to see some of these people getting involved in Jewish causes because they realize their own ethnicity as opposed to being universalists. And my third vignette, I don't want to dominate this discussion, the third vignette is a remarkable story of the reaction of the Jewish community to Robert Edward Edmondson. Robert Edward Edmondson was a, a pamphleteer, a writer who was a virulent anti-Semite. He's not a refugee, he's not obnoxious, but he's very powerful. He does pamphlets talk based upon the protocols of the elders of Zion. What's the reaction of the Jewish community of New York to Edmondson? To begin with, the mayor of the city of New York, Biro LaGuardia, who has strong Jewish roots in many respects, sues him as a libelous because he referred to uh, LaGuardia as also being a Jew. When, when Edmondson is uh, brought to trial initially, the Jewish organizations support LaGuardia in going after Edmondson. However, as the trial proceeds, and I want to get these organizations right, five organizations, the American Civil Liberties Union, the American Committee on Religious Rights and Minorities, the Human Rights Committee of the National Council of Jewish Women, 
the American Jewish Congress, and the American Jewish Community Committee. And Wise was a member of several of these organizations. Four of these five organizations are Jewish, perhaps also ACLU in terms of its constituency. All of them send amicus curiae briefs to the court supporting Edmondson's defense because they fear, and I'll quote from one of the articles about it, it is doubtful if a conviction will be in the public interest. Efforts would be made to have it appear the defendant was a, defendant was a martyr to the cause of civil rights. The case ended up being dismissed. For them, the issue of civil rights was so important, and they worried about the status of Jews in America, they let Robert Edmondson off, and again, the case was dismissed. Three different visions of what should be done, and there are many more, but I'll leave it at that. Thank you so much. Um, Steve, we're going to get to espionage now. Uh, your work has focused on espionage, which gets really fascinating really quickly. Um, how has espionage developed, and how did it play out in the fight against fascism? So let me start with a larger context for resistance, and that is <clears throat> I grew up 12 miles from here in Queens, near Bayside. My uh, father was a survivor of Dachau, my mother a survivor of Auschwitz. And I grew up with the question of why didn't Jews do more to stop this, both in America and in Europe. And it was only when I began researching this book that I realized, my God, Jews in fact were doing a lot. We just don't know it because they were running spy operations that they didn't want the goyim to know about. And Hitler comes to power, so why does that start? Hitler comes to power in January 1933, and immediately Jewish groups respond to it. Jews did respond, they just had a deeply divided strategy, but a deeply divided strategy is not the same as no strategy. You had basically Stephen Wise and the American Jewish Congress that wanted to get in Hitler's face, pressure him, have an international boycott, uh, and get him to back down. The American Jewish Committee, run by Judge Proskauer then, said no, if you get in his face, he's gonna double down and make it worse for the Jews. We need to work with uh, religious leaders in Germany behind the scenes. So this debate goes on from January through the summer. There is no unity on how we respond. And finally, in Los Angeles, in late July 1933, the Friends of New Germany, who would later become the German-American Bund, hold their first open meeting in the city. And at the end of the meeting, they declare that they are going to save America from its two greatest threats, communists and Jews. And at the end of that meeting, they sign up several hundred people. Well, the next day on the front page of the LA newspapers are a shot of five stormtroopers with giving the Hitler salute and a big story about what was going on. Well, it was read by a man named Leon Lewis, who had been the founding executive secretary of the Anti-Defamation League in 1913. And Lewis had to move to LA around 1930 for health reasons, but remained the ADL's representative to Southern California, and he also was the ADL's representative to the motion picture industry, a job he had had since 1915. And he is so upset that no one is doing anything that he marches from his downtown office one mile south to uh, Patriotic Hall, which had been built in 1926 by the LA Board of Supervisors for all patriotic groups. And amongst the groups there were the um, uh, uh, there were Jewish war, disabled American veterans were there. And he goes and he recruits three men and two of their wives who agree to go undercover and spy on every Nazi and fascist group in the city and send him regular reports. And Lewis starts a one-man spy operation that runs from August 1st, 1933 to the end of World War II. And Lewis was, of course, at times troubled by what the lovely Marjorie Taylor Greene in her ignorance referred to as the Jewish gazpacho, <laughs> which was in fact a term coined in the 1950s by the uh, Sean Hannity of their day, Westbrook Pegler, who talked about the Jewish gestapo. 
and about Jews spying on Christians. Well, in Hitler in LA, I tell the story of how they run this spy operation. And by the way, all the spies, other than his initial, some of the initial, no, all the spies except for one are Christian. And what I find interesting about this story is they are work, they are not working for the Jews. They know Leon Lewis is Jewish. They know he is part of the Anti-Defamation League, but they feel he's working for America. Because what they argue is in America, when one native group starts talking hate and calling for death and violence against another American group, simply because their race, their religion, their ethnicity, it is the obligation of every citizen in this country to stand up and stop it. And the other thing which I have, there is, there are books here to be written on this. Lewis starts meeting with people with ADL chapters in the Midwest. And there are all these spy operations that are going on in the Midwest. And here in New York, by 1940, the ADL begins running a spy operation here. The American Jewish Committee are running a spy operation. And the most radical of all is a group called the Non-Sectarian Anti-Nazi League, who are sending in agent provocateurs. Not just as Leon Lewis did. Most, many of his men rose to uh, head up some of these Nazi groups and fascist groups, or not head, but in positions of leadership. Uh, one of his chief spies, uh, Hans Schmidt, um, uh, John Schmidt, rather, his wife becomes the head of the German American Bund's Women's Committee. And because she is fluent in German and English, they ask her to go up to their secret room and translate all the documents going from Germany and going to Germany. And of course, every translation is then sent to Leon Lewis. And what I would say is Jews were never protected by civil authorities, the police, the sheriff. Leon Lewis went to the police chief, went to the sheriff with admissible, he's a lawyer, he went with admissible evidence. And when he went to see the police chief, he threw him out saying, you don't get it. The real problem in LA and the real danger are all those Jews in Boyle Heights who are commies. They're the ones we're worried about, not the Nazis. And when I get asked at various talks, how do you justify, how do you justify this spying by one small group? Isn't this vigilantism? And my response, including the head of my temple in LA, isn't it vigilantism? My response is, if you look at uh, social contract theory, why do states get formed? Whether you're Locke, Hobbes, Rousseau, the fundamental obligation of a state to be a legitimate state is to protect the lives of its citizens. When a state no longer protects the lives of its citizen, it is up to the citizens to protect their own lives. And this is what Jewish resistance was based on. No one wanted to go out with a vigilante kind of operation. No one wanted to do these spy things. But if no authority, including the man I hate the most, and I can't believe Beverly Gage wrote such a nice book about him, J, uh, J. Edgar Hoover, major anti-Semite. He would not protect any Jew in America until he absolutely had to, not until there were explosions in uh, 1941 in New Jersey and Pennsylvania when uh, Nazis blew up munitions factories. So that, that is a kind of big picture of spying in America. Thank you. And I know as all of your questions are percolating in your brains, now would be a good time if you haven't already to start writing them down because we'll be picking them up in a few minutes. If you're watching from home, please put your questions in the chat. Uh, we have folks here who will be writing them down so we'll be able to address them as well. Um, Anna, it seems as if uh, our conversation has really been leading right to uh, your particular uh, field of research, um, and that is that the fight against fascism demands alliances and allyship between and among different groups. Your work tells us about these efforts, especially in the African-American community. How do you understand the role and import of these sorts of joint efforts? So um, I'm gonna pull us back to the East Coast, um, and I really think it is worth, um, you know, in the spirit of pulling up these histories, recovering these histories, um, the extent to which we can celebrate New York as an anti-fascist city um, I mean, I think it's important to name how close we are to it, how much of um, these rallies, these demonstrations happened at Union Square, um, just two blocks away in 1923. 
on 14th Street uh, opened both the headquarters of the Italian fascist and anti-fascist groups um, right across the street from each other, right? So that when we're reaching for these histories, I think we can take comfort in knowing how close um, it all is and how the legacies we can build on are, are in our own backyards. So I think um, looking at sort of grassroots anti-fascist efforts in the United States um, and in New York and looking at how everyday people sort of found a place for themselves in anti-fascist struggle, I think that you really see three things really quickly. One, um, what people talked about when they talked about fascism and anti-fascism was capacious and flexible. Um, I think there's an, an importance to pursuing um, helpful working terminology, but I also think at a certain point that needs to fall away because it's sort of always been these um, these evolving um, entities, right, in the same way that political language is ungovernable in, in, the, in the minds of everyday people. Um, the second conclusion you can see is that um, the toggling between local and, and global was constant, um, and it was really important for people to understand the struggles in their cities, uh, and <clears throat> excuse me, in their communities to be bound up with global struggles and a global struggle against fascism. And then I think the third thing is that anti-fascism is fundamentally a politics of solidarity, right? That's, that's, that's it. Um, and the idea is that anti-fascism allows people to, to yoke their own, um, their struggles to, to, to other ones. So I think by way of an anecdote to tie all this together, um, in 1934, up at City College, uh, there was a large anti-fascist demonstration. Um, it was led by a young Jewish radical from the Bronx named Wilfred Mendelssohn. He was the son of two Eastern European Jewish immigrants who met in night school. Um, and Mendelssohn organized this rally with a few other students because the uh, president of City College had recently invited and hosted a delegation of Italian students sent by Mussolini to sort of represent um, young Italian fascist um, minds. And so, at this rally at City College, they burned an effigy to Mussolini and to the president of City College, actually. Um, so then what does Mendelssohn do next? So in 1935 then, there he is again at a mass rally at City College um, of students organizing on the day that Italy invaded Ethiopia. And a really important part of this 1930s moment is the extent to which the, the fascist in invasion of Ethiopia um, was, was, a, was a significant turning point and, and rallying point moment um, for, for, for black Americans in particular because it symbolized, right, um, the racial and imperial um, engines of fascism, right, that at that point, e Ethiopia and Haiti were the two, uh, only two free black nations on earth, right? And, and, and mind you, they're also then thinking that the United States has just wrapped at that point at what, 15 years long occupation of Haiti, right? So these connections are sort of starting to, to flow pretty readily. Um, so then Mendelssohn, right, that's a rallying point for him as well. Then the next year, there's another even larger anti-fascist demonstration at City College. Um, it's unclear whether or not Mendelssohn was there. Um, historians speculate he was, but at this point he has dropped out of City College and he's organizing full time for the Young Communist League. But in 1936, they burn an even bigger set of effigies, and this time it's Mussolini, Hitler, and Franco, right? So you're seeing right, sort of even how they're symbolizing what is fascist has sort of grown. Um, and, and then, right, where, where do we find Mendelssohn next? In 1938, he's in one of the last waves of young people um, who go to Spain, and he volunteers with the Abraham Lincoln Brigade, and, um, and he dies there. And so, right, you can see just in one individual's life, the way all these struggles are yoked together, I think really similarly, um, another Abraham Lincoln Brigade veteran, James Yates, um, he called his memoir from Mississippi to Madrid. And he understood that, you know, growing up um, very poor and black in Mississippi was was what imbued him with his initial anti-fascist politics, um, and that he could, and he came back to the United States, um, was blacklisted for having fought, um, 
and then was the longtime head of the Greenwich Village chapter of the NAACP. Right, again, so I, I, I'll stop there for now, but I think you can just sort of start to see all these seamless connections and the way everyday people um, pouring into the streets at these rallies had ample grounds to sort of just see it all happening in real time. Thank you, what a great book title. Wow, uh, Mississippi to Madrid. Uh, I, I wanna um, push a point here with all three of you, the years of scholarship and expertise that you've each done in your respective fields of anti-fascism. Uh, what's your estimation of how successful they were? and they being whomever it was uh, that you studied. Well, <clears throat> I'd like to comment on your fine presentation about what's going on at City College. To be sure, you have a strong coterie of people who, in fact, in some cases, drop out of City College to go out and fight the good fight, whether it's down south with the Scottsboro Boys or going to Spain, et cetera. My take on City College is twofold. You have that core group of people. I said to some people at lunch, if I asked you, which college in America had the largest ROTC cadre prior to World War II. Believe it or not, it's a school that's 80% Jewish. It's called City College of New York. So you have those who are deeply committed to the cause, and my presentation said that they begin to turn a little bit in terms of their Jewishness as we approach 1939. But I'm also interested in the rank and file of Jews who go to City College who sadly are apathetic, and if you think that resonates with contemporary times today, I, I would agree with you. That's very much part of our story. Apathetic Jews who are uh, pursuing their lives and not getting involved in the causes of the time. Um, uh, mention was made of the non-sectarian league, very important league in terms of the boycott of German goods. Well, I want to read to you a statement made in the Menorah Journal, an intellectual journal, by a writer named Louis Minsky, commenting on the fact that the World, the World Telegram newspaper in New York is complaining that there are too many Jewish activities in our city, this great city, Jewish city of New York. Uh, and he, this Louis Minsky writes, the policy of fighting anti-Semitism by public agitation, parades, mass meetings, oratorical inventive, persistent mobilizing boycotts without regard to the consequences serve no real purpose. What was ultimately needed is the help of sincere Christians and there are not enough of them around in New York City. So uh, when we talk about this boycott, yes, there's a the boycott of German goods, the strong commitment on the part of some people, but also fear that being too overt in their activities might rebound against us as Jews. That's the mindset, I believe, of 1930 Jews in, uh, in New York and elsewhere. And as far as spying is concerned, thank God for these spies and that the American Jewish Committee, the American Jewish Congress, the Non-Sectarian League supported that, but it's surreptitious. It's not open, it's not in the streets. That dynamic didn't really obtain that strongly among Jews in the largest Jewish city in America also known as New York. Thank you. So Steve, so you took some heat from your synagogue leadership over this espionage campaign in LA. Were they at least successful in your mind? Oh, uh, they were incredibly successful because for Hitler, uh, Los Angeles, not New York, was the most important city in America. And it was the most important city in America for two reasons. It had the world's leading propaganda machine called Hollywood and they were determined to make sure that there would be no anti-Nazi, anti-Hitler movies. But more importantly, and there's where the spies come in, New York City uh, was, the port of New York City was very closely guarded because Pierre LaGuardia, if I'm not mistaken, his mother is Jewish and his father's Protestant. He was a rabid anti-Nazi, and I believe he made a deal with the, uh, basically the mob, with the longshoremen, the teamsters, do whatever you want on the docks, we'll turn a blind eye, but make sure no Nazi propaganda troops, anything comes through. LA was an open port. And my spies, I have all these records of the head of the Bund there going down, getting money, getting secret orders, and spies. Nazi spies were being sent in through LA. They were going to the Midwest, they were going down to Mexico City. And Leon Lewis's spies were tracking all of this. The only government official to listen to him was the head of Navy espionage on the uh, West Coast, uh, Zach, uh, 
Zacharias, Colonel Zacharias, who was a Jew, Elias Zacharias, one of the few Jewish graduates of the Naval Academy. He listened to him. He, in fact, shut down a uh, silver shirt Nazi operation in the military base in San Diego. And the real truth is LA was the largest producer of aircraft in America. And his spies uncovered numerous plots to blow up, well, not to blow up, to uh, make sure that those airplanes did not fly. He had spies in the German restaurant that was near Lockheed. And one of the waitresses there overheard the men speaking in German, talking about we're going to make sure the ball bearings are not in there. We're going to make sure that these plans will never get off the ground. Leon Lewis would then contact every one of the airports, uh, aircraft manufacturer security division, and they managed to capture those people. And there was not a single, not one episode of sabotage on the entire West Coast while Leon Lewis was running his operation. More to the point, come uh, Pearl Harbor. The day after Pearl Harbor on December 8th, there's a memo sent by the Justice Department to LA with the names of something like 90 of the most dangerous Nazis and fascists in the city. And it's amazing, if you go on the FBI website, they look, um, they look incredible because within 24 hours they round up most of the Nazis and fascists. And I said to myself, given what I know, how did they know who these people were? Because when I asked the head of the Bund and the number two Nazi in America is a man named Hermann Schwinn in LA, I got the, his Freedom of Information Act FBI file. The file starts in January 1942. So wait a minute. If it starts in 42, and the FBI are rounding up all these guys in December 41, how did they know? And the answer is starting in September 1st, 1939, and until the war, Leon Lewis and his associate spymaster Joe Roos put together a several hundred page volume listing every Nazi and fascist in LA and then compiling a list of three categories, highly dangerous, dangerous, keep under surveillance. Well, when I looked at the FBI report, they talked about categories A, B, and C. And, that, and what did I see? I went back to the National Archives because my gut told me this is like plagiarism. And sure enough, I found the memo Leon Lewis sent them. They copied Leon Lewis's memo Every name there was a name he sent them in the same categories of highly dangerous, dangerous under surveillance, and that's how they wound up knowing who was dangerous in the city because they had no information other than what the Jews supplied them with. Thank you. Uh, Anna, as challenging as it is to organize even within the Jewish community, you can imagine what it is to create allyships across uh, different lines. How successful do you think um, those efforts were? So, I mean, I'm sure I share with um, my fellow panelists and, and everyone here today that it can be pretty easy to feel bleak about a lot of this stuff, right? And to say, right, so what, who, you know, the, the right, you know, just do, does keep winning and winning um, at so many levels. And, you know, the, my research, you know, you, like steeped in, in the 1930s, you can see, right, oh, this, this didn't start, this wasn't, this didn't start with the Tea Party, this didn't start with Rush Limbaugh, right? The, these are, patterns and traditions that you, you see in the 30s in the shifting political scene in the United States. That said, I, I think there are ample success stories. So I think we're, at, we're and ag again, I've, a lot of it is looking local, um, looking to your own communities, but I think where are their successes? Um, you know, if, if I, I'm pro-spying in this, in this way, right, that the, the, the investigative prowess of these volunteers often, right, is, is unmatched. And I think I would put that in a larger pattern of, of campaigns about um, what I think today is often referred to as deplatforming um, and denying fascists and far right organizers um, that um, flame of, of attention, right? That spark. Um, and there's so many examples of that. Again, um, very local. You know, in 1960, there was a broad coalition of. Um, civil rights and labor organizers who successfully kept George Lincoln Rockwell, the American Nazi party head, from rallying on the 4th of July at Union Square, right? So deep, the, this deep tradition of deplatforming. And I think the investigation work is, is, is crucial. And again, you always see you know, a great example. So I write about the Anti-Nazi League a bit as well. Um, 
and I, I write about one campaign they did actually in 1946-47 to infiltrate a, um, it's weird to call them a neo-Nazi movement, but a, a fascist formation in Atlanta, Georgia. And um, successfully, they got you know their leaders put on trial eventually with the evidence they gained, but I read the head of the anti-Nazi league's FBI file and who is who is Hoover mad at? Him, right? Who's who does he he see as the threat? Him, not the not the Colombians, which was the name of the the fascist group in in Atlanta. Um, so I think sort of militant deplatforming in the streets, as well as the research and the investigative work, countless successes. And I think also I was sort of reflecting, knowing Steve and I have worked in in similar archives. These archives were also built up by anti-fascist activists, right? So the very fact that we can we can recover and share these stories is on the basis of, you know, both at Columbia University and Brown, there are these massive collections of right-wing material, and those were collected by activists who said we need to record this hateful literature. We need to send for these pamphlets, like hundreds of boxes of material, right? So I think again the investigative work, it, it happens on multiple fronts, but one of them is in, even in creating the very archives that, that allow us to be here. Um, and then I think there's a more ineffable kind of success, um, which is how the you know, anti-fascism in the 30s, I especially think for black Americans, was a kind of popular vernacular. You read black newspapers in the 30s and it sort of suffused into everything. Um, and I think the most famous, the culmination of all of this is the Double V campaign, which was a campaign started by the Pittsburgh Courier, which was one of the larger black newspapers, thinking about um, framing World War II, framing black military service in particular as a, a fight for democracy, both abroad and at home, and, and a lot of people pushed it further and said, no, I'm, I'm fighting fascism, both abroad and at home. Um, but, but one of the sort of initial questions that sparked my whole project was, you know, reading any black newspaper in the 30s and 40s and the accessibility um, and richness of this sort of everyday anti-fascist politics was just so saturated that I thought, like, what, where does this go after 1945? And the answer is it's, it's, it's one of the um, forces that leads to the civil rights movement, right? Which we should push past thinking, sort of begins tidily in 1954 and ends in 1965. Which, right, who's marching in those streets? Black World War II veterans, right? Who were electrified by an anti-fascist politics. Um, and I think, right, the, the incredibly famous, you know, um, alliance between black and Jewish activists in the 50s and 60s, I mean, I'm, the very basis of my work is to follow them backward. And what were they doing in the 30s? They were at anti-fascist demonstrations. Yeah, so let me, let me if, I, if I can real quick, I wanna to jump to the last question that we'll get to you if we have a moment. Um, since we're at Public Symposium here at the Center for Jewish History, uh, as historians, it's our job to recover the past for its own sake. And now I'm gonna say, since we've been talking about Marjor Marjorie Taylor Greene and the Tea Party movement, uh, applicability for each of your historical research in the contemporary moment. And, Jeff, I'll give you a first shot here. Well, first I want to comment about the African-American community. Within the Harlem community in the 1930s, there was Sufi Abdul Hamid, who was a black nationalist. You could say he's a forerunner of Louis Farrakhan, who was very pro-Hitler in his rhetoric. And he's pilloried by the Amsterdam News and the New York Age, two very important black newspapers, who say he doesn't re represent us. And the New York Age went further and said, are you aware of the fact that leftist students from City College, that university on the hill, are coming down to Harlem on an ongoing basis and they're helping in the, in the free lunch program for African American predominant students um, at, at that time period. So you have that mixture of activities. I, I think what I'm trying to say about contemporary times based upon the 1930s is the question of people, activists, who want to go out of their way to push an agenda the, the appropriate way, and people who are living prosaic lives and don't do anything, let the world pass them so long as they are living their own partic particular lives. So that, that's one of the things, that's one of the takeaways I get from my research from, from that, uh, that time period. 
Thank you. And just note, we are now collecting your questions. So if you have those questions, just look and folks will pick it up and bring it, bring it to here. Uh, Steve, uh, any applicability? Yeah, I, I believe it was in the 1930s, and maybe my friend Tom Dougherty here can tell me who it was that said it, that when fascism comes to America, it's going to be star-spangled fascism. Do you remember who said it, Tom? Anyway, it's what we have today. Star-spangled fascism. These are people, this is sort of what my follow-up book I'm doing now to Hitler in L.A. that I'm almost done with is called The Secret War Against Hate. American resistance to white supremacy up to 1945. And it's a story the spy operations never stop. In fact, the records, the spy records of the American Jewish Committee are here in the archives. The ADL is spying, and the Anti-Nazi League are spying. And those spy operations, for some of them, go to 1980. And some of that spying is still going on to this very day. And I would say, you know, this, the spying is important to find out what's going on, and I still believe it is. I still believe when the state does not protect you, it is your right to protect yourself. Now, I'm not saying go out and kill anyone, harm anyone, but if you're gonna spy, you're gonna spy. But the more important thing is what Anne is talking about, that the applicability for today is coalitions, that you have to get as many coalitions, multi-racial, multi-ethnic, multi-religious, who agree on one thing, in America, it is not American to hate another American. You simply can't do that. And when my students ask me, we were talking about this at lunch, when my students ask me, what can we do? What can we do now? I tell them, well, two things. One, the easiest is take one friend at election who wasn't planning to vote and insist they drag him to the polls. And the second thing I said, which is putting yourself in a little more danger. And you have to decide if you want to do it. But if you hear somebody talking hate speech near you, simply turn to them calmly and say, in America, we don't talk like that. Americans don't talk hate against other Americans. You are an un-American if you are doing this. Anna. So I think, I think coalitions is, is key. That's the real. Um, yeah, if you leave with anything today, that, that would be it. But I do think in particular um, a sense of how in, you know, this, this is a country of profound contradictions. And I think to, to understand um, that, that there is a version of democracy that has an anti-fascist politics within it. Um, I think, you know, looking at black Jewish coalitions and organizing in the 1930s, their anti-fascism was about expanding, um, you know, what, what one journalist called real and living democracy in the United States, right? So that the, the struggle um, should necessarily be about expanding who um, can live a good life in this country. Um, but I think interrogating some sort of, you know, darker, bloodier foundations of the United States is to really understand um, a sort of deep tradition of, of, of reaction um, and white supremacy and to understand the extent to which there are um, deep cultures of anti-black racism, anti-Semitism, and I think also especially after 1945, anti-communism all bound up together and all informing and, and fueling one another. Um, especially, a lot of my research, obviously, I am looking at just the ways that, that anti-Semitism and anti-blackness um, are just so tangled up. Um, but I think, um, you know, something I reflect on a lot, I live in Charlottesville, Virginia, and a lot of the traditions, you know, Steve researches were evident on the ground in terms of the act activist responses to the Unite the Right rally, right, the extent to which institutions um, whether it was the university, whether it was the um, elected officials, whether it was the police, all of them failed to act, but the activists did. And the extent to which they were, um, you know, on the, the insidious blogs gathering information about the groups who would be there, the extent to which they were um, informed in ways that just um, just astounding to me, remarkable, right? That's an, I think that's a, a great example of where you can see these traditions alive today. And, and something I, I sort of, took, I guess, to, to wrap this up on a, on a positive note, you know, um, 
so, I, so in addition to, to just seeing the extent to which activists were prepared in many respects on the ground in, in Charlottesville, what was also something I was struck by as, as in bearing witness to what happened there was just how there was a politics of care. Um, it wasn't just a sort of militant, let's deplatform this fascist coalition, but there was so much free food and volunteer medics and I got handed so many bottles of water, right? So I think another tradition is not just sort of anti-fascism is a productive politics. It's not just reacting to fascism, it's also building a, a better world, right? Um, and so I think that's, that's a legacy to hold on to too, that it's not just, it is intention with fascism, but it also is about um, caring for one another in, in, in a myriad of ways. I just want to say one last thing before you take the sure. questions. I may have come across as being very negative about the experience of American Jews to the 1930s, which was my intention. I also want to say that in 1930s, in many instances, Jews stood alone in their concerns. Uh, things are difficult today in the 21st century, but as my colleagues have indicated, Jews are not standing alone, and the need for coalitions has always existed but the coalitions did not exist as strongly back then as they do now. Uh, I just finished a book about uh, a Jewish sports figure and the 1936 boycott movement uh, where Jews stood alone with the exception of one person, Jeremiah T. Mahoney, after whom the gymnasium at City College is named today. The officials who wanted the games to go forward in America they were Nazis in many instances, and very few people supported the Jewish cause. So the optimistic side of me is this, the 21st century is not 1930s America, and I think we should take cognizance of that as well. Thank you. Right. Thank you. We have um, so many excellent questions. Um, rather than group them into a common theme, I'm actually going to throw three or four at you um, from the same historical period. Feel free to answer whichever one uh, you'd like to answer. Um, one is a, a, a question framed in the negative, which is, why haven't we spoken about Henry Ford and Dorothy Thompson, um, if you'd like to take that up? Uh, another one um, is framed as a court case, but I think we'll understand it says Stephen Wise apologist versus Peter Bergson. Uh, I think that's probably getting at the two different uh, strategies. And in the 1940s, did blacks understand um, how Germans' genocidal policies would affect them and understand that that brought them to common cause with Jews? And Anna, we can start with you if you have any, any of those you want to jump in. Yeah, so I mean, I think, uh, I mean, maybe Henry Ford hasn't come up because it's sort of like, Apparently, what the only American that Adolf Hitler personally admired. Um, one so of, one of two. One of two was Charles Lindbergh. Oh yes, yeah, bread and butter. Um, so, but I guess to the last question, I'll address that um, and then cede to my colleagues. Um, yeah, and I would say not not by the 1940s, by uh, 1922, right? To watch even how the black press covers Mussolini's rise, um, it's. It's, it's remarkable how prescient they are, um, and, are and are already talking about um, the way this fascist movement um, is akin to the Klan, right? Or similarly, right, in 1932, I was so struck when I saw this in the, in the newspaper, um, re reporting on the recent election in Germany, right, where the Nazis are coming closer and closer to, to, to power, um, the black press described Hitler as the Vardaman of Europe in reference to James K. Vardaman, the virulent anti-Semitic white supremacist governor and senator of Mississippi, um, right? So again, I think it's also important to say this sort of, this, these, these politics of analogy in particular and comparison, they flowed in both directions, right? That, that Vardaman was, um, could evoke Right, whatever Hitler signified, um, and then you know I think similarly uh, the other kind of direct example would be um, uh, the black radical at, at the time communist organizer George Padmore. He's working for um, the Communist International in Hamburg in early 1933, and he's writing in radical literature, but also this then gets into the black press. He's he's talking about. Um, how completely 
um, the, the black world writ large should be should have their eye on on Germany um, and writing again I think well before you see it elsewhere the um, the centering racial anti-semitism in Nazi ideology and, and naming it and talking about how racial anti-semitism is then bound up with an anti-black politics right and so he's he's writing that in early 1933 he's deported by the new Nazi government um, soon after. Um, and then the last example, you know, um, the great American intellectual W.E.B. Du Bois, he, he spent six months in Nazi Germany in 1936. Um, and when he comes home again, what he's, what he's writing, he, he, he says, something is happening here and something is happening to German Jews and we need to be vigilant. We need to have our eye on this because it, it, it it means something for them and it'll mean something for us. So I'd say from the very beginning, um, the answer is yes. And the 1940s is a kind of crescendo rather than the, the beginning of it. Thank, thank you, Jeff, and then we'll go to Steve. Uh, a few words about Henry Ford. His, his moment of anti-Semitism is really the 1920s where he publishes the Protocols of the Elders of Zion with a commentary applying the quote, teachings of the protocols of the American experience in the 1920s. By the end of the 20s, he's pretty much silenced for a variety of reasons, and his anti-Semitism goes underground, except for that precious moment where he's honored by the Nazis as a leading Aryan in the United States. In the 21st century, I think the CEO of Ford Motor Company is a Jew. So a, a, a bit of a moment of satisfaction on that, on that score. As far as Weisenbergson is concerned, oh my goodness, so much can be said and so much is written about that relationship. Uh, but that's from the 1940s, where the issue is not refugees, it's the question of rescue. But if I can connect that to my basic theme about how it plays on the American street, Stephen Wise was very concerned with how it played in Washington, on the American street, and Peter Bergson, Hillel Cook, who's a Palestinian, in other words, Palestine before 1948, who comes to America, he is not nearly as concerned about the situation for American Jews. He's devoted to activism, stemming from the fact that in some respects, he's not an American. So I think in looking at what American Jews do, how does it play with their fellow neighbors? Thank you, Steve. Yeah, by the, I think Jeff should write, by the 1930s, it isn't Henry Ford we need to worry about. The person we need to worry about then and now is Charles Lindbergh and someone like him, because Lindbergh was um, in the tradition of the British polite anti-Semites, uh, where he was an anti-Semite, and if you read his speeches, particularly his famous Iowa speech, he says, you know, basically, I'm nothing against the Jews, but Americans should not follow the policies dictated by one small minority group in our country. There's a biography of him written by A. Scott Berg. And I met Scott after his, he wrote that. And I said to him, uh, your biography says Lindbergh wasn't an anti-Semite. But I read his speeches, and they're anti-Semitic. And he said, well, he can't be an anti-Semite because he had Jewish friends. I looked at him, I said, you didn't just say that to me, did you? And he turned around and walked away. Screw him. Uh, and the other, as for Dorothy Thompson, Dorothy, for those of you who don't know, Dorothy Thompson was one of the most courageous journalists of the 30s, going to Nazi Germany, going into the belly of the beast, writing about it, getting arrested, and being fearless. Going into the Madison Square Garden rally, fearless. And you know, if we had more journalists like that, you know, the right has a better, Fox has had a better group of journalists in a way that raised the cry of their ideology. We on the liberal and left side have not done as well in terms of our public facing with journalists, whether it's print journalism or media journalism. And it would be nice to see that increasing in the next uh, few years. Thank you. Um, in the very few minutes we have left, I've grouped some questions that relate to the contemporary period um, and the work you're doing. How would you categorize what's happening with patriots, and that's in quotes, such as former General Michael Flynn's Awaken America movement? 
How should we talk to individuals who are on the fence? People not crazy about Trump, but also disenchanted with the political social status quo. How do you pers persuade them towards light? And then um, how do Jews work against the denial of fascism and Trumpism by government officials and uh, the current political environment? And I'm gonna have to cut you all off in about four minutes, so. Uh, uh, the first question is about patriots such as former General Michael Flynn's Awaken America movement. All right, this is, um, I'll just be very brief. This is the theme of the, the book I'm working on now. Uh, if you see these right-wing movements, whether it's the general, Trump, or anything, as, you know, crazies, you're going to miss it. Because starting in 1945, we have the Tom Brokaw Greatest Generation story. And, you know, those who come back. What he doesn't tell us is there were equal number, well, not equal number, but a very large number of Americans who went to war, not because they uh, opposed Hitler, Mussolini, not because they opposed Nazism and fascism, but they were old boys from the old Confederacy stretching across the Southwest, and they went because Japan bombed us. And when someone bombs you, you punch them back in the face. And when they came back from war, they felt that they had been betrayed by their country. Their country had sold them out. Why? Because Congress had passed all these bills like the FEPC, Federal Employment Protection Act, and suddenly Jews, before we left, we had no trouble in the South because Jews and blacks knew their place. We've come back from war, and our country has betrayed us. We are the true patriots. And I will argue from 1945 until now, these people genuinely believe that they are the patriots, and that I'm going to guess the people in this room are the anti-Americans. Thanks, Anna. I think I just want to close um, with reference to a concept um, that I got from one of our co-panelists who'll be hearing about from later today, Chris Biles. Um, it was called the politics of amnesia. Sort of like what happens, you know, at the, with the onset of the Cold War, where all of this history was buried, and where I think today people might say, "Ooh, like, I don't know, anti Antifa, right?" Um, or the idea that that there's something, there's a kind of both sides-ism, right? Um, but I think the lesson for the 30s and how to convince, bring people and, and shake an ambivalence is that there is there's something for everyone in this struggle. It doesn't have to be just street fighting. It can be um, calling your, your elected officials. It can be being an educator. It can be talking to your parents at Thanksgiving, right? That, that there is something for everyone and we should think about why these histories were buried, why we don't have them today, why people might have a wariness of, or sort of think, oh, it was all communist front stuff, and that's it. It's so much bigger than that. Um, so to sort of bring people back into that big tent fold. Thank you, Jeff. Last, at, last word. At the end of the day, do not be fearful, because ultimately, unlike the 1930s, most Americans still believe in democracy and still believe in uh, the contributions Jews can make to this country and fight for what is right, but don't be afraid to speak out. I don't know if most Americans believe in democracy. How do you support Donald Trump when you believe in democracy? I am sorry, there is no two sides here. I'm not suggesting there are two sides. I'm suggesting that at the end of the day, most Americans are not anti-Semitic. Um. I was advised at, at the beginning, uh, before we were organizing this, that we should encourage a cross dialogue between our participants, so it's not just, <laughs> and it looks like uh, with exactly one minute to go, uh, we, we began the conversation, which I know is going gonna, is gonna to continue for all of us. So I'd like to first thank our three panelists for your time and expertise. And thank the Center for Jewish History for hosting us, and also uh, to let folks who are here now that we have a 15-minute break until our next panel. Thanks so much.
Hello. Sorry, sorry about that. Already messed that up. Um, my name is Chris Viles, and um, I'm going to be moderating this panel. And uh, the panel is entitled The Language of the Good, Fighting Fascism and Culture. And we have three distinguished panelists here, and I'm going to just be very brief um, in introducing all of us. So my name is Chris Viles. I am a professor of history, sorry, professor of English and American Studies at um, the University of Connecticut. Um, also, to my um, uh, you know immediate uh, left, um, Philip Eliasoff, who's professor of art history and visual culture at Fairfield Inter University, um, author of much, but also he wanted to um, emphasize that there's an Arthur Schick um, exhibit at uh, Fairfield University that's open till um, December 16th, which looks fabulous. Um, in the middle, we have um, Samantha Baskin, who is a distinguished professor of art history at Cleveland State University, and is also um, the author of five books, most recently, The Warsaw Ghetto and American Art and Culture. Um, last but certainly not least, we have Thomas Doherty, who is professor of American Studies at Brandeis University, um, author, a major scholar in film studies, and uh, most recently, um, he is also the author of, um, oops, sorry, I just got the, uh, the, the uh, Hollywood, or not most recently, but he's author of Holly, Hollywood and Hitler, 1933 to 1939. Now, I was just going to say a few comments to kind of frame the panel here, which is on, first of all, all the three of our panelists are about to show you images from comic books, graphic illustrations, um, from magazines, and clips of narrative film. But in such cultural artifacts might seem trivial when thinking about a fight against fascism, especially when that fight, historically, has involved legislative campaigns, legal actions like the SL SPLC has been waging, and of course more visceral fights like anti-fascist street fighting, physical resistance to coup d'etats, not to mention epic hot war against fascism known as World War II. But the importance of culture, be it a DC comic or a prize-winning novel, is that it helps to activate the ideas, beliefs, and values of these more visceral battles and campaigns, and to enlist people in them in the first place. In the 1930s, from inside one of Mussolini's jails, Italian leftist political philosopher Antonio Gramsci wrote that politics are incubated in the terrain of culture. That is to say, for an idea to even get to the realm of formal mainstream politics, much less to animate a physical battle, that it has to begin in the everyday wor world of uh, words and images where values and beliefs are circulated and forged. Now, this was well known to artists, writers, and filmmakers in the 1930s and 40s who created anti-fascist work. Whereas Germany, Italy, and Japan moved to the right in the Depression years, the United States in many ways moved to the left, and a vast, um, fundamentally anti-fascist movement pushed for a more equitable economy at home and a more aggressive foreign policy against fascist aggression abroad. They pushed FDR and Congress um, to adopt foundational economic reforms in the period and helped to create a legal infrastructure for workers' rights and a social safety net in this country that remains to this day bruised but still breathing. As our panelists will il illustrate, Jewish Americans were critical to this movement of the 1930s and 40s, especially its cultural wing, where they were overrepresented. Over Jews intimately knew the stakes of the fight against fascism as it was aimed at their very existence. Um, so their work enlisted those both inside and outside the Jewish community in the fight against fascism, and it's important to remember in this context that before the United States entered World War II in December 1941, fascism was not universally understood to be a dirty word in the United States. Its value was still in the realm of debate, and it had to be made into a dirty word in the realm of culture. Jewish American cultural and political work before and during the war helped to make it so. So I have kind of three questions, or some, a set of questions for y'all, but to spend probably the most time in the first, um, I want you to, just each of you, you brought in various artifacts, right, various cultural artifacts. And if you could just walk us through um, the artifacts you're gonna be kind of um, discussing, and also a little bit about the artists and authors, um, and basically how they represented fascism to American audiences, and how their medium shaped their message, so. Thank you, Chris. Uh, let me take a moment to uh, acknowledge the outstanding relevancy of today's panel. I know it's been said before this, this morning, but I remember Gab Rosenfeld 
talking to us about this um, a year ago uh, as, it, as this was being developed. And it is, as you know, Yogi Berra once said, it's all deja vu all over again. And in a way, sadly and almost tragically, that we are talking about these issues of danger, anti-Semitism, threats to the Jewish people. So I, I, I want to acknowledge that clearly. Uh, I've had the privilege of working on an extraordinary artist, and though the theme is America, in the case of author Schick, who was born in Łódź, Poland, can we? Let's put up the first uh, image of author Schick. I'd like. And Schick is, of course, in generations of American Jews, know his great Haggadah, his great work, he grew up with uh, various editions of the Schick Haggadah, but he was uh, an immigrant who had arrived in the port of New York City. He arrived in the fall, uh, November of 1940. And so what we have with Schick is a unique character who straddles, who straddles. He was totally aware of the threat of what Nazism was. He was completely aware of uh, the mortal danger uh, of it as a Pole who was living in London in the 30s. He comes with the help of the um, British and Canadian embassy. He arrives in, in uh, Halifax and then he uh, comes to, to New York City. Uh, reportedly, this was where, this is anecdotal. Uh, the newspaper in Halifax reported he arrived in 1940 and the New York pr and the press was talking about he had a price on his head. He was already a dangerous man as a political cartoonist and illustrator. When, you, when we look at Schick in, in his life journey, he is, think of somebody who is coming from the Eastern Ashkenazi Pale of Settlement, or, or from po he's from Poland. He's a kind of Roman Vishniak meets Norman Rockwell. And he's an extraordinary uh, bridge between uh, the understanding the threat Nazism, understanding fascism, uh, understanding living in London in the late 30s, seeing what Kristallnacht and what was happening, and at the same time, he made his way to America to become this extraordinary propagandist. He was uh, known best as the uh, soldier in art. Okay? Uh, and this is an extraordinary drawing on the upper left. Uh, our the great scholar and the person we would not really be speaking about author Schick in this context or our exhibit, which is on loan from the Magnus uh, Jewish uh, Library up at, at Berkeley, uh, were it not for our great friend uh, Irv Ungar, who really has devoted his life. And Irv is here. I want to acknowledge him and with all my heartfelt appreciation for uh, Irv has 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 spent, thank you Irv, Irv has spent the last 35 years, 40, 35 years of his life completely resurrecting the career of this extraordinary artist. This drawing is dated 1933, and it's so con uh, it threads so beautifully back to the way he, Hitler is being portrayed here as Pharaoh. And in doing so, the whole 3,000 year history of the Jewish narrative of the fight against tyranny, the fight against uh, dictators. In one drawing, we already begin to see Schick at his powers, and this is 1933. So we understand that what he will do is showing us the threat to America. In 1940, this illustration appeared in the American Mercury magazine, and I wanted to give a, a shout out to my friend Gab Rosenfeld, my colleague for, uh, from Fairfield University, and this idea that the Statue of Liberty is being transformed into this grotesque image of the face of Hitler. And if you look very carefully at the lower left, you see a figure of Charles Lindbergh, America first, leader, decorated. And on the right, playing with a toy airplane, is Hermann Goering. And we all know how Lindbergh, Lindy, the great American, this irresistibly iconic, handsome, swashbuckling fellow, he so dominated the American, uh, American, America First movement at that time. So I use this as a kind of, 
This is the prelude, I'll say everybody. This is the prelude and we'll move on, okay? Thank you and I wanted to just thank the Milbergs, Ellen and Leonard for their sponsorship today and for their friendship as well. I'm interested, oh good, they're up. I, I am interested in comic books and caricature as well, like Schick's work, and cartoonists and how they, these different figures combat fascism. So we're starting with Superman because he's Superman. And Superman was the first com superhero. He was, he was conceived in 19, he first came to light in Action Comics 1938. And he was conceived by two Jewish teenagers from Cleveland, Ohio. So Jerry Siegel and Joe Schuster, I think it's important. They're Jewish and it's important that comic, the comic book industry was built by the, by the Jews from the ground up. So even the founders of early comics, um, Charles Gaines, he kind of invented the comic book. There were funnies in the newspaper, but then there were, you know, he got, came with, up with the idea, let's staple them together, make them into books and sell them. So Superman, it's imp the dates on all these covers, and I'm showing you covers on purpose because covers are really how fascism was first explored. It, what, these stories didn't make it into the comic books until quite a bit later. So here we have 1941 Superman cover, and on the other side we have 42. Look at 42, it's a little bit more aggressive. So here we have Superman, he's got, you know, holding Hitler and Toho up, you know, like he, like Superman somehow can make this better. Superman can conquer fascism. And remember, comic books are fantasies. And these are just fantasies. Um, what's interesting is how, so, so if, if Siegel and Schuster invent the first superhero, what, go, what happens from there? Well, Superman's so popular that there's lots more superheroes that start popping up. You advance? Great. And I think these two images are particularly important for the fight against fascism. The image on the left is world's finest comics. It's Superman as well as Batman and Robin. And look at the cover. This is patriotic. This is, oh, and um, Batman and Robin were invented by Bob Kane and Bill Finger, both Jewish. Um, Robert Kahn was his birth name. And here we have them, the, the true heroes, the message here on this cover, the true heroes are the American soldiers who go out and fight. We have the heavily muscled arm and we have, you know, that's embracing these important Americans who are going out to fight. So that's one kind of message that we have on these covers. Again, the stories inside are really not, they're not about Hitler, they're not about fascism, but these covers are so bright, so this is about the medium, it's technicolor. The covers are so bright, they're on the newsstand and people see them, they may not buy them, but they see these, these sort of sound bite messages right in their face, you can't miss these. Now also they were really popular and people bought them a lot too. And importantly, the, in the military abroad, they all traded these. This, the, most, the mail that went abroad the most in the mid-40s were comic books, and the GIs traded them and they talked about them. And then this um, sensation comics. I mean, it's hard. There weren't a lot of female superheroes back then, but Wonder Woman was a superhero invented by a man not Jewish. So this is the first not Jewish comic book maker. Um, and, oh, his name's Charles Moulton. He was actually a psychologist brought in to talk about, like, what comics are doing. And he had his own, you can look him up. <laughs> but in Sensation Comics, here we have Wonder Woman. And look at her in her patriotic outfit, and she's protecting the Capitol. And I love that it's a woman and that she's empowered um, the... The Charles Moulton, his, he, didn't, he was asked to write a comic. He didn't know what to do. He said to his wife, what should I do? And she said, as long as it's a woman, do whatever you want. <laughs> and so here we have Wonder Woman. This is, she, had just, um, she had just been in an earlier comic. This is the first time she's on a cover. And she's protecting America in her quintessential American outfit. And this actually is, this derives from Captain America, who we will look at in a moment Great. Uh, thanks for the kind introduction, Chris, and thanks to the Center for the invitation to participate in this uh, wonderful symposium. Uh, I'm really honored, and especially this week. Uh, I do Hollywood. 
And uh, I thought I might uh, show a clip really quickly uh, because when I teach undergraduate students, you always like to tantalize them with a clip before you give the lecture. I probably won't have to set it up for this audience as much as I do for my undergraduates because judging by the hair color or lack of care, uh, in the audience, uh, some of you are probably familiar with Spencer Tracy and Mickey, Mickey Rooney. Uh, in the uh, panel earlier today, uh, Steve Ross referred to Hollywood as the world's most effective propaganda machine. Uh, now, we call it propaganda if we don't like it. If we like it, we say it uh, promulgates positive cultural values. And uh, I think Hollywood did promulgate a lot of positive cultural values between 1933 and 1945. Now, in terms of the relationship between uh, Hollywood and Nazism and anti-Semitism, I think there are three distinct timelines uh, that we might keep in line, uh, mind. Uh, 1933 to 1939, uh, marks one chapter, right, and that of, uh, and then 39, when war erupts in Europe, and 41, when America enters the war, marks another distinct chapter, uh, because Hollywood, for the first time now, is producing avowedly anti-Nazi movies. Uh, from 41 to 45, uh, which is the time frame you guys were involved in, uh, in Hollywood terms, the films actually, in some ways, to me, become less interesting, because they're explicitly anti-Nazi, and they can engage with Nazism in an explicit level. But before then, it's almost always allegorical. And in 1939 to 1941, of course, if Hollywood is making an anti-Nazi movie, they're ahead of the curve. America has not yet uh, entered the war. So I want to show you how Hollywood would do it in a typical year and move back a little bit in time to 1938, which I really think in some way is the pivotal year for so much American popular culture and its relationship with Nazism. I always get, uh, 38 of course is the year where you have the Anschluss uh, that spring, uh, the invasion of Czechoslovakia uh, you know, after the Munich Pact on September 30th, and then Kristallnacht. And I always get the impression that after the, you know, uh, Americas are going through the Great Depression, who really cares about what the Germans are doing in Europe? Uh, we have other problems, but 38 is the year I always think of, you know, dad at the breakfast nook looking over to his wife when he's reading the newspaper at some point in 1938, and, he, and he's saying the Germans are back at it again. You know, like, finally this is the year that it's, it's back on the radar. And Hollywood begins responding allegorically. And this is my absolute favorite allegorical response to Nazism. It's, uh, it's from a, a 1938 film called Boys Town. Has anybody ever seen it? All right. Uh, uh, directed by Norman uh, uh, Torog, and this is the moment where Mickey Rooney, who's the tough kid, who's going into Father Flanagan's orphanage town, uh, and he doesn't want any part of this reform, uh, is introduced to the ethos of Boys Town. <laughs> Hello, Your Honor. Finished your tour? The bell saved you, didn't it, buddy? Buddy, you're sitting beside me. All right, have fun. We thank the old Lord for these thy gifts which we have received from the merciful Father. Heavenly Father, I thank thee for this food. Great God, may the tree are about to receive strength in our bodies. What's the matter? Can't you all learn the same words? You don't have to. You say the kind of grace you want to say. At Boys Town, everybody worships as they please. Think the way they want to think. Sure, some of us don't have to go to chapel. If you're a Catholic or a Protestant, you can go right on being nothing. Well, I'm nothing. Then you can go right on being nothing, and nobody cares. <laughs> Thanks. This is, this is American persuasive propaganda at its absolute best, isn't it? Where it doesn't, like, really shove it to you in the face the way totalitarian propaganda does, but it does it in a really emotional, uh, very uh, a congenial uh, sort of way. Now, every time, I'll say just one more thing, uh, if I might. Uh, every time I see that clip, I want the kid to say, Catholic, Protestant, or Jew. We're not quite there yet. 
but you've got to be a real dumb spectator in 1938 <laughs> not to realize that this is a ecumenical moment where we're embracing people from all different uh, religions. Uh, and he is, and it's especially important is that it's a, 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 an explicitly Roman Catholic environment because of course, besides Father Flanagan, the most famous priest in America in the 1930s is the anti-Semitic radio priest, uh, Father Coughlin. You also have the deep background of the Spanish Inquisition with forced conversion. In Boys Town, everybody gets to worship the way he wants to. So thank you for that wonderful introduction. So um, my first round of questions is for all of y'all, and it's basically about the effectiveness or efficacy of your various artists and your various artifacts. So um, you, and you could address the question of effectiveness in a sev several ways. One, one way to think about it is when I ask how was, was their work effective in getting across an anti-fascist message, one way is to think about it is did the did the um, artifact itself, did the comic, did the, the illustration, did the film actually convey something about fascism that was core to it, that was a transportable lesson about fascism that was useful? Second thing to think about, too, in efficacy is how um, widespread um, did they get their message across? How vast was their audience? Um, how were they positioned within the culture industries to make a difference? So, Sure. Okay, let's pop up. I think we have a, uh, let's go to that, uh, no, let, let's go next, forward, 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 no, no, go to the, here, let's do that, let's do that. Effectiveness. Uh, let's imagine a time when nobody has cell phones, nobody has televisions, no one has anything, no one has cable uh, news on a 24-hour cycle. Um, the American public is going to be informed about issues through popular culture, and this is a very important intersection of popular culture and the gravity of global politics. But popular culture becomes then the, the most effective tool, and as we move from the complete uh, isolationism, uh, Gallup poll, first week of September, 1939, 84% of the American public, non-intervention in the European wars. We saw this in Ken Burns' series, America and the Holocaust. America was not going to be lured. The America First movement, America First movement had the largest uh, membership of any, of any movement in America in the late 30s. Um, we know, that, as we said, the Nazi party was in 1939 held there Washington Day rally just at Madison Square, a few blocks from here. So the idea of author Schick using the cover of Collier's Magazine. Now here is this immigrant, he arrives in New York and quickly, within the first few months, he's the art directors of the major magazines realize his e extraordinary uh, communicative powers. This cover on the left, I want you to, it's called Madness. If you look carefully in the lower right, the, it, Schick signs it September 1941. Very carefully, look in the, up, in the right, lower right corner. He is shouting to the world that Hitler's ambitions are not just going to be as the veil has dropped over France, Belgium, England is now under the blitz. He is saying that be prepared, America, for global domination. He's, he's like Paul Revere, shouting out to the, to the boys at Lexington Concord. Madness. And that is extraordinary, this image of how Schick is projecting. And I'd like to point out the, some of the differences of Schick in comparison of the other American uh, great illustrators, cover artists, Norman Rockwell, J.C. Leyendecker. Uh, there are important paintings of the war done from the Office of War Information by Thomas Hart Benton, for example. But let's face it, Schick has his mother and his brother back in Poland, in Łódź. And in a sense, he's the only major communicator to the American audience using a, a magazine that has a circulation of three million people 
and then think about once it's passed along the barber shop and the hair salon, millions of people are going to see what the threat is. This was drawn, this was painted just before Pearl Harbor and it was published on January 17, 1942. He had proven, the, he had augured and proven the prophecy. Note the, the uh, other artists who are Gentile artists, uh, Rockwell, uh, 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 Whitmack, Leyendecker, their response to the war is more anecdotal. Uh, the GI, the, the home, the sentimentality. Schick has to go full force in making his point, in making it as powerfully as possible about what fascism is going to be. Samantha? All right, will you, I think my slides are right before this set. All right, great. <clears throat> so I think Captain America is a really interesting, um, particular, this cover is particularly interesting. Probably most of you have seen it in some reproduction somewhere before. The f so Captain America is specifically invented to fight the Nazis. Superman just did because they, they were there at that point, but that wasn't his specific focus. Captain America, Steve Rogers, who was this sickly, kind of, just kind of scrawny guy, he wanted to be a soldier, and he took a super serum so he could be a soldier. This is kind of, in, this is, you know, Captain America also is, you know, um, created by two Jews, in particular Jack Kirby is the artist who becomes the greatest comic book artist of all time, in not just my opinion. And in this case, you know, Hitler's getting a sock to the jaw. It's got that Marvel feel to it. This is Marvel Comics. Um, it was earlier called Timely. And in this case, so we have a superhero made specifically to fight Nazis, to fight the Red Skull. We have this energetic cover. Inside, there is some fighting with the Red Skull. But um, over here, this is where things get really aggressive. So this is a new Batman. Batman's, this is 1943. If you notice, March 1941, America's not even in the war yet. But here, Batman and Robin are, the efficacy here, I think, I think what really makes it, it's not about patriotism anymore, which we saw in the earlier comics with World's Finest. Here it's about fear. And I think the idea is if you instill fear in these younger people, maybe they'll want to go to war. You instill fear in the larger community, maybe they're gonna realize how serious this war is. And in this case, the story inside is about, is about fascism. So it's not just a cover to catch your eye. Inside, it's swastika over the White House. And of course, it's a comic book, so it is a little bit campy still, but it's serious stuff. A German infiltrates the White House and he's gonna take it over for Hitler. And eventually Batman and Robin thwart the plan by essentially crushing the plan with a large swastika. So yes, it's fantastical, but it's scary. And the cover is scary. And it's not a bright Technicolor cover anymore. It's real, the comic book landscape is starting to really change. And it's effective. This is most definitely effective. As I said before, these comic books are in the hands of so many young people and so many old people and so many across the ocean and so many um, at home. Uh, yeah, Chris, yes. Chris asked the question about efficacy. And I think one of the ways we know that films uh, and their messages were so effective is that everybody argues about them. Uh, you always go to the public screen representation to kind of argue about race, class, ideology, uh, or whatever. Uh, and maybe the best example of this is the Production Code Administration, which comes in in 1934 to systematically regulate Hollywood cinema. And one of the ways that Hollywood is negotiating Nazism is, is that it, it has to uh, uh, deal with three constraints throughout the 1930s. Uh, one is the Production Code, which actually forbids Hollywood uh, from treating the nation of any country on the planet disrespectfully. So it basically means you can't make any criticism of anybody. Uh, the other constraint is the, uh, the foreign market. The German market is still kind of influential, influential and Hollywood uh, doesn't want to affect the distribution of films in Nazi Germany. Two of the studios get out immediately in 1933 when the, uh, uh, the Nazi government says you've got to fire your Jews 
in your distribution branches in Germany. So Warner Brothers and Universal get out, uh, MGM, Par Paramount, and Fox stay there basically to the bitter end. There's a lot of debate about why. My own sense is it wasn't the money because they're not making that much money. But in the 30s, everybody thinks Hitler's gonna get a bullet put in his head at some point, and they wanna sort of keep the distribution pipeline and everything in place in case the, the, the Germans go back to their senses. Uh, and then the third uh, reason is the ethos of classical Hollywood cinema uh, through most of its uh, uh, life, but especially in the 1930s, is that we're an entertainment machine. People don't come to the movies to uh, see geopolitics debated on screen. They come to see Ginger and Fred dance in Art Deco apartments. And uh, who wants to be disturbed with all these uh, uh, frightening headlines in the, in the newspapers? Uh, but when Hollywood did address anything controversial, there's a lot of dialogue about it, and everybody knew these images were important. And then one, one quick anecdote, one of the reasons I love to speak to groups on Hollywood cinema is everybody has their own set of eyes, everybody has an expertise or memory that I do not have. If I were teaching biochemistry or tax law, that might not be true, but all of you know Hollywood very well. So I show that uh, a clip from Boys Town, a woman comes up to me, and is that a JCC or something, about 10 years ago, elderly woman, very polite, says, I love that film, it's one of my favorite films. And I say, yeah, it's just a marvelous uh, piece of work. And she says, you know, the first time I saw that film was in Budapest in 1939. And she said, when I saw it in Budapest, they cut out the Jewish kid with the yarmulke. So the fascist Hungarian government knew that was an important message that they did not want their citizens to see. And then she said to me, to, which is why I tell this anecdote and I think I can take it to the bank, she said the reason I know that there was a Jewish kid in the original print was that a friend of ours did the Hungarian subtitling for the English language prints that were released in Hungary. And he said when the print came in, it had the Jewish kid but they cut it for the theatrical release. So these, these films, everybody knew they had a pro profound effect, which is why you, you cut things out of the movies. You didn't, you didn't want the Hungarian audience to see this in 1939, where a Jewish kid is accepted and welcomed at the table in a Roman Catholic environment and is a totally equal member of the community of Boys Town. Thank you very much. And so also before I ask the last question, just to be mindful too, if you have questions for our panel, um, someone will be coming around uh, momentarily to take your questions down um, and they'll give them to me. And if, also if you're watching online, um, the, uh, you can write your questions in the chat function. Those will be printed out and given to me as well. So um, the last round of questions here uh, before we get to Q&A too involves the kind of the lessons for the present, right? And I think the... Uh, the un kind of unfortunate subtext of this conference and a lot of the scholarship and a lot of what we've written is that fascism it, it doesn't didn't die in 1945, right? That it does have an afterlife. That we basically we use these terms, you know, conservative and liberal all the time, or conservative all the time, knowing that, you know, conservatives now are not going to look exactly like, um, you know, Alexander Hamilton or Edmund Burke, right? Fascism has begun to have that same kind of afterlife as a as a descriptor of the present, right? And so I guess um, when fighting basically, you know, right, far-right extremism now, or what we term fascism now, what lessons do you find um, in these cultural productions that's kind of transportable to the present? Okay, let's take a look at uh, another great work by author Schick. Let's go to the next one. And the next one. And that's all we got, okay. All right. Uh, the word, I think that in the case of Arthur Schick, being an art historian, being an art critic, we're talking about really the universality of the visual iconography, and that when, whether these are events in uh, caricaturism in ancient Rome, or uh, the caricaturism of Hieronymus Bosch, to uh, Hogarth lampooning the British aristocracy, to Daumier making mincemeat of the, uh, the, the Napoleonic uh, uh, successors, whether it's Thomas Nast, whether it's Arthur Schick to David Levine 
to R. Crumb, to Art Spiegelman, you're going to have to have devastating images that are going to be in the tradition of the grotesque, and they're going to be offensive, and this is about the nature of fine art. Because the visual, the visual rhetoric of art, whether it's past, present, the contemporary issues of whether uh, the images of, uh, you know, I, I think about uh, after 9-11 when there was this spate of Islamophobia, for example, and there were very, you know, the images of the enemy, of the Islamic en enemy. Um, I feel very strongly that um, as, as Jews, as the Israelis, American Jews, will understand that the dehumanization of the enemy is something that is going to be understood, and yet, on the other hand, whether you're asking 15 million American boys from farms in Kansas and Minnesota to go to the beaches of Normandy or to the jungles of Iwo Jima, you're going to have to create something that is going to make the enemy look very, very wicked and evil. And there's, to be you know, perfectly frank, you cannot woke, you cannot PC when you're at war. And we are talking about a time when there was an enemy, and as Churchill and Roosevelt understood, it was total victory. It wasn't going to be that we're going to treat whether the, our German or our Italian or our Japanese enemy with a kind of great humanity and respect. This was the enemy, and they needed to be eliminated. And so this equivocation of, well, f sometimes I'm asked by my students, oh, Phil, oh Dr. E, um, you know, the Jews were stereotyped in the De Sturmer magazine, and Jews were being caricatured with all kinds of terrible, grotesque faces and images, as we see in the Holocaust museums. How could an artist like Arthur Schick use the same tools? Well, I think that it's quite different when you are the victim and when you're trying to end a genocide which will murder six million European Jews. So whether it's past or the enemies of the present, and in this case, our Israeli uh, family and friends are fighting against an evil force, what the President of the United States, President Biden, called sheer evil. So everybody in the audience, let's think about how do you want to caricaturize sheer evil? Will you pull up my slides for me? Yep. Thanks. Because this, this, this is what I want, perfect. I think that these two images um, really help show what Phil's talking about. Um, world's finest comics on the left. Here we have Batman, Robin, <clears throat> and Superman. It's baseball season, by the way, here. It's this spring issue. And they're knocking, you know, they're knocking out the axis with bonds and stamps. Well, for one, comics are being used to get money for war, to raise money for war, for bonds and stamps. But at the same time, if you can see, there's caricature going on here, as well as the image on your right as well. So look at how, I mean, Hitler, okay, we can caricature him. We're not caricaturing, caricaturing an entire people. But in general, Japanese people were caricature, caricatured in a really <clears throat> standardized, kind of ugly way for, for the moment now. In fact, there's a comic, so um, I should mention, I'm looking at comic books, but Dr. Zeus was a major comic artist at this time doing caricatures, Saul Steinberg, Al Hirschfeld, you know, major classic artist. Dr. Zeus was not Jewish, the other two were. But then if you look at the image on your right, here we have, you know, more bonds and stamps and more caricatures of the faces. There's a pretty harsh, um, drawing by Dr. Seuss, he, he made lots of images for PM, as did the other artists that I was mentioning, as did Arthur Gick, in which um, one French figure says to a doctor, okay, I'm going into the Japanese army, I need slanty eyes now, like he can get them at it, it's terrible. <clears throat> I've got comic book covers, which are to fight against the Japan Nazis, and those are the covers of Superman and Batman, like these characters that are supposed to be wholesome and American, but every bit of the arsenal was pulled out at this time in comics. And then one other thing I wanted to say, because 
when Ruth was talking this morning in the first panel about Trump and propaganda and cultism, what came to my mind, and I always carry books around even when I'm traveling out of state, was one particular comic I want to just tell you about briefly. And, <clears throat> hold on, here we go. So it's Hitler and he's got a baton and he's got a baton over a man's head and he says, this is an Aryan. He's composed of A, uniform, B, body, C, propaganda, formerly called soul. That's by Saul Steinberg in February of 1943. So the, the past does inform the present. Go ahead. Just before his time speaks, just as a reminder that um, the person's coming around to collect your questions. So. Uh, yeah, Chris, uh, your, your question, uh, I guess when you mentioned that a lot of conservatives today uh, don't look like uh, Alexander Hamilton and Edmund Burke, I, I feel compelled in the last week especially to point out that a lot of people who call themselves progressives uh, don't look like Franklin and Eleanor Roosevelt today. So when you see fascism, wherever you see it, uh, the solution is probably to stand up to it. And I happen to have a clip from uh, the 1938 episode of a very influential screen magazine called The March of Time, which I think some of you might know about. Uh, it's best known today as the, uh, the model for the News on the March sequence from Citizen Kane. And a lot of uh, my students don't get the joke because they weren't watching The March of Time in 1941. And if audiences had come into Citizen Kane five minutes late, uh, they, which they didn't back in the 1940s, uh, they probably wouldn't have known that this was a satire. They would have uh, read it as the, uh, uh, the March of Time. And in uh, January of 1938, the March of Time got a cameraman into Germany, Nazi Germany, and did a, the first full-length expose of what life was like behind the scenes of Nazi Germany. Uh, now, of course, it had to be compromised. Goebbels watched the cameraman. But the guy got you know, a couple shots of the benches, and especially the narration was avowedly and explicitly anti-Nazi. It was probably the first time most Americans saw the images on screen that now on spool in our heads incessantly, the images of the, you know, the, the marching not Nazi Superman, the, the swastikas, the German leaders, uh, because these things, even when they were shown in the newsreels, might have been cut out by the local exhibitor. And it concerns uh, a confrontation with the German-American Bund, which of course was the fifth column uh, run by the Nazis in America in the 1930s, uh, from uh, Phil's neck of the woods in Connecticut, where uh, the town is having a typical good old American New England town meeting in which they're discussing whether they should let the Nazis uh, buy some property in their county to uh, have a campground. So this is the clip from- And last call for questions. teaching film for 30 years, no matter what the technology, it always, you know, it's a projector, the bulb blows, VHS, the tape gets eaten. Yeah. In New York City, loudest mouthpiece in this Nazi propaganda drive is the national chairman of the Hitler-inspired German-American Bund. He is Fritz Kuhn, former German machine gunner, now a naturalized American citizen who claims to have enrolled 200,000 U.S. Germans under the swastika. At his meetings, Führer Kuhn preaches orthodox fascist doctrine. Across the United States, Fira Kuhn has established 25 summer camps and drill grounds where those German Americans who believe in Nazi teachings can imitate Hitler's mighty military machine. At 
separate New York meetings designed to promote friendship and end the U.S. boycotts on German goods, uniformed Nazis parade. Sieg Heil! Sieg Heil! Their mere appearance doubles the picket line. When Vera Kuhn, with plans drawn for a New England Nazi encampment, purchases a site in Connecticut, he meets unexpected opposition in a community long proud of its tolerance. We have no quarrel with what we term the older order of German people. But we do object, and we do protest against the insidious, treacherous activities of Nazi agents masquerading as American citizens. Mr. Chairman, two of my great-great-grandfathers and four of my great-grandfathers fought for liberty. So did the other people of this town. I call upon all of you here to keep the Nazis out. But the most... There are a, a lot of exhibitor reports from that time that said that uh, audiences applauded in tune with the audience in, in, in the film for the woman. So uh, it uh, really was, I think, <laughs> Chris, can, can I just, uh, let me go, Tom, I think one of the most effective uh, visual icon iconographic emblems of what and why we are in the war, which this really captures, encapsulates, and it comes out of Franklin Roosevelt's Four Freedoms speech, uh, and what the good citizens of Southbury, Connecticut was saying there is that this is not relevant to what America is about, and that was caramelized into Roosevelt's State of the Union speech and I'd like to mention that it was author Schick who actually did a series, they were poster stamps called The Four Freedoms, freedom of speech, freedom, freedom of fear, freedom of religion, freedom of want, and it was, we all know the Norman Rockwell images that are up at the museum in Stockbridge, but those themes were, I think, what corralled and galvanized the American public that Racial, religious intolerance was why, as the Frank Capra in his films, why we fight. All right, so we got some great questions here. And I think the first one is uh, really for um, Samantha and Philip, um, both, I think. So one of the questions was, we heard that the hallmarks of fascism are propaganda, violence, and the scapegoating of an enemy. And the uh, comic books and, you could say, Arthur Schick's work as well use some of those same elements, you know, or at least a kind of a um, clear kind of mission-oriented propaganda, you know, violence, scapegoating an enemy. Um, and so what is that, par the question is, what does that paradox imply about how we motivate publics in a time of crisis? Well, I think that how we motivate times, how the public in times of crisis is different than all of this that we're seeing because we have social media now. We have, a com we have such you know, different ways to communicate. And in fact, what I find interesting is how older artists currently use social media who used to use different kinds of media. For example, I've been watching Yoko Ono um, recently using social media, whereas she used so, much, so many other different kinds of media in her past. Um, but I don't know what this current moment's gonna look like at all, and I'm scared. The little bit of propaganda that I've seen, I've seen it you know, in ways that are so offensive to me, but would be not be offensive to somebody else, and it's ubiquitous, and it's out of control. You know, it's the snowballing, whereas this, this there, was a, there was a measuredness because of the, how it could be you know, laid out, how it could be trans, you know, transmitted. I don't know what's happening next. But you usually know. Oh, well, let's let's go to the core of the question about the uh, the the question assumes that the word propaganda, propaganda in it of itself is something negative and pejorative. Uh, propaganda is at the very root of all visual communication of Western art. Uh, if some of you remember sitting in with a Kodak slide projector, remember that. 
and you looked at the battle standard of Ur, when you looked at the Assyrian palace reliefs, when you looked at the Trajan's column in Rome, when you looked at the Arch of Titus, all, when you look at the effectiveness, the word propaganda, the, or which was founded by the Holy See in 1622 in Rome, the Office of the Propaganda Fide for the propagation of the faith, the Catholic Reformation. So Arthur Schick says eloquently and succinctly, all art is propaganda. So let's not think of him being a propagandist in any way, in a negative light. He was using the visual art to arouse the sympathy for the good fight and for the good cause. Thank you. And this one, I believe, is for um, Tom. Um, and uh, the question is, can you speak to film after 1945, right? And to elaborate on that, um, uh, you know, how does the fight against fascism in film kind of shift after we're not in a wartime context anymore? And uh, the questioner has raised as prompts to immediate post-war films of Gentlemen Ag Gentlemen's Agreement and It's a Wonderful Life. Uh, a great question. Uh, what, what happens is really interesting. From 41 to 45, of course, uh, Phil mentioned uh, Frank Capra's Why We Fight, and there are a whole slew of documentaries and Hollywood feature films which promulgate of American values in a very, uh, I think, emotional, didactic way. Uh, you know, perfect Hollywood ability to communicate that tolerance and teamwork is important. Uh, you know, reaching back to our deepest roots to reestablish, uh, you know, what freedom and patriotism is. But of course, we're we're beaming these messages out. Uh, when our army is segregated and when uh, there's still a lot of anti-Semitism at home. But we don't want to talk about that during the Second World War, and I think it's really understandable that you want to emphasize unity and not disunity, not the problems we have at home. After 1945, it's like all those wonderful messages we beamed out come bouncing back. And now we can actually start talking about them. And uh, there are, you know, the, that great wave of Hollywood social problem films uh, that start coming out in 1945. Maybe the first Jewish-related landmark is when Frank Sinatra, in a wonderful short called The House I Live In, uh, which some of you probably know, uh, gives a lesson, in, a musical lesson in tolerance uh, to a group of street kids who have just beaten up a kid because he's Jewish. And then there are the two uh, films that you, or I think you just mentioned one of them, which was Gentleman's Agreement. And the one that comes out uh, before is a film called Crossfire. And I think between them, these films, address the issue of anti-Semitism explicitly, which we hadn't done before. Uh, by then, America's ready to hear that message, and the, uh, Hollywood gives you these messages usually in two ways. One is the way I hate, which is uh, somebody looks into the camera and gives us all a lecture because he really knows what Americanism and tolerance is, and you know he's got to lecture us because we're stupid. Uh, and then there's the better way to do it. So in Crossfire, there's actually a lecture about, you know, you shouldn't kill Jews. Uh, but the, 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 the more ecumenical way to do it is uh, there's a scene in which Robert Ryan, who is the vile anti-Semite, is uh, 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 standing next to Robert Mitchum, who is the embodiment of post-war masculine cool, right? And Ryan touches him on the uniform, you know, on the shoulder familiarly, and Mitchum looks at his shoulder like, oh, now I'm going to have to get my uniform dry cleaned. And I don't care about Jews one way or the other, you know, the average moviegoer might be thinking. But if anti-Semitism repulses Robert Mitchum, I do not want to be an anti-Semite. So, so all these, uh, these films that come out, and of course there's another wave in 4950, which touches on the real touchy issue, which is Jim Crow. So uh, all of this stuff comes out of the Second World War. Uh, direct result of all that wonderful propagandizing people like Frank Capra did, and now we can start uh, addressing, you know, some of these films look a little corny or compromised in retrospect, but they were very important at the time. Thank you. So uh, another question that's kind of um, expanding on this a little bit too is about, the question is specifically on Hollywood today, but right, if you want to expand it out to all of y'all, um, you know, what is some equivalent of kind of, can you think of some Jewish American culture work, cultural work that's more contemporary, right? That's doing some of the similar kind of anti-fascist cultural work, or at least that's trying to revive the idea of a clear and present danger on the far right 
either at home or abroad, some kind of more contemporary examples um, that kind of um, do a, a, some similar cultural work? Well, the, the genre that I work with, comic books, has evolved in many ways. So the graphic novel is a, you know, everybody loves graphic novels now. It's the marriage of text and image. It's a really exciting medium. And so within, within that medium, we have different kinds of conversations because these books are longer and they do take on more serious subjects. They're not necessarily technicolor. They use different techniques. We can have splash pages and, you know, and different, or different panels. They can be black and white. And not taking on fascism so much, but, and of course, you can't talk about comics, I don't think, without mentioning Art Spiegelman. He shows the effects of what fascism did. So if any of you haven't read Mouse, it came out in the 90s in two different, 92, 96, he won the Pulitzer Prize for it. It's a really important book about his father, Vladek's journey as a survivor, you know, everything that happened to him based on interviews and I think it's really valuable. There are a lot of graphic novels that function that way. So Joe Kubert's Yussel is another example. He was a comic book artist originally during the Silver Age. I know we're running out of time, but there's a great arsenal of books and graphic novels out there for you to read about fascism and the effects of it. Just want to jump in that I had a recent conversation with Art Spiegelman, and we were talking about the production of Mouse, and he said, you know it was from Schick's drawings and cartoons that I learned the details of the Nazi regalia. That, that he, he used it as almost his source book. Maybe just quickly, one motion picture or net HBO drama, right? Nobody goes to movies anymore. Uh, that I might recommend and might put some of all, all of this together with the Lindbergh is uh, the uh, David Simon HBO series uh, based on Philip Roth's The Plot Against America, right? which uh, I think clearly was made not about the 1940s, but about uh, uh, the present uh, uh, time period that, that we're in. Uh, did, it really tanked in the ratings. I think people maybe weren't ready for it, but it might be worth a, a, a second look. And I think you guys know the, pl the plot against America. It has a, a conceit that's really terrifying because it's so plausible. Most of these uh, kind of counterfactual novelistic conceits like one of the Confederacy won the Civil War or whatever, you kind of have to leap through several uh, hoops of imagination. But the conceit here is that if, what if Lindbergh had run for president in 1940 on an isolationist platform and won? And that's actually not an implausible uh, conceit in 1940 given the stature of Lindbergh. I think today the bloom has gone off the Lindbergh legend, but certainly in 1940 we'd remember that gallant kid who flew across the Atlantic in 1927. Uh, and as your statistics uh, uh, mentioned, uh, Americans did not want any part of another European war. I think the, the reason uh, the plot against America as a, as a film series was not really uh, a, a success is uh, there was an exhibit in 1996 at the Jewish Museum, Norman Kleeblatt, curated it, and the title of it was, I think, very pertinent. The title of the exhibit was, it was, the title was, Too Jewish. And within the Jewish community, there is an understanding, a almost telepathic understanding of these, the undercurrent of these themes. For the rest of America, red state, blue state America, it might be a little, a little too allegorical or metaphorical. All right, well, with that, we're um, at time. So thank you for everyone for uh, spending your Sunday afternoon here. And also, thank you for Gabrielle Rosenfeld. Um,
Good afternoon. It's the last panel. You made it. 
So we'll give it a second for everybody to take their seats. Um, in the meantime, thank you for joining us for our last session of the day. This is Fighting Fascism in a Post-War World. Um, I'm Gemma Birnbaum, the Executive Director of the American Jewish Historical Society. And I am so pleased to have with me two panelists. Uh, first is Dr. Matthew Dalek. He's a historian and professor at George Washington University. His most recent book, which you maybe saw out in the lobby there, uh, is Birchers, How the John Birch Society Radicalized the American Right. And with us as well is Kenneth Jacobson, National Deputy Director of the ADL, and ADL's longest serving employee, having joined the organization in 1971. So Matt and Kenneth, thank you so much for joining us today. We're gonna jump right into it. Uh, often the narrative around post-war society is that it's, it's peaceful, it's prosperous, everything's fine now. What are some of the challenges that the Allies faced in the immediate aftermath, both at home and abroad? And Matt, if you could answer that for us. Okay. Um, well, it's great to be here, and uh, I should add that for my book, the papers here in your collection uh, of the two dozen uh, archives I consulted were probably the single best resource. They're really uh, uh, amazing, and so it's really an a honor for me to, uh, to be here. Uh, the post-World War II world, yeah, it wasn't all leave it to beaver, right, uh, where, <laughs> uh, obviously, um, you know, there was, uh, there were a variety of uh, right-wing, far-right, sometimes conspiracy theory, and even more, uh, there we go, and even more uh, explicitly uh, racist, violent, and anti-Semitic groups. And so one of the things I think to emphasize is that there was a real spectrum. Um, there were movements obviously like McCarthyism, uh, which was a, a conspiratorial. Uh, there was, of course, in the 1950s and 60s, the KKK. But one thing I've uh, realized in reading this dissertation by uh, uh, Robert uh, Billups, who's uh, uh, now at UVA, uh, is that there were actually a number, a surprising number, of uh, fascist Nazi groups operating even in, you know, 1958, 59, and 60 within the United States, but with a kind of global consciousness because they had connected with others around the world. And what were they doing? They were bombing synagogues. They were uh, defacing Jewish institutions. And, uh, and so, you know, it was, um, it was really a range, and as Steve Ross and others have said to me, the John Birch Society, which I write about, and we can talk about uh, them and their ideas, um, the, the more Nazi-esque parties, the KKK, often saw the Birchers as a little bit to their left. And, um, but, but again, I think what I would emphasize is that there's a real uh, a fluidity to these movements because the Birchers, for example, which were basically isolationist, conspiratorial, a more violent anti-establishment uh, mode of politics, they often served as a kind of gateway radical group. And so members would sometimes join and then either get radicalized by them even more so or realize I want something even more explicitly anti-Semitic, more violent, and they would move on. So people like Willis Cardo uh, or uh, uh, Robert DePew who founded the Minutemen. Uh, and so again, it's not like these groups are just contained in their little bubbles. They actually move back and forth often. You want to add? Yeah, well, uh, there were several factors that made it possible for such groups to emerge after the war. First of all, the war itself basically temporarily destroyed those groups because all the pro-Nazi stuff, obviously, once Pearl Harbor took place, these groups, but they didn't disappear. They just, in effect, went quiet and silent. But after the war, uh, the factors, a, a big factor that tended to unite many of these diverse groups was anti-communism, because the alliance with the Soviet Union during the war uh, opened up a whole area of conspiratorial thinking once the war was over and really became sort of the focal point from which a lot of other things spread uh, for many of these groups who saw conspiracies. And it's interesting because originally they went after the Democrats alone. Uh, after all, uh, you know, many of the isolationists before the war were Republicans and, and these are folks who it seemed like they would lay off, but then when Eisenhower was elected, 
they went after him as well. So after a while, it wasn't only targeting Democrats, it was hard. And then the third element that became a factor in all this was the emergence of the civil rights movement, which of course, particularly obviously for the KKK, but not limited to the KKK, for those who saw America as losing its way through the idea of working for civil rights, that too, together with anti-communism, opened up a path, which again was reflected in different ways. And of course, we can get to the issue of anti-Semitism and, and which groups were more involved in it, which not, and we could I could talk about ADL's work to try to counter it, uh, but I think, I think it's, that was different layers that appeared, uh, which enabled groups that had been quiet for the years of during the, the war to fully emerge. And last point I would make is they were working in a very fertile environment because public opinion polls about Jews were quite bad in those years after the war. Questions about would you like to work or live with near a Jew and all. Amazing stuff compared to what we even today when we have some issues what was going on then meant that a lot of folks were, uh, were open to some of these things. And if I would just add, uh, it's really right 1964, 65 that the United States becomes a multiracial democracy. Mm -hmm. And so that, that push uh, uh, toward a multiracial democracy, I think it does uh, uh, provoke uh, a, a variety of, I don't know if backlashes is the right word, but, but it certainly um, radicalizes even more so and creates more space for any number of these groups. And of course, the Birchers, the leader, Robert Welch, his most uh, infamous conspiracy theory was, of course, that Dwight Eisenhower was a, a communist agent. And as one ADL operative uh, said, uh, with a lot of these conspiracy theories, it's not too long before they add the Jewish, usual Jewish Philip mm -hmm. to it, right? Meaning that it doesn't, you don't have to travel very far before. Uh, uh, they start blaming the Jews. The one other thing I'd like to add in the broad discussion is that uh, it was written somewhere that um, when fascism comes to America, it's going to be wrapped around an American flag. And I think that's an important element that when we start talking about fascism's manifestations in this country, and how it may be very different than what appeared in Europe. And I mean, there are many other factors that are different as well, but I think that particular point was, was really very relevant. So. And uh, yeah, I mean, they called themselves Americanists. Right. And, Super you know, patriots. Yeah, they were. So to follow up on some of the more, uh, you mentioned some of the conspiracy theories, but what are some of the more, um, I'd say out there views that we see today in hindsight from the John Birch Society and some of these others? Well, uh, they had a number of out there views. Um, you know, uh, they were very opposed to the multilateral alliances. So get the US out of the United Nations. They started the impeach War Earl Warren campaign. Uh, uh, they had a number of conspiracy theories that were operational in the sense that they fought against the Birchers did in the 60s and beyond against putting fluoride in your drinking water. Uh, and actually, uh, uh, Ginny Thomas's parents, Clarence Thomas's wife, her parents, who probably were Birchers, although I'm not 100% sure, they actually were, took part, apparently, in Omaha, Nebraska, in this anti-fluoride uh, campaign. Uh, and there was, I think, a, a more explicit racism uh, the Birchers argued that uh, the civil rights movement was a communist plot, and uh, they would you know, go around the country, these spokespeople, and the question would be, uh, uh, is the civil rights movement directed by the Kremlin? And you know, it, it's a bit reminiscent of a kind of birtherism, right? This idea that this organic movement for civil rights uh, for equal justice within the United States was actually a foreign a plot. And so uh, those are just a few, I don't know, a, a taste of, uh, of some of their ideas. But the you know, last thing I'll say is, um, you know, a lot of members uh, ran for school board or they tried to get Americanist pro-patriotic texts put into their local libraries. So they operated on the uh, local level. And as one of the earlier panelists was talking about, they really tried to, in a sense, um, I would say take over civil aspects of civil society at the local level and kind of remake it in 
uh, uh, their image in defense of what they define as a kind of Christian, uh, uh, pro-patriot moral order. Yeah, I, I would just want to add some context. You know, before the war, as it was described just early on, maybe in other sessions as well today, uh, isolationism was the mainstream American attitude. The vast majority of Americans wanted to. those political leaders who were most involved in the isolationist movement, the America First movement, were largely Republicans before the war. After the war, what I call a quirk of history took place. Our enemy was no longer the right-wing extremist Nazis, but the left-wing extremist communists. And that was a key factor in getting many of the isolationist Republicans that had long opposed American intervention in the world to support what became known as the bipartisan American foreign policy, which led to American leadership in the world. For those who were on more on the extreme right, however, that very leadership in the world was subject to conspiratorial thinking. Why are we abandoning the isolationism which has been so good to America? It's because the White House is in cahoots with the Soviet Union and probably the connected to all of it are the Jews and these kinds of thinking. But it was really the fundamental change in American foreign policy that opened up the possibilities of such conspiracy theories. Because now America was not just protecting its own shores, if the conflict. America was truly the main player on the international scene as the Cold War evolved. And that became such fertile ground for conspiratorial thinking to many of these groups, of course, with to, at the same time, anti-communism. It, it wasn't a contradiction for them that they were anti-communists. You would think, well, they might support it. But in fact, they were saying that that communism had infiltrated the White House. So. That's right, and I would just briefly add too that Birchers but others saw the greatest threat, not as Kennedy did, which was communism overseas, they saw it as within. They saw it as within the federal government, within the major institutions of American life, including the media, and if that's the worldview, then it flows logically that you don't want your federal government, communists, dominated involved in places like the UN, which are run by these socialists, that are creating this kind of global order, right? Or this global, this global communist order. And the Birchers actually kept these scoreboards or, or charts where they would estimate 60%, 70% how uh, each country was dominated by communism. Now, you know, of course, it's very hard to ascribe a percentage. Um, but they did it to give you a sense of just how uh, great, they saw the, it was the internal menace to the United States, the communists, the enemy was within. And that, from that flowed a lot of their, I think, ideas, rhetoric, and actions. So how do Jewish groups start to respond to this? Because it doesn't go unchecked, right? Yeah, well, can I briefly, you want to go? Yeah, well, for, for ADL, uh, and it was actually even before I got to ADL, which is hard for some of my colleagues to recognize there ever was a time before. But, it, but ADL took, first of all, in the 30s, and Steve Ross has written about this, I think he probably talked about it in his earlier comments about Hitler in, in Los Angeles, that ADL took a, its responsibility to try to prevent Nazi violence against Jews and others in California in the 1930s. And we actually had folks who worked for ADL or formerly worked for ADL who infiltrated Nazi groups in California to try to warn about violence and to that. After the war, uh, in a different way, ADL felt that with the Birch Society, but also with some of the even more extreme anti-Semitic groups, that part of our task was to provide inside information to law enforcement and the public about these hate and extremist groups. And so we had sometimes as many as 25 or 30 folks, mostly, by the way, uh, who were not Jewish, who volunteered to attend meetings of the Ku Klux Klan or the uh, Christian Crusade 
or the, any of these extremist groups, including the John Birch that you've written about extensively. And that was really to provide the kind of, then would provide information to the public and to law enforcement about what was really going on in this group. And this was predicated on the idea, an organization like ADL, I don't know others in the Jewish community, we were firm believers in the First Amendment of the Constitution, the right of free speech. And even hateful speech is protected by the First Amendment. So how do you operate against this vile kind of stuff when you believe in the First Amendment? And so the idea was, and uh, you know, Justice Holmes, so Brandeis said it is, the best way to fight it is expose it to the light of day. That's the best way to fight hate. And so we, would, we developed these programs that try to infiltrate, try to provide information, and then to expose the American public uh, to those, that kind of hate. Now we can talk about it later, but in today's world with the internet and social media, it's a far more complicated subject. But in those days, because you had targeted groups and you could provide specific information, that methodology was, was really a very productive in, in weakening many of these extremist groups. Yeah. Well, and I would add, uh, so I have a whole chapter on really the ADL's efforts to uh, uh, not just infiltrate, but expose and discredit the John Birch Society as a hate group, as an extremist group operating outside the bounds of uh, normal American democracy. Um, Meyer Steinbrink, I think is his name, who was a, a ADL national chairman, a chair, a chair uh, in 1952 said, Basically, we need, quote, ammunition for the war to make our land a more perfect democracy. And to me, that quote encapsulates much of the kind of animating spirit. This idea that, A, it's a war, right? The World War II showed, the Holocaust showed, not just to the ADL, but I think other Americans, many uh, other Jewish Americans too, that, uh, you know, Hate is something that cannot be, it can, you know, people have a right to free speech, but it cannot, you have to check it. You have to expose it. And that, you know, it's a kind of war. Well, how do you find the ammunition to fight that war? Well, all kinds of means, right? Um, you know, you attend a public uh, lecture, for example. But the ADL, right, as you said, um, they had uh, uh, code names, uh, uh, they had operatives, and uh, they were very effective. And actually, one of the people, and I don't know if you ever met him or heard of him, but a man named Isidore Zack? I knew him well. You knew him well, okay, yeah. Knew, so Knew him well. I had never heard of him, but um, he just seems like an incredible person. And I do write him about, about him a little bit. He uh, was actually in World War II, he's Jewish, uh, and he was uh, the head of a counter-subversive army unit based out of Boston during World War II. And his job was to lead his team in hunting down fascist spies, communists, saboteurs, and he won a number of commendations. And, and, was a, a, and then in 47, he went to work for the ADL, and uh, he helped, I think, in the New England region, uh, operate a program where uh, they were uh, infiltrating the Birch Society, they would take the information that they gleaned and uh, produced their own reports, but they were also working often uh, very closely with members of the media. Uh, they supplied information to the FBI, which is one difference between, I think, the Steve Ross's 1930s uh, example and now what the FBI did with it, I guess, is another uh, story, and Hoover, I'm sure, was still an anti-Semite in the 60s, uh, but they were uh, working with the FBI, and the FBI would actually come to the ADL at times and say, uh, we've heard that uh, some Birch member is giving these horrible speeches uh, about how the, the bodies of these supposedly dead Jews in the Holocaust, they actually, uh, these were US Army soldiers actually killed by communists. They weren't actually Jews. And so this Birch, so can you investigate that? And, um, and so in the ADL would, would, would do that. Uh, I would also say that a couple other things. You know, one, the mentality was uh, this uh, this axiom. They understood this axiom that things can always get worse, and uh, I think that was a powerful kind of guiding uh, principle. Uh, 
And they understood as well that a lot of these groups uh, that they were trying to expose, and I'm not just talking about the ADL here, but, but other groups even further to the right, that they were pretty secretive, right? That they were not operating, they were operating in the shadows. They uh, were not necessarily uh, playing by the most fair means. You know, they would call and harass people on the phone. We can talk about what the Birchers did. Uh, but that that needed to be exposed so that people understood what their tactics were, what the far right was uh, up to, how they were anti-democratic, and the hate that was bubbling up uh, so, from below and above. So let me give another example, you, the question you asked about how Jewish groups did. And this involved uh, not only the Jewish community, but the African-American community. And that had to do with the fact that as the civil rights movement was just beginning to emerge in the early 50s, the KKK grew rapidly and engaged in some of the worst violence in the South, again, mostly against African Americans, but also Jews and Catholics and others. ADL, we had an office in Georgia, in Atlanta, and ADL, as I said, believed very firmly in the First Amendment, meaning that we couldn't oppose the right of the Klan to march. But the ADL pushed a law that was passed by the Georgia State Legislature, which said the Klan, as hateful as it is, has a right to march. But it doesn't have a right to march anonymously. And this became known as the anti-mask law, which ADL proposed and was passed. And the anti-mask law basically said, you can march, but you can't wear those hoods over your head, you know, those terrifying images of the Klan with the hoods and the torches. And so when this was passed, suddenly the Klan could not do exactly what they did before. And this played a very important role in two aspects. One, it helped to diminish the Klan because suddenly these terrifying figures turned out to be your next door neighbors. And they were just people. They were haters, but they were just people. So it, it, the aura, the traumatic aura of the Klan was weakened. But for ADL, that said something that long term really became the basic point of our work against extremists of all kinds for decades. And that was, what you, our job is literally and figuratively to expose to the American people who these haters are and what they're about, and to count on the goodwill of the American people, the government and all, to make sure that those folks do not become mainstream or acceptable to them. And so that was a methodology that then became part and parcel, I could talk forever about the many, many examples of, and, uh, and our center of extremism today, which has become a huge operation, still works on that basic premise, even though with social media it's a lot more complicated. And could I just add really quickly, I think that's a really powerful point, uh, and uh, I argue in my book that it was extremely effective. And now it wasn't just the ADL, of course, because of course no one group could do it in isolation, Earlier panels have talked about the politics of solidarity, uh, heard the word ecumenicalism or ecumenical. Um, it was the ADL, but it was also the NAACP, Americans for Democratic Action, the union-backed group research incorporated uh, uh, elected officials in both parties, by the way, uh, both political parties. The mass media, which was, of course, uh, uh, nothing like it is today. Uh, and I wouldn't say it was easy, but it certainly was easier in the 50s and 60s to mount this kind of campaign of exposure. And one of the interesting things about these archives here is that it not just was about what the ADL did and how they achieved what they did, but it was also a window, in a way, to the elements of hate within the Birch Society that the Birch Society was insistent did not exist. Because the ADL was able to uncover, to unearth uh, uh, this kind of, whether it was anti-Semitism, whether it was anti-black uh, racism, where it was this very aggressive 
uh, threatening and menacing approach uh, to, to that the Birchers were undertaking within their communities. Um, they were, and so you can see if you go through these papers, hate from the Birchers in a way leaking from both below and above. Now, I'm not saying all Birchers were uh, uh, haters, you know, or, or were racist or anti semites I don't think that's the case. Uh, but you can certainly see it documented in there. And that's why it's not just such a valuable collection, but you can see how the exposure was very powerful uh, at the time and why the ADL was so concerned about what the media was reporting about the Birchers. And at this point in time, they're, they're much more prolific than I think we really realize today. I mean, and they're also not just in the South. I think there's this idea that a lot of this racism and anti-Semitism is coming from the South, but like where are the hubs of the Birchers? Well, so uh, it's a really interesting question. One of the things, and I did not anticipate this at all, but uh, the Birchers were, uh, you know, they were very powerful in California. And, you know, most people would say, okay, it's a Sun Belt, right? It's Arizona, it's California. Well, it turns out, and this is again, in part because of these papers here, um, these papers are just about New England. And what you see is that there are, you know, Birchers all over New England. They're all over Boston. Um, they are, sure, they're in the South, but they're all over the Midwest. In fact, the Midwest, places like Milwaukee suburbs or Wisconsin uh, are, are real hubs of, of what I would describe as far-right uh, activism and activity. And, uh, and you can see that in kind of the documents. The Mountain West, right, places like Montana. Uh, so I'm not saying that there were a majority. Clearly, they were not. Um, and I think that they, the Birchers and their ilk, like in their maybe allies, uh, remained on the far right. They really remained extremists for the most part. Uh, and, uh, and actually the Birch movement kind of faded uh, by the 1970s, but it really was a, a national uh, a movement. And you know we do see the kind of almost organic nature of the far right uh, and that it's not regional, not confined simply to, uh, you know, this white south that is uh, uh, pushing back against uh, integration. I would just add that the greatest failure uh, during this period, of course, was McCarthyism. McCarthy was able to cause such great damage for a number of years and obviously not on the margins of society, very much in the mainstream of society. and and created a, an atmosphere that was intimidating and it was really, you know, it, it had respectability in, in circles that it should not have had. And so it, it, I could say because Eisenhower, when he was president, ended up uh, giving a speech at ADL in, in the, I think it was 54, and which was the first time that he hinted that there's criticism coming towards McCarthy and McCarthyism. And uh, he was allowed to do what he did without major opposition for several years. And this, this was a real failure. And it caused great damage. And, it, uh, and the point I'm making is that this was an element that was very similar to many of these radical right groups with its anti-communism, its conspiracy theories. But this was in the halls of Congress and before the mainstream of the American people, as a, even without with all that the Birch Society and others uh, achieved certain things, they never truly got into the mainstream of American society. Very briefly, and then the, the, the big worry, of course, the fear in 64 when Goldwater ran uh, is that basically we have a, I mean, this is the argument of some liberals, that there is a kind of homegrown fascist movement within the United States that is on the verge of taking over one of the political parties, a major element of it. Uh, and, uh, and, and that's why you know, Nelson Rockefeller, he gave that famous speech in 64 at the convention where he says, you know, we have to reject extremism uh, within the Republican Party, these haters, the people doing the bombings, and then he's booed, uh, basically booed down. So there was real fears and actually Last thing I'll say is there was a robust debate about um, the Birchers. You know, who were they, right? I mean, yes, sure, they're American citizens, um, but were they fascists and, and, or were they pathetic, right, as one said? Were they little old ladies in tennis shoes to be mocked? Or were they like really a fascist threat 
uh, uh, brown shirts, silver shirts, as they were called. And that was kind of a robust debate among uh, liberals at the time. Yeah, uh, speaking to that, there's the question of fascism. The subject is fascism in America. Is it real? Did it ever move in a way? And when you think about fascism in Europe before World War II, it had legitimacy all across Europe. It was not something that was viewed as outside legitimate discussion. And so in so many countries, and fascism, I think this Professor Paxton has written about it, um, there are three basic steps. First is the ideology, the radical right, the things that were talked about, the violence, the propaganda, the scapegoating, uh, all those things is the thing. But the second element of it is, does it become part of the political mainstream? Because, and in America, to a large extent, that has truly never happened, thank God, even with some of the threats and even with the McCarthyism, I wouldn't say that fascism is a political, and of course, the third level of it is taking power, which it did in a number of European countries before the war, and basically after the war was still in Spain, still had a fascist government. But in America, it had never achieved that, uh, and so I think we at least have to make that distinction when we're talking about fascism, that it operates on some levels, uh, but it never ever reached a level where political yeah. power was, was a reality. So. And just to be clear, I, I actually don't refer to Birchers as fascist. I mean, I don't think it's a, for, for me it wasn't a very useful analytical lens. There were, though, actual fascist neo-Nazi movements like the swastika epidemic. In, in the US, so, and, and the National States Rights Party and the American Nazi Party in Rockwell. So, uh, you know, I think it's important to kind of draw that distinction. And as the first panel said, uh, yeah, I mean, there was pop, Hitler was popular, right? He was very popular uh, uh, among many Germans. And, and that was not the case in yeah. post-World War II America. Which, which gets to another subject, maybe I'm preempting a question that you have, but that has to do with the issue of Holocaust denial. Now, Holocaust denial started, there were already signs of it shortly after the war, but it really began to emerge. I, I always remember because I was working at ADL as a junior staffer, and I ended up reviewing the book by Arthur Butts, who's a professor of engineering at Northwestern University, who wrote a, a huge tome uh, on trying to prove that the, the Holocaust never happened. And what always struck me as Holocaust denial, which today is very much alive in certain circles, the main political purpose of Holocaust, aside from the obvious anti-Semitism to deny the obvious, and, and again, I'm, I'm thinking of it now, by the way, if you will, in passing, because I heard people interviewed the last few days who basically denied what took place in Israel last week who simply said, I've heard people, oh, this is just propaganda, it's not verified, and I'm thinking to myself, these are like the Holocaust deniers. You have all the evidence in the world, including, by the way, the videos of Hamas itself, and they're denying it. That's, of course, what Holocaust, but the political purpose of Holocaust denial, in my view, is to resuscitate the legitimacy of fascism. Because with the murder of six million Jews, fascism no longer was acceptable. Even if the world didn't do enough about anti-Semitism afterwards, the idea that fascism could ever regain its former level of legitimacy was out the window with the murder. And so that to me is the underlying political purpose. If you can raise questions about whether the Holocaust ever happened, that opens a path for fascist to reemerge into the mainstream of society. So it's just something that I think about a lot as I hear, <laughs> and as I saw those, some of those folks being interviewed in some of these demonstrations yesterday uh, about the, what, the horror that took place in Israel, and uh, it was so reminiscent of, 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 of the Holocaust deniers. Speechless. I, I could, well, I could keep going. You want to talk conspiracy? I mean, well, I think I think it's yeah. an important topic. I think it, yeah. it, it, so, it makes sense. Uh, well, one, I think when I mentioned the FBI asking the ADL to look into this Holocaust denialist within the Birch Society, 
uh, saying the bones of Buchenwald were bones of American soldiers killed by communists. Um, I think that's one motivation, right? That they were uh, concerned about, you know, what kind of proto-fascist movement or ideology within the United States. But more broadly, on conspiracy theories, and, and these conspiracy theories that I write about, that others have written about, they're not all about, of course, uh, all, the Jews are not always the, uh, 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 behind it, but they often are in these conspiracy theories. And there is a way in which uh, I think it serves another important purpose for the people propagating them, which is to dehumanize, right? It's really the dehumanization, because here are these people who are committing these monstrous crimes, right? They're stealing your wealth. They are, they're destroying the country. I mean, that's the sort of language. And, uh, and they're doing it from positions of power. And so, you know, for example, when Kennedy was killed, one of the things I, I try to chronicle in the book is at first the Birchers are very worried that it was a segregationist or a Birch member that had killed Kennedy. And then when it turns out it's Lee Harvey Oswald, the Birchers are basically all over that. And they say, we were right all along. But each, there's some of these Birch leaders, they weave these different conspiracy theories about what happened. So they're not even on the same page. One person, who's actually a raging anti-Semite, Ravillo Oliver, he's talking about uh, how the federal government was rehearsing Kennedy's funeral a week before Kennedy was assassinated. <laughs> And even some Birchers actually revolted in horror. They said, this guy is insane, and we are gonna, our, our, our reputation is going to be ruined in Tucson, Arizona for the next decade because of the insanity. So I'm kind of go, going on and digressing, but the point, I think, is that the, the kind of conspiracy theories that you're talking about, that you know, the Holocaust didn't really happen, um, you know, it was totally made up, um, I think it, it, it's very easy for those to lead to very dangerous places that dehumanize the object of the conspiracy and, uh, and, and that create a permission structure for people to take even more radical and actually sometimes violent actions. I would just add that I, in many ways I, I think of the history of anti-Semitism as the history of one big conspiracy yeah. theory. Of course. I always point out that the intellectual moment of anti-Semitism, the height intellectually, not politically or on the ground, is the protocols of the learned elders of Zion, the infamous forgery document that came out of the Russian Tsarist of the early. This really summed up which basically, it wasn't merely what the document, which is absurd, I've written about it, it's an absurd document, it talks in 23 chapters how the Jewish leaders around the world are secretly planning to take over the world. The fact that they did that was in itself one thing, but the really important point about it, related to what we're talking about, is that millions and millions of people around the world believed it. And they believed it because they said, it's only confirming what we have known all along. And now on paper it shows the evidence of what we knew all along, with the Jews are all powerful, poisonous, and that. And therefore, with that kind of thinking, it just basically means that any time there's a social, political, economic crisis in society, and we saw this, for example, during the COVID things, people will seize upon it and basically say, it's the Jews' fault, they're the ones who do it, because there's that whole history and basically this intellectual idea that the Jews are not like you and me, that this, the real truth about the Jew is something hidden, something poisonous, something all-powerful. And therefore, whenever there's a crisis in society, you can be sure that some folks, without overstating it, will look to a conspiracy theory about how the Jews are to blame for it. So. And so uh, if you could get your questions ready, those are gonna be collected in the next few minutes. Um, Can I just add one? Um, so we were talking about how you know, these groups, Birchers, others were on the fringe, and it's true, and they were main there mostly, but I do think it's important to add that a lot of the people who were floating these conspiracy theories who were uh, floating hate, who were, who were uh, uh, leading this movement and in the movement, were in many respects 
white, wealthy, privileged. They were industrialists. They were upper middle class, doctors, dentists. There's a guy named, just an example, James Oviatt, whose name still graces this uh, incredible building in downtown Los Angeles. And he was the city's leading haberdasher. And he started sending, uh, I think, thousands of copies of, of Common Sense, which was basically a rehash of the learned Elders design to his customers. Well, the ADL and the West Coast got wind of this. And they wrote a letter to this guy, Oviat, and they said, if you keep, and he also he had a birch sign in his office, and he rented out his space, I think, to the Christian Defense League, which was a, like a Gerald L.K. Smith offshoot, like very racist, quite violent. And they said, if, if you don't stop you know, sending out this anti-Semitic tract to thousands of people, we're going to expose you. And Oviatt was very defensive. ADL exposed him. And then, ADL, and then Oviatt sued the ADL. And what's interesting, though, is that in the lawsuit, Oviatt basically, Oviatt says, look, I'm not anti-Semitic. I even have some Jews who work for me. Um, and, but in the lawsuit, of course, he reveals his anti-Semitism because he starts talking about the Jewish media and this conspiracy of Jews against him. I mean, it's like, you know, you couldn't have scripted it uh, that way, but, but it sort of makes the case that, that the ADL was making, he made it himself. Um, but he was, of course, very wealthy, quite prominent, uh, and, and these people were not sort of, you know, blathering on the margins of American society. They were people like Fred Koch, uh, for example, or Robert Welch, a former candy manufacturer. They were white wealthy, but yet they saw the country slipping away from them. And so that was kind of the paradox of, uh, of this movement. The most powerful, in some ways wealthiest people in the country were uh, viewed the country that had provided them in a way so much uh, uh, as, as really um, being destroyed from within. And that's something we can kind of see today, just to bring it back to the present, this idea that something is going to be taken away from you if somebody else has something. Um, so last question before we get to some of the audience questions. What do you think is the biggest threat to American Jews today? <laughs> well, I'll let, well, let that. <laughs> when, when you ask that question at this particular moment, uh, it's... Um, you know, listen, we're in the, in my, I worked for ADL, as was said, for over 50 years. I spent so much of that time defending and explaining Israel, and I, I never felt, I never felt so sad as I feel now. And this was by far the worst thing that has happened to Israel, in my view, in its history. And of course, it's been pointed out repeatedly, the largest number of Jews being murdered in one day since the Holocaust. Um, but, you know, I, I, I just think that uh, on top of that, the, the level of reaction by some who, you know, in other words, you disagree with Israel, you even criticize Israel. I have no problem. You could talk about it all the time. But when something like this happens where men women and children are murdered in the most brutal fashion. There's no second opinion that should be there. There should be no rationalization. And the very idea that folks at this worst moment, really since the Holocaust, the worst moment for the Jewish people, would go out and demonstrate against Israel is really, to me, uh, a new level of concern that we have, and we are trying on many levels to deal with it. We're also trying to monitor all of the things and, and, and expose it. And look, and then you add that to the rising number of anti-Semitic incidents that we have described in our annual audit, and the level of social media, and it's coming from both the right and the left, and uh, understand, and if any, one suggests to you that anti-Semitism has an ideological monopoly, you should really ignore them because anti-Semitism can come from the right, it can come from the left, it can come from majority communities, and it can come from minority communities. Not to say that it's all the same, you have to study each manifestation of it, 
But the ideology of anti-Semitism has no monopoly. And I think we, at a very partisan time, uh, it's unfortunate that people, when I hear someone saying to me, the only problem is the far right, the white supremacists who are anti-Semitic, I basically ignore them. The only, if I hear others say the only people are those left-wing anti-Israel people who hate Jews, I also ignore them. If you, if you politicize it, you're undermining the effort to counter it. Uh, and the other point I would just add in conclusion about it is, I think the most important challenge for those of us who are trying to counter anti-Semitism and to prevent it from really growing in this country is to strengthen the political center. It's the weakening of the political center which really, I think, gives opportunity both on the right and the left for anti-Semites. And, uh, and the political center doesn't mean everybody agrees. What it does mean is a certain level of civility, a certain level that we have to work together to compromise and all of those things. So to me, that is, in the broadest sense, aside from the direct response to anti-Semitism, I think that's the biggest challenge. Do you want to go ahead and answer that one too? Uh, no, I, I thought, I mean, I thought that was uh, great other than, you know, I share all these concerns. Okay, so we have, every single one of these questions is good and I wish we had time for 14 questions because that's how many we have here. Um, so I'm gonna s kind of see how many we get through. Um, do we know how the Oath Keepers, the Proud Boys, QAnon, et cetera, proceeded from the Birchers and McCarthyism? How are they the same and how are they different? Oh boy, that's a, a great question. Um, look, I, I would say we can always, there are a lot of differences and I do not want to say, oh, you know, these are just the Birchers 2.0. Um, it's, it's not that at all. But um, there are, you know, there are some ties. I mean, uh, uh, I think that there, you know, what I argue in my book at least is that the Birchers helped to create, they're not the only ones, but they helped to create a kind of alternative political tradition or they helped forge it in modern America on the far right. And again, it includes conspiracy theories, all the other things I mentioned. And that that tradition, even though the Birchers by the mid 70s are, they still exist, but they're, they're weak. Uh, but that tradition is picked up on by a variety of successors, ideological successors, sometimes political successors. And whether or not you know, the leaders of the Oath Keepers or QAnon know anything about the Birch Society, I do think that there's a kind of ideological inheritance that they have picked up uh, from them. And some of the theories, or, or some of the books that they read, for example, so Alex Jones, who apparently his dad, uh, was a member of the Birch Society, and Jones has said that, of course, people are like, yeah, of course. Um, he said that his, or his, the most important book for him, I think, was John Stromer's None Dare Call It Treason, which was a huge, it was a huge bestseller, but also a big book for the Birchers, right, this conspiratorial, um, and you see that a lot. I mean, Nick Fuentes, the white supremacist, uh, he said in an interview within the past year, he said, you know, we're kind of like my movement, the Groypers, we're kind of like the Birch Society, but like the modern day uh, Birchers. And Steve Bannon uh, actually held up a copy of my book on his show when he was interviewing the co-founder of Moms for Liberty. And, um, and he said, I mean, it was kind of shocking. He said, uh, he said, this book is incredible. He said, it's the, the, the book is totally anti-MAGA, patriot-hating, Trump-hating, but I really like it. <laughs> it's got a real detailed analysis. Now, you know why? He didn't really say, but he's interviewing the co-founder of Moms for Liberty. I think he found, maybe it's a blueprint in there, Maybe though it's this idea of challenging the establishment, which the Berkshires did, they hated the establishment. And, and he asked the Monster Liberty co-founder, are you like the Berkshires? She's like, no, 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 of course not. We're our own unique movement. She said, do we share some of the Berkshires values or their ideas? Of course, you know, but <laughs> so she kind of, I, I do think that again, it's not like an, you know, they're not like studying the Berkshires, but I do think there is a way in which these ideas are circulated into the bloodstream and they get passed around. And there are other influences too, of course, yeah. as well. I, I agree with, with what you were saying. I, I think one of the clear differences, of course, 
was the Birches so focused on anti-communism because it was a different time. Uh, those were the times, the height of the Cold War. It doesn't mean that yeah. you don't have some of that in these groups as well, but it, it, yeah. it, it sort of doesn't have that kind of appeal with the Cold War over and the fall of the Soviet Union. Plus, China comes into it, and that's a, a vehicle to do that. But I think so much of the thinking is very similar. Yeah, and, and even though communism isn't, although sometimes you do hear communists referred to today as an enemy, um, the, the theories feel very similar about kind of the new world order, this international plot. Um, the, the, the enemy maybe has morphed, the, the kind of liberal left or the woke left. I mean, the, again, the, the terminology is different, um, but the way it's kind of put together and this sense that these are fundamentally un-American, you know, these are foreign ideas that are being imported in and destroying the country, and that the greatest threat is within. Um, but yes, that's clearly, you know, communism yeah. is uh, a, yeah. Uh, and, and it's the interesting thing is that we haven't seen major manifestations of anti-Semitism in some of these groups yet, but I, but I would say that because of the fundamental conspiratorial thinking that uh, they reflect, I would not be surprised that we'll see more of it as we go forward, so. Yeah. Well, I felt like I've seen a fair bit, yeah, more than I would care to in the past five years, but yes, not, yeah, not as much as, yeah. Uh, what is the status of the John Birch Society? Is it still in existence? Yeah, it still exists. Uh, they moved their headquarters a number of years ago from Belmont, Massachusetts to Appleton, Wisconsin, the home of Joe McCarthy. Uh, it does still exist, and you know, one of the things I, I document in the book is sort of the Birchers' afterlife, kind of post-75, and they do keep popping up, whether it's like Birch members or the Birch move. So just for example, like Sarah Palin, uh, when she was selected as McCain's vice presidential uh, nominee, uh, she, there was a picture that surfaced of her in her office of the city council of Wasilla uh, with the magazine, with the Birch Society magazine uh, in front of her. Now, you know, it's like that kind of, it, it still circulates. The Birches themselves, though, have been eclipsed. So even though they still exist, um, they still attend, let's say they have a booth at CPAC, but they've been eclipsed by, you know, groups like the Tea Party, uh, uh, the Proud Boys, the Oath Keepers, you know, any other, uh, Bannon and uh, uh, QAnon. And so uh, it's really a, you know, the, in the 60s, it really was, you know, Welch, for politically minded Americans, the founder, Robert Welch, was basically a household name. And Welch once joked that uh, he said, he said to an audience, well, you know, you would expect to see um, uh, my horns. You know, I, I've come here, you think I'm the devil, right? Because that's how I've been portrayed. But I'm sorry to disappoint you. And, you know, the Birchers were seeing, you know, people knew who they were. You know, it was a major threat, a major worry in the eyes of many, and that has uh, faded, but I argue that they did help but tweet, bequeath uh, with other groups a legacy that, that continues and is in some ways thriving today in a way that it did not decades ago. This is a totally different line of question. Was the Jewish Defense League fascist? Well, you know, first of all, we, we at ADL uh, very often people would call up and say, is this the Jewish Defense League? Because it was JDL and ADL, so we used to get confused all the time. Uh, we actually issued the first major report critical of the Jewish Defense League in the Jewish community because there was a bit of a tendency to say we can't air our dirty linen and uh, laundry in public, you know, that kind of thing. But we, we, we recognized that it was a very problematic group uh, it surely had anti-democratic tendencies, whether we use the word fascist. And in fact, when Mayor Kahana went to Israel to live, he was banned by the Israelis from participating in, in the political system. So the fact is, whether you call it fascist or not, it may be a technical term, but it surely was anti-democratic, uh, had a philosophy that had a violent side, uh, and I always used to say, I, I come from the orthodox world, so I used to sometimes meet people, and, and there's no doubt that Mayor Kahana did some good work on the Soviet jury issue, and that was attractive to some people. 
But I used to say when, uh, when I was concerned about it, trying to convince people that they should not be supporting Kahana, I would say forget about the people who he hates and he would discriminate against. He would do it to you if, you were, if he were in power, meaning that he fundamentally was anti-democratic and I think uh, Israel recognized that, and that's why they kept him out. So I don't know whether fascist is the right word, but it surely was an anti-democratic yeah. leader. Yeah, and I would just add that actually Mayor Kahane uh, went by an alias, Michael King, and was a member of the Birch Society for a time. And uh, at some point, I think in the 70s, when, I don't know if it was before or after, because he was convicted, I think, on, yeah. Yeah. on, on charges of a, a bomb making or, yeah, or well, there was a, yeah, there yeah was and uh, uh, they they asked you know well the, and and the birch society confirmed it yeah you know under the alias Michael King he used to be a bircher um, and, and there were a handful of African American birchers or a handful of Jewish uh, birchers something called the Jewish Society I think for Americanists uh, uh, but you know there were there were a, a fringe minority uh, group within the the birchers. In your opinions, how disturbing um, are the sort of book banning and other things that we might consider precursors to fascism that we see today? I told you, they're really good uh, questions. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And the universe of things to worry about, how do, where does it fall? Yeah, are you, look, are we, we have a bunch of trends in this country uh, that are disturbing, and uh, sometimes the implication of these questions is that all these problems are only coming from the far right, but I would argue that many of the problems that we have, that, that the left, uh, which talks about itself as, as sort of liberal, but they're really illiberal or illiberal kind of activities and the framing of it as if it's something right. So I think we, again, uh, I think the, it goes back to my earlier point. I think the, the weakening of the center in this country is really one of the biggest challenges and that allows some of these manifestations to take place. And uh, if we're going to you know, reestablish a more civil society, I think people have to be willing to uh, start to stand up and say whether I agree with you or not, we have to find a way to, to work together and so. I would add that one uh, interesting aspect, or two maybe interesting aspects from the 60s at least, and the, the example of the Birch Society, was that uh, a containment, right, strategies of containment, they work. Now, you know, there, it's harder today for all sorts of reasons, uh, but they were effective. Those alliances, those kind of cross-racial, cross-religious, you know, interdenominational, uh, 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 alliances were very effective, often, you know, of the kind centrist sort of politics or, or liberal politics uh, from the 60s. And then the other thing that I argue uh, is that in the example of the Birch Society, at least, they kind of burn themselves out. And this gets to the question of, well, today, what happened to them? Um, one of the things I argue is that over time, they started out pretty radical, but they got more and more radical. Its members became more and more disruptive. Some became more violent. It drew more and more bigots to its ranks. And I don't know if it's quite an iron law of extremist movements, but it could be that some of these movements become more extremist over time. Because once you unleash, I think, an extremist ideology or conspiracy theories, you attract, I think, even more extreme members. And and so, you know, the Birchers, uh, I think, you know, kind of self-combusted. Now, uh, I'm not saying, whether we're talking about far right or far left, that that is going to happen. Um, but I do think that there are at least some <laughs> Americans in this country still, probably a majority, uh, although that's, you know, I guess, debatable, but who um, are not in tune with, with what they feel is extremist politics. Uh, and, uh, and they shun that. And I do think that we have seen examples over the past decade of civil society uh, uh, rising up in a way, and you know, I'm, I'm not trying to be Pollyannish, 
but in which um, you know we have seen these alliances and a civil society attempting to uh, resist or to speak up and to try to expose you know again through democratic means through good speech uh, uh, some of these more hateful elements. I would just add that the, of course the factor that is fundamentally different today is social media which we really haven't focused on. So, for example, I've been talking earlier on about ADL's support for the First Amendment and free speech, and, and we still strongly believe that, but the methodology of fighting hate in the context of a free speech environment is very different today than it was then. So, for example, we have a full-time operation in Silicon Valley dealing with the major social media and internet companies dealing with the issue of hate on the internet, which is, we've been doing it for years with them. We decided about two years ago, because we had approached Facebook so many times for them to follow their own rules of the road when it came to hate that they weren't doing it, so we decided to launch a one-month pause on advertising on Facebook, so the kind of thing that we would not have done in a in a previous free speech environment. But we decided to do it, and we thought we might get a little support. We got over a thousand institutions and organizations who joined us in this one month pause of not advertising on Facebook for one month. And the point is that you have to think of other ways to deal with hate and in the context of free speech because in the old days, somebody would give a speech and we would be able to say, here's the good stuff that you're not hearing, and we'd ever counter bad speech with good speech. On the internet and social media, that's not possible. People are exposed to all kinds of things that you can't get to them, and you can't really counter it in the same way. So you have to figure out, while still truly advocating uh, the, for free speech, that we have to find other ways to counter hate that is spreading, and of course, the ability to disseminate it and to provide misinformation adds tremendously to the environment that I was talking about in which the center is weakened because the most extreme elements are able to get to people that they never could get to before. So that's our time. Thank you so much. Perfect way to end it, right? Thank you so much for joining us today. Thank you. Thank you to Kenneth Jacobson and Dr. Matthew Dalek and all of our panelists today. Um, they will be book signing in the lobby. Um, and if you have any other questions, please just let us or our staff know. Thank you so much.